Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever amen i acknowledge the ngunnawal and ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the canberra area and pay respects to elders past and present of all australia's indigenous peoples are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Mr. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and a return to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sitting of the Senate? Call the clerk. Yes, President. Committees have lodged proposals as indicated at item four of today's order of business. Senator Roberts. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the attendance of a minister to provide an explanation in relation to foot and mouth disease as circulated in the chamber. Is leave granted? There being no objection, oh, were you seeking the call, Senator Cash? There being no objection, um, Senator Roberts. I move the motion in my name. So the question is, has the motion been circulated? Yes. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Roberts be agreed and seek uh, leave to speak. Uh, is leave granted? Oh, continue to speak. Sorry. Thank you. I move the motion in my name. Madam President, foot and mouth disease is a clear and present danger to the Australian livestock industry. If foot and mouth disease enters Australia, our exports will be suspended for several years, which will cost the industry $80 billion. This will be devastating to rural communities. Farmers will not survive. Regions will be decimated. The country will suffer as a whole. The federal government will be on the hook for huge social security and assistance packages, as well as compensation for culled animals. The animals would like to express their desire to not be shot and burned. This will not only bankrupt farmers, it will negatively impact on the affordability of meat protein. If you think meat is expensive now, once we destroy a large part of the, Australian prices, of the Australian beef industry, prices will go beyond the means of everyday Australians to afford meat. This is not a rural issue. Foot and mouth disease will affect every Australian through the cost of meat and dairy and through the additional burdens of the taxpayers to meet compensation and social security expenses. Minister Watt's response to foot and mouth disease has been half-baked and quite honestly dangerous. He has also, I believe, misled the Senate. Now, I gave the minister a chance to correct and clarify his remarks in a letter hand delivered to the minister last Friday, requesting an attendance by close of business last Monday, and the minister ignored that letter. The minister must attend the Senate to explain answers he has given to my question without notice that could constitute a misleading of the Senate. Last Wednesday, July 27th, in questions without notice, my first question was in respect of the foot and mouth disease vaccine being held in the UK and read in part, this is what I said, quote, if foot and mouth disease arrives in Australia, the short term response would be to start vaccination. The minister's reply included the statement, quote, the reason you don't vaccinate is that you are then deemed by the rest of the world as having foot and mouth disease. As a result of that misleading reply from Minister Watt, I have had to contend with suggestions on social media. I was advocating for a measure that would destroy our beef industry. I said no such thing. The minister was given an opportunity to correct the record, and he has not. Minister Watt also stated that, quote, what we are actually prioritising in relation to the supply of vaccines at the moment is providing them to Indonesia to keep the disease out, and that is why we want to support the vaccine rollout in Indonesia. 
I, of course, support assisting Indonesia with their foot and mouth disease response. They're neighbours of ours. We need to support them. On humanitarian reasons, we also need to support them. However, I might make the observation this response presupposes we know the strain in Indonesia and can access that vaccine if suitable. If we know the Bali strain, then why are we not placing the same vaccine we are giving to Indonesia here in Australia right now in case one of the travellers returning from Bali has brought foot and mouth disease with them? Minister Watt went on and made the statement that, quote, we don't necessarily know what strain of disease we would have in Australia. And paraphrasing now, we need to know the strain before we order the vaccine. If we do need to know the strain before making the vaccine, what are the million doses we already have in the UK? What strain do they protect us against? And at what cost? I received a call from the Minister's office last Thursday advising we would receive an answer to the question the Minister took on notice regarding how many vaccines Australia has stored in the UK, to which the Minister gave an indicative answer of one million. That answer did not arrive, and it's been a week now. Madam President, why are these vaccines being stored in the UK? How much are we paying to store them in the UK when they should be stored here in Australia? On page 18 of the Foot and Mouth Disease Ausvet Plan, edition 3, it states that vaccination is recommended to start within 48 hours of the first detected case. And this may include protective vaccination of livestock in the area surrounding the infection. Minister Watt suggested in question time the vaccines could be here from the UK in seven days, and this was sufficient. However, the government's own manual indicates vaccination would be an appropriate response after just 48 hours. Australia is currently holding tens of millions of vaccines for COVID in complete safety. If we are unable to hold foot and mouth disease vaccines in a similar way, why not? It seems to be proving easier to get a human vaccinated in this country than a cow. I'll just consider some other points as well, Mr uh, Deputy President. I note that the, uh, the briefing last week by Minister Watt's staff said that the vaccine stays for hours, just hours on surfaces. Other sources in the United States reliably say that the, the virus stays on surfaces for a month. Therefore, if quarantine measures are not adequate, and it means they are not, then we need the protection of a vaccine. This is about food security for the people in this country, fellow Australians. It is about food prices and cost of living. It is about humanitarian support for the Indonesians. It is about support for our farmers, for our whole agricultural sector. As I said, the, the sector looks at, if, if foot and mouth breaks out here, it'll cost us a suspension estimated to be around three years, costing 80 billion dollars lost exports. It also will gut our agricultural sector and tarnish our reputation, all because we are not being told the truth and we are being misled. And that compares with a, a, a few million dollars on a vaccine, which is the lowest cost option for us to protect our farming industry and our farmers. How much does it cost us to store these, these vaccines in the United Kingdom? This is about, Minister Watt, looking good, not doing good. All mouth and no substance. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Senator, Mc I'll give the Senator McKenzie, uh, and then I'll give the call to Senator Watts. On Wednesday, the 27th of July, in question time, I asked a simple, standard, straightforward question to the new Minister for Agriculture, Senator Murray Watt. It was, can the minister confirm how many passengers have passed through Australian international airports from Indonesia since the foot and mouth outbreak in Bali was reported on 5 July 2022? And how many of those have been treated with disinfected foot mats? The minister's reply was, and I quote, 100 per cent of passengers have been walking through sanitised foot mats. The minister's answer was wrong. We know it was wrong because the foot mats had only been installed in the major airports in the previous two days. They were nowhere to be seen on the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th of July in our international airports as thousands of returning passengers from Bali uh, were making their way onshore. Uh, we, the minister knew that and was deliberately avoidant. 
and whether he meant to mislead the Senate or whether it was because uh, you know, he was too cocky by half, the mats are here, calm down, hysterical regional Australia, calm down, hysterical farmers who are incredibly concerned and we are reflecting their concern in this place. We are actually reflecting their concern and I am happy uh, for the contributions on this matter from Senator Macdonald, uh, who is of herself a beef producing family. On the record, in this place and elsewhere, Perrin Davey, Matt Canavan, Jacinta Price, the National Party more broadly, David Little proud uh, on this substantive issue. We are reflecting the concerns of our constituencies and the industries that underpin our uh, local communities. It's why they sent us here. We wish you all success, Minister, in stopping foot and mouth and lumpy skin disease from arriving here. But you cannot come into this place and deliberately mislead the Senate. That is why Australians were shocked as Channel 9, I think it was, was on the ground in international airports on a weekend a couple of weeks ago, interviewing returning passengers, saying, you know, what biosecurity measures did you actually have when you landed? Nothing. I, I told them I'd been on a farm. I got waved through. Foot mat? No, the foot mats aren't here, despite the minister uh, claiming that he had it all under control. And then he walks into the Senate and tells us that he had it all under control. I wrote to the minister uh, to tell him that I thought he had misled the Senate, and I implored him to do the right thing as a senator of integrity, of a senator that claims to be concerned about accountability and transparency, and to do the right thing by this chamber and come and explain himself. If it was an accident, you know, it was his first question time. I understand people can get excited, say the wrong thing at the wrong time. Come in and explain, please, uh, because you cannot stand up in this place and mislead the Senate and therefore the broader Australian public on an issue of such concern. You know, the convention in this place that if you, as a minister, feel you may have misled the Senate or said the wrong number in question time, that at the earliest opportunity you avail yourself and come into the chamber and correct the record. And we often see ministers stand up after question time and uh, you know, put the right percentage on the record or ask to correct the record now that they've been alerted to the fact that they may have given an incorrect response. Uh, this minister, in his arrogance and his contempt for this chamber, chose not to do that, and not just for Senator Roberts and his question, but for me, telling Australians that 100 per cent of passengers uh, had been walking through sanitised foot mats since the 5th of July. You know you, uh, it's a direct quote to my question. It is a Senator, sorry, Senator, sorry, well, Deputy Senator President, Watt, you'll, have you, you'll have an opportunity you, at the moment. Point of order? lying as to what I said to this chamber, and I ask that she withdraw that. I don't mind being held accountable for things that I said. I do not want to be held accountable for things that I did not say and for lies that are being said against me. Senator McKenzie, do you wish to respond? Uh, absolutely, Mr Deputy President. Mine is a direct quote of an answer. I, I will quote you the question again, and I'll quote you the answer. My question on the day was, can the minister confirm how many passengers have passed through Australian international airports from Indonesia since the foot and mouth outbreak was reported on 5 July 2022, and, how, and subsequently how many of those have been treated with disinfected foot mats? The minister's response, it's on Hansard, I is quote, that, is, is that 100 per cent of passengers have been walking through sanitised foot mats. The question was about the 5th of July. So, you Melissa, it's not a debate. Uh, um, uh, Senator Watt, I'd ask, I'd ask you to withdraw that, and you have, you'll have an opportunity to respond in a moment when I give you the call. With, withdraw the word lie, but Senator McKenzie repeatedly misrepresents what I said to this chamber, and I'm yeah. going to pick her up on it every yes, single time. You'll have the opportunity for because you'll next have the call. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. So no disrespect, the people we represent 
uh, in this parliament. Instead, the next day, on the 28th of July, the minister wrote back to me and still not, did not respond with the answer to my question. I gave him the opportunity. I implored him in my letter to him to, uh, if he'd misled, if he wanted to add to his answer, actually give me the answer that I asked for. How many passengers arriving at Australian international airports had walked across uh, the footmats from the 5th of July when the outbreak was announced in Bali? Let me know the number, Minister. That was in the letter. Your response, you chose not to answer the question again. Instead, you chose to dig your through you, Mr Deputy President, uh, the minister chose to dig himself further and further, deeper and deeper. And in the letter uh, to me, the minister conceded, and I quote, sanitised foot mats started being installed in international airports on Monday this week, hoisted by his own petard, Mr Deputy President. Misleading the Senate is a very serious issue, knowingly giving false information to the Senate, seeking to sidestep your way around being accountable. It's a simple question. You could have said, you know, there's been 1,500 have actually gone because we got the mats in on Monday. 1,500 uh, have gone through on Sydney and 800 yesterday morning in Melbourne. But you chose not to do it because it showed how flat-footed you'd been on your response to uh, calls by industry for foot mats for many, many weeks before they actually arrived. I understand the minister is sent about tardiness of action and the fact that tens of thousands of passengers had arrived home from Bali without having their shoes, thongs, sandals sanitised. In fact, we don't even know if their luggage is being screened uh, as we speak right now uh, for meat products. I mean, industry has been very clear. The most likely way that this catastrophic disease entering our country uh, will be through meat products being imported, uh, getting into our food supply chain. Uh, through probably the pork industry. So we need to be vigilant. There is still more to be done. And just because it's not on the front pages of tabloids or the Courier Mail doesn't mean that this minister still does not have work to do, or the Department of Agriculture still does not have work, more work to do in ensuring this threat uh, is actually dealt with in an appropriate manner. I again invite the minister again to please answer the question minister please answer the question how many passengers returning from bali from the 5th of july have actually walked through a sanitizing foot mat that is the question i asked you refused to answer it on the day you chose to sidestep and mislead the senate instead i wrote to you requesting you to update the Senate in an appropriate way to answer my question, and in your response to me, you again refused to. So today, I stand, and I know you're going to have an opportunity to respond during this debate, to answer the question not just for me, but for every cattle producer and regional community in Australia, every sheep producer, goat livestock producer that would be impacted and devastated, abattoir worker uh, that would be devastated, the veterinarians that will have to deal with the outbreak. I spoke to veterinarians on the weekend who had flown over to assist the UK in their response. They are still devastated by the magnitude of impact that they had to deal with on the ground in the UK. Decades later, this will have not only an economic impact, as you know, Minister, now, and you are taking it much more seriously, I think, than uh, those, your earlier comments in the outbreak uh, portrayed in June. But the impacts will be economic, they will be social, they will be emotional for those that will have to deal with this should it reach our shores. We wish you all the best and all strength in dealing with this. We want you to actually succeed, but you actually need to treat this chamber, the people of Australia, the industries you're privileged to represent and work with as minister, with respect. And when you're asked a question, to answer it to the best of your knowledge and not to sidestep. Senator Watt. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I very much welcome the opportunity to yet again put on the record this government's strong biosecurity response to foot and mouth disease. Now, 
Uh, I will reserve most of my remarks till tomorrow morning when Senator Roberts has asked me to appear in the chamber. Um, I'm glad to see that he is still here. I wasn't sure if he was still here. Um, so I'll come back with a formal answer to the, uh, the motion tomorrow. But as I say, I did want to take the opportunity to make a few brief remarks uh, to remind the chamber of the Albanese government's response to foot and mouth disease, which, as I have said, said many times, is the strongest response we have seen from any Australian government to any biosecurity threat in our national history. Far stronger than any biosecurity response we saw from the former government, whether it be about the foot and mouth disease, which we might remind them first got to Indonesia when they were still in office. Uh, now we know that at the latest, the former government was advised about the foot and mouth outbreak in Indonesia on the 9th of May, when former Minister Little Proud first tweeted about it. We also know that the only thing that he did in response to that news was to send a tweet. Did we see the foot mats put in in airports? No. Did we see foot mats even ordered for the airports? No. Did we see biosecurity response zones declared in international airports as we have done? No. Did we see an increase to biosecurity offices in airports and mail centres? No. Did we see any of the measures that the Albanese government has put in place in response to the foot and mouth disease outbreak when Minister Littleproud was the minister, when Senator Mackenzie was in cabinet, when Senator Cash was in cabinet, when Senator Scar was in the government, when Senator Canavan was in the government, when any of these people were in government? Did they do any of those things that the Albanese government has put in place to deal with the foot and mouth disease outbreak? And the answer is no. Not one. In fact, Senator Mackenzie was so concerned about the foot and mouth disease outbreak reaching Bali or reaching Indonesia that she didn't say a word about it. We've had a look at Senator Mackenzie's social media to, dis to discern exactly how concerned she was about the foot and mouth disease outbreak. And, and did, did, Senator Mackenzie, did Senator Mackenzie put up anything or express any concern when foot and mouth disease hit Indonesia in May, when her government was still in power? Well, she certainly wasn't concerned enough to say anything publicly about it or put anything in her social media. In fact, when, when did Senator Mackenzie first bother to express concern about foot and mouth disease in Indonesia? It wasn't until the 19th of July. So order, the outbreak had been order. in Indonesia for over two months before Senator Mackenzie, who comes in here, pretends to be the friend of farmers, pretends to be concerned about these issues. She was so concerned about it that she remained absolutely silent about this issue for more than two months. And it was only when there was a Labor government in power that was taking action about biosecurity and foot and mouth disease that she felt concerned enough to even get her thumbs out and send a little tweet or send a little, foot, uh, send a little Facebook post. So don't give me this rubbish about how you people are the people who are concerned about this outbreak. You were the government when this outbreak first got to Indonesia. You didn't do foot mats. You didn't even order foot mats. You didn't do biosecurity response zones. You didn't employ extra biosecurity officers. You didn't check every mail package coming in from Indonesia and China, which we are doing. You didn't make, make the changes to SmartGate, which we are doing. You just sat on your hands, sat on your hands, and only one of you sent a tweet. Senator Macdonald, you know, if you want to have a chat, Senator Macdonald, we had a look at yours. When did Senator Macdonald first express concern on social media about this outbreak? Her first post was the 14th of July. So Senator Macdonald, who likes to claim that she is the guardian of the interests of the cattle industry, she was so alarmed by this that she didn't send any post in May when the outbreak first got to Indonesia. She didn't even send it in June. She waited until the 14th of July before she put anything up on social media. That's how concerned they were. So while these people were all lounging and having post-election holidays, who was acting to deal with the foot and mouth disease outbreak? It was me and it was this government. That's who was actually doing something. You all went on your holidays. You went on your holidays. You didn't bother doing any social media. You didn't bother doing any consultation with industry for, for more than two months. And then you finally woke from your slumber, got your thumbs out and sent a couple of tweets. Job done. Wow, what a big Senator, job that Senator, is. Senator Scar, point of order. Order. No, that's the uh, point. Point, point. Point of order, personal reflections. Oh, I, am, I, am, I am 100 per cent sure on this. <laughs> 
I am 100 per cent sure of me, this, that Garth. there are a number of personal reflections made accusing members, my colleagues, of being lazy on holidays, not consulting with constituents or stake bodies. I am 100 per cent sure that those point. personal reflections are unsustainable. Senator Watt, just reflect on your language. Uh, I note that Senator Scar didn't bother to jump when uh, various personal reflections were made against members on this side of the chamber, but that's a matter for you, Senator Scar. Now, as I say, I welcome any opportunity to get up and talk about the strong biosecurity response from this government. I've already listed the things that we did, uh, which the former government didn't bother doing uh, in any of the time that they were in office. Not only did they not take any of these actions in response to the outbreak in Indonesia, they never took action in any way like what this government has done about any of the foot and mouth disease outbreaks that occurred in their time in office. They were in power for nearly, for nearly 10 years in response to any of the 70 outbreaks of foot and mouth disease across the world in the time that they were in power. Did they put down foot mats? No. Did they order foot mats? No. Did they declare national biosecurity zones? No. Did they do any of the things we did? 70 outbreaks across the world. And not once, not once did they do any of the things that this government has done? And as I said the other day, this government has done more on biosecurity in nine weeks than the former government did in nine years. So it's no surprise then that industry has had a fair bit to say about the government's response and about the way the opposition has handled this matter. And it's disappointing that we continue to see members of the opposition continue with the alarmist rhetoric that they were carrying on last week. I know that you've all had the calls from industry asking you to pull your heads in. I know that. You know that. You've all had the calls saying you are damaging our reputation overseas through your alarmist rhetoric. I know that you've had the same calls that I have had from industry saying that overseas customers are watching what you are saying and it is already impacting on our trade. I know you've had those calls. I've had the calls as well. So you really need to reflect on what you're doing and your continued hysteria around uh, this very serious issue. Now, to, to turn to both Senator Roberts and Senator McKenzie's false claims about the way I have responded to these issues, if you'd actually bothered to look, I came into the chamber the other day and provided answers to Senator Roberts' questions and Senator McKenzie's questions. Those answers have already been provided. You like to get up and say that we haven't responded to things. Those answers have been provided. So maybe go back and have a look at your own inboxes to see what's there. Now, in the process of making these accusations, uh, Senator McKenzie in particular has verbaled me on at least two occasions. I have never accused farmers of being hysterical about their response. The people I've accused of being hysterical are members of the National Party and members of the opposition. That's who's been hysterical here. And if you don't want to believe me about this, refer back, refer back to the comments uh, from one of the leaders of the New South Wales farmers, New South Wales farmers last week, who, who said uh, that he was disgusted that this was being politicised. I wonder who he was talking about, and that certain people were fanning the flames. I wonder who he was talking about. So, if you want to think about who's being hysterical here, have a good look in the mirror. It's not about farmers. Farmers, ha farmers quite understandably, have concerns about this risk, and their concerns are being escalated and wound up by people who are playing politics, by people who are being labelled by the industry as playing politics. That's who's being hysterical here. Now, and again, Senator McKenzie keeps making this claim uh, that uh, I have misled parliament. Absolute bollocks. Absolute bollocks. She continues to selectively quote from answers that I provided to the chamber. Uh, and I can direct her to the Hansard of the day we're talking about, where I made very clear, and I'll read back, the, read back what I said to the chamber. Uh, I will confirm yet again, I'm probably up to five times, six times, seven times. I actually think I'm probably up to about 28 times now. But for the 28th time, I can confirm, quote, that 100 per cent of passengers who have returned to Australia from Indonesia since the foot mats were in place on Monday and Tuesday have walked through those footmats. That's what I said, and you know it, and you continue to verbal Point me. Point of order. I again probably have asked the question to the minister, not maybe 28 times, but pretty close, uh, and he still uh, hasn't answered the you're, question. You're I didn't ask since the uh, footmats had actually Senator been put in place, Senator Minister. McKenzie, that's not a point of order. Back to Senator Watt. Uh, Deputy President. And look, if anyone wants to question my integrity and put it up against Senator McKenzie's, I would welcome that. 
because we all know Senator McKenzie has got, has got a few issues, which I've always, always had the decency to not raise around her administration of former portfolios, which go directly to her integrity. Go directly to her integrity. The Queen of Sports Rorts, the Queen of Sports Rorts wants to argue with me about integrity. Uh, really? Senator, Senator Watts, really? Just, just keep it on. Keep it on point, please. Oh, we're a bit defensive now, are we? So integrity no, can Senator, be raised Senator in one Watts, direction, I've given you but a, not in one direction, Watts, not Senator in the Watts, other direction. Senator Watts, through me, I've given you a reasonable know, amount of rope. Thank you. Please, thank you, Deputy please President. Please join me halfway across the bridge. Thank you, Deputy President. I note Senator McKenzie is very sensitive every time we raise matters relating to her Point integrity, especially sports routes. Senator Watts, please. Point of order, please, Mr. President. The senator is, or the minister is, reflecting on another senator. He's claiming I'm sensitive. I think those that know me well uh, would McKenzie, find that major odd. Senator point, your major point. Senator Watt, please uh, give so consideration I, to the language and the tone that you're using. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy President. I have, I have the utmost respect Senator for your ruling, Deputy assisting President. Me. The, um, so, as I say, I, I'm very happy to provide a full response to uh, Senator Roberts' motion tomorrow, and we'll take yet another opportunity tomorrow to talk about the strong biosecurity response of this government. But the only thing I will say in closing is that I don't know why anyone would listen to Senator Roberts on matters involving vaccines. I mean, Senator Roberts is one of the people who's been peddling conspiracy theories for the last two years about COVID vaccines, and now he wants to come in here as the so-called expert when it comes to animal vaccines. I don't know why Senator anyone Roberts, would listen to Senator Roberts. Order? I have a point of order. He's, he's, he's misleading the Senate again because I've not been peddling conspiracy theories. I've been peddling data, hard, solid scientific yeah, uh, data. That, Senator Roberts, that's debating the, that's debating the points. Uh, Senator, Senator Watts can have his view. It may, not, it may or may not be in a concurrence with your own. Senator Watts. Thank you, uh, Deputy this President. So, I mean, we all know about Senator Roberts and his so-called empirical evidence, uh, which he seems to get out of the dark web. I don't know where he finds it. So, I don't know why anyone would listen to Senator Roberts on any matter to do with animal vaccines, plant products, uh, human vaccines. But if Senator, Senator Roberts wants to ask, continue asking questions about vaccines, I am very happy to provide him with factual, scientific-based evidence, uh, which, which I know, Senator Hanson and Senator Roberts, you struggle with science. I know you struggle with science. I know you struggle with evidence. Uh, but I'm happy to keep providing it to you uh, because I genuinely hope that you, like me, uh, have, a, have a deep concern about making sure that Australia remains foot and mouth disease free, which we are and that we are properly prepared for an outbreak if one were to occur. Uh, that is certainly what I'm working on. I hope that you join with me, as I hope the opposition joins with me in that regard. Senator Cash. Thank you, uh, and then I'll go to Senator Hanson. Mr Deputy oh, sorry, President. I, I, I'll go to, oh, you want a point of order? Or you've seen the call? Sorry. You have jurisdiction as to who, who receives the call, but it has been to the LNP, to One Nation, and to the Labor Party, and the Greens haven't had yeah, a chance. Senator to have Cash a caught my eye. Then I will, I will go to Senator Wishwilson, then I'll go to Senator Hanson. Much, Mr. Deputy President, and I too rise in support of the motion moved by Senator Roberts. And, uh, Mr. President, I think the Chamber would be well aware of a former Prime Minister who once said, "When they start attacking you personally, they have run out of any argument when it comes That's to right. policy." And what have we seen today in the speech that was just given by no longer Senator Murray Watt, but now Minister Murray Watt? You see, what Mr. Watt or Murray Watt, Senator Murray Watt seems to have forgotten is he now has minister in his title. And having minister in his title means that he must be accountable, not just to the Australian Senate, but to the Australian people. That's right. And that speech that was just given by Minister Watt excuse after excuse after excuse for the Albanese government's failure in relation to foot and mouth disease. But not only that, excuses are one thing, Madam Acting Deputy President, but when you have to resort to personal attack after personal attack after personal attack, and guess what? The Australian public might be interested to know. There have only been four question times since the Albanese government came to office. And in those four question times, I am aware that Senator Murray Watt, now Minister Murray Watt, has been written to 
on not one occasion by Senator Roberts, but on a second occasion by Senator Mackenzie, and on a third occasion by myself. Mm. And do you know why we had to write those letters, despite the fact that there have only been four question times mm. since the Albanese government came to office? Because when Minister Watt stands up and responds to questions, he miss leads the chamber. That's and as Senator Mackenzie has said, if you mislead this chamber, convention dictates you come into this place at the earliest opportunity and you correct the record. It is little wonder that, again, just four question times into the Albanese <laughs> government's parliamentary foray, those on the other side in government, not on this side of the chamber, I don't believe on the crossbench, it might be the Australian Greens, but they can stand up if it is them, have coined the phrase, I kid you not, misleading Murray. Oh. Misleading Murray. A question time last Wednesday, a question time last Thursday, a question time on Monday of this week, a question time on Senator Tuesday Cash, of this week. resume your seat. As Senator Urquhart. Point of order. I would ask the senator opposite to refer to Minister Watt by his correct title, uh, not other terms. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. And it would assist the chamber, Senator Cash, if you could observe that custom in, in the interest of the standards of the Senate. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And obviously, that is the whole point I am making. It is now Minister Watt. Right. It is now Minister Watt. But those on the other side seem to have conveniently forgotten that you are now in government. And guess what? When you are in government, you get to assume responsibility. You do not get to come in here in response to questions and mislead the chamber. I don't know in the history of the Australian Parliament if any minister in his first four question times from three different senators has ever received three letters stating that he has misled the Australian Senate and the Australian people. But that is what we have seen. Minister Watt, who is now accountable under the Albanese government's code of conduct, and he might want to actually read the code of conduct, because at section four responsibility, it actually says this, ministers are expected to be honest. Mm in the conduct of public office and take all reasonable steps to ensure they do not mislead the parliament. Yeah. Well, that is directly as to what Senator Robert's motion goes to, misleading the Australian parliament and, in this case, misleading the Australian Senate. The Albanese government's code of conduct for ministers then goes on to say this. It is a minister's personal responsibility to ensure that any error or misconception in relation to such a matter is corrected or clarified as soon as practicable and in a manner appropriate to the issues and interests involved. And what do we see from Minister Watt? Well, I'm going to get to the letter that he wrote to me shortly in relation to the issue that I raised on misleading the Australian Senate and the Australian people. But what we have seen to date, excuse, another excuse, mm -hmm. blaming the former government, personal attacks on Senator Malcolm Roberts, personal attacks on Senator Bridget McKenzie. And again, I go to that very well-known former prime minister who said words to the effect of, once they have to attack me personally, I have won the policy right. debate. So I can only assume, given the phrase that is now being utilised in relation to Minister Watt by those on the other side misleading Murray, I can only assume that he agrees, that he has misled the Senate because he only has excuses and he only has personal attacks. Foot and mouth disease entering this country on any analysis 
is a very, very serious issue. When you look at the impact on the Australian economy, it is estimated, I think it's around $80 billion, the potential impact to our agricultural industry. Minister Watt comes in, excuse after excuse after excuse, after personal attack after personal attack after personal attack, but still fails to actually answer the questions posed by Minister Robert and posed by Senator Mackenzie. The Australian people actually deserve answers from this government. I mean, interest rates, good grief, they rose yet again yesterday. Can you imagine if foot and mouth disease gets into this country, what it will do to the cost of living for the Australian people? And in relation to answers provided to me in question time on behalf of the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations and the reasons given by the Albanese government for the abolition of the Australian building and construction industry. I also had to write to now Minister Watt, and I had to raise with him the following. In question time on Wednesday, the 27th of July 2022, in response to a question from me in which I asked the following, and I quoted, what consultation did the minister have with the construction industry and or the Australian Building and Construction Commission prior to and in relation to the SNAP announcement on Sunday, the 24th of July 2022, that the ABCC in its powers will be pulled back to the bare legal minimum as of yesterday? I then quoted back to Minister Watt his response. In part, he said this. That is because we've seen a gross waste of taxpayers' funds prosecuting workers for stickers on their helmets and flags on their work sites. Madam Acting Deputy President, on any analysis, that statement is misleading. Why? Because, colleagues, guess what? It is legally incorrect. The response was misleading. Now, let me tell you why. Journalists may be interested that one of the prime reasons that the Albanese government is running around saying they have to get rid of the tough cop on the beat in the building and construction industry is because it has seen a gross waste of taxpayers' funds prosecuting workers for stickers on their helmets and flags on their work sites. Well, let me enlighten colleagues to why this is misleading the Australian Senate. Well, in the first instance, the Australian Building and Construction Commission has never, never prosecuted a worker or a union for workers wearing stickers on their helmets or flying flags in their work sites. So strike one. There has never been a prosecution by the Australian Building and Construction Commission in this regard. Not only that, the Code for Tendering and Performance of Building Works, which was in place before it was neutered just recently, guess what? It actually didn't enable. There was no legal basis for the Australian Building and Construction Commission to take an action against a union or a worker. Why? Because the code specifically applies to code-covered entities. So you might say, well, Michaelia, Senator Cash, you're ideological when it comes to the ABCC. I'm actually not. I just believe in a tough cop on the beat, and I believe in the building and construction industry. But when you actually have a minister coming into this chamber and giving a statement that is legally incorrect, A, there has never been a prosecution, B, there is no legal basis for the Australian Building and Construction Commission to actually undertake such a prosecution, you would think that the minister would write back to you, colleagues, and actually just admit it. Just admit it. Instead, the answer that I have received uh, from Minister Watt, and I'm more than happy to table it if people would like to actually read it, makes every excuse in the world as to why the Australian Labor Party justify the statements they are making, but does not go anywhere near the fact that a there's never been a prosecution by the Australian Building and Construction Commission, the actual case they keep referring to the Lend-Lease case, they failed to tell the Australian people, was actually bought by Lend-Lease, oh. not the Australian Building and Construction Commission. Oh, it was brought by Lend-Lease. 
The union intervened to support Lend-Lease. The ABCC were required to give evidence. And guess what, colleagues? Let's now turn to the judgment of the court, because again, those on the other side, they say they actually respect the independence of the judiciary, but then they fail to acknowledge that in 91 per cent of cases, the judiciary have actually found in favour of the Australian Building and Construction Commission. And in the Lend-Lease case, guess what? The judiciary found in favour of the Australian Building and Construction Commission. So again, when I look at Senator Roberts' motion, when I look at the fact that there has only in this place been now four question times, when I look at the fact that in relation to those four question times, as those on the other side have now coined the phrase in relation to Minister Watt misleading Murray, the fact that Minister Watt has now received three uh, Senator letters— Senator please resume your seat. Senator Urquhart. Um, point of order, I would again ask the minister, the shadow minister, to withdraw that comment. She was asked before to address Minister Watt by his correct title. Thank you. And she continues Thank you, to Senator use Urquhart. other terms. Uh, se se Senator Cash, you don't have the call yet. But Senator Urquhart, your point is made. I'm sure that Senator Cash has heard that. Senator Cash. And thank you, Madam Deputy President. I was referring to the minister by his correct title. I was then referring to comments that have been made by those on the other side in relation to the nickname that they have now given him. Senator, <laughs> Senator Cash, it would assist the chamber if you would withdraw. And did you ask? Did you seek to ask? to take further action? I did. I would like you to review that ruling in relation to I did refer to the minister by his correct so, title. So, to minister progress, Watt. To, so Senator Cash, Senator Cash, to proceed, it would assist the chamber if you would now withdraw. No, let me deal with this matter, Senator, Senator McKenzie. Uh, Senator Cash, if you would withdraw, that would assist the chamber, and then I'll give you the ruling on the second part. If you would give us the ruling on the second part, I will withdraw, but subject to, obviously. Um, are you providing your ruling now? So I, I will indicate that I accept your request. To Thank review, you. And Thank I you. will. And in that instance, do you withdraw? I did. Thank you very much. Would you clearly withdraw for me, Senator Cash? I'm just trying to do this in a nice orderly way because people expect it to be done properly. Senator Cash, please, could you stand and withdraw? Senator Cash, it was I withdraw. messy. Thank you. Now, Senator McKenzie, you have the call. Is it on the same matter? In the ruling, Senator um, McKenzie, we have already dealt with that matter. It will assist the chamber if we can proceed. If it's on another matter, I'll hear you. But if not, I don't. Well, I'd like you to add the nickname Albo to your ruling as that, well. Well, no, that is a completely out of order. Uh, please continue with your remarks, Senator Cash. Thank you very much. As I said, in relation to the motion that has been moved by Senator Roberts, it is actually a very, very serious motion. Because on day five of the actual sittings of the parliament, not the ceremonial sitting that we had on Tuesday, a motion has already been moved in relation to a minister that clearly states comments have been made, responses have been provided, which appear to have misled the Senate, as detailed in Senator Roberts' letter, hand delivered to the minister on Friday, the 29th of July. I too have had to write to the minister in a similar vein in terms of allegations of misleading the Senate. Senator Mackenzie has also written to the minister. One might say there is a pattern of behaviour here. Mm. A pattern of behaviour when the minister is asked a question. I'd rather the minister take it on notice, to be honest with you, and actually provide the chamber with correct. the correct answer. But what we saw today in the response to this chamber by Minister Watt to Senator Mackenzie's address to Senator Malcolm Roberts. Excuse after excuse mm -hmm. after excuse. There's one thing to make excuses, but when you then have to move to personal attacks, again, I go to that former very well-known Prime Minister who, with words to the effect of, used to say, once they have to attack me personally, I know I've won the policy debate. 
Here, here. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. If there was ever an example of another famous saying, today a rooster, tomorrow a feather duster, <laughs> it's this debate that we are experiencing here in the Senate this morning. And great that the school kids can witness how far the Liberal National Party have fallen uh, since they were in government for nine years. Seriously, we're wasting the Senate's time on a debate about biosecurity. You claim it's biosecurity, Senator. I'll, I'll take your interjection. Firstly, two significant things happened last week. Uh, where the Senate behaved as it should. Uh, we had a briefing. We got together. We requested a briefing from the Agricultural Minister on this very serious issue. And we all, those of us who cared and those of us who had responsibilities in this area, went to the cinema and we had a comprehensive briefing from a number of professionals. And I noticed a lot of the things we were told were conveniently ignored by Senator Mackenzie in her contribution this morning. The second thing we did as mature adults elected by the Australian people to do our job to scrutinise the minister was a, got up a Senate inquiry in this place into this exact issue. And we worked together to get that so that the National Party and the Liberal Party could chair that through the Rural and Regional Affairs Committee. Uh, and we have begun the process to scrutinise the minister's response to this issue, where we will be taking comprehensive evidence from witnesses and stakeholders right around the country. That's our job. That's what we were elected to do. Um, it's fascinating for me this morning to see what you have become, um, but I, I won't say it's sad, but it's fascinating. But what is sad is seeing you play politics with this issue. Because we were told by the department officials at the briefing that it is dangerous for you to play politics with this issue. It is dangerous for the reputation of the farmers you come in here and purport to represent. It's dangerous uh, on many levels uh, through our, for our trade negotiations and deals that we have with other <coughs> countries, for our reputation, our uh, image internationally. It's dangerous for you to continue down this road when we're already doing our job to scrutinise the minister. So I will just ask you here this morning to consider what it is you're doing exactly. Sen uh, you Senator are Wish -Wilson. coming in here. Senator Wish Wilson, can I just remar remind you to make your remarks to the chair? Oh, uh, sorry, and, and the term you does change the nature of the debate. So if you could refer to the speakers um, through me rather than directly. I'm sure that that will help the tenor of the debate. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you. Opinion. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I've shifted, I've shifted to the other side of the chamber, so I used to stare directly, <laughs> directly at you. I have to swivel my hips a little bit, to, little bit to the left. It's all new for um, us. Yeah, look, I mean, we are scrutinising this issue. That, that's our job. The minister has come in and provided responses. The minister has said he will come in tomorrow and provide a response to One Nation. So I would just uh, genuinely ask the Liberal National Party to reflect on their behaviour in this chamber this morning and what it is that they are trying to achieve by coming in here and uh, politicising this issue. I know why One Nation are coming in here to politicise this issue. They're searching for relevance, acting deputy president. Uh, Senator Hanson was nearly knocked off by the legalised marijuana party, which would have had a delicious irony to it had it happened. And there were many of us glued to the screen. There were many of us glued to the screen during those final final days of the count in Queensland. Uh, we would have we would have we would have generally welcomed the legalised marijuana party to this chamber. Uh, so we understand why One Nation are doing this. They have no power in this government anymore. Their vote's no longer relevant. Uh, or necessary to this government in this parliament. So I understand why they're doing it, but I would still say to Senator Hanson uh, that it's very dangerous what you're doing. Uh, reflect also on your behaviour and what you're trying to achieve here. Are you representing the best interests of Australian farmers doing what you're doing now? We all accept the government needs to be scrutinised. We all accept the government needs to be put under pressure. Um, that's how it works in here, but that's exactly what the Senate's doing. The Senate is already having a comprehensive inquiry into this issue and the government's response to it to date and what further uh, and more importantly needs to be done. Um, I would like to raise uh, I would like to, you'll get the chance for a contribution very shortly, <coughs> Senator Hanson, I'm sure. I'd like to raise that this inquiry is also looking at an outbreak of Varroa mite uh, in this country, which I haven't heard the National Party coming in here and asking any questions on. I mean another four outbreaks were 
Another four outbreaks were announced in New South Wales on this yesterday. Uh, this is a very serious issue that's also being looked at by the inquiry. Uh, a very serious issue, not just to the bee industry, uh, but also to the agricultural industry that rely on the pollination services of bees. It couldn't be more critical. But I don't hear anything from you about this issue at all. So there's lots of other priorities. I know, I know you're, you know you're struggling to find a reason to put the government under the pump. Uh, but re really, please reflect on your behaviour. Be mature adults, uh, and let's get on with doing the job that we're elected to do. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the call. And um, the government gave leave to um, Senator Roberts. Uh, well, the intention, the reason I gave leave was the motion I had before me said that he was going to give notice on of a motion for the next day of sitting. Um, so that's the version I had. Um, we gave leave because we want this chamber to work more collaboratively than it has in the past. Um, I didn't expect that there would be then uh, an extended de political attack and debate, um, not really about the substance of the motion, which the government is happy to agree to, uh, and the minister has made it clear he is happy to come in uh, and do follow the the um, sentiment of the motion or to attend the Senate tomorrow. But we, were not, we are not supportive of having the whole morning spent on this and then the whole morning tomorrow spent on this, which is essentially what um, the motion, as it's been conducted in this place, is going to mean. We're going to have an open-ended debate this morning of um, you know, unrelated contributions from those opposite, and then we're going to have this, a repeat of this tomorrow morning. Now, the approach the government is taking is we want to work with people in this chamber. We would appreciate not notice, not just walking into it. And I've spoken to Senator Roberts about that. If you are going to move a motion like this, it is common courtesy that if you are advising other people in this chamber, uh, that you inv that you advise everybody. Um, and give people a little bit of a heads up. We would ask for that because that assists us in whether or not we give leave um, to allow for, for certain motions. So we would request that. Um, the minister has spoken. We have allowed contributions, two contributions um, from the opposition. One Nation has made a contribution. Um, the Greens have made a contribution. Um, so I feel that we have um, done what we need to do today and no doubt there will be further contributions that can be made tomorrow, and so I move that the question be put. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. There was only one voice. The ayes have it. Is there a call for a division? Division is required. Please ring the bells.
order. I lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher that the matter be put be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan for the noes. Order. There being 35 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'm now going to put the question, but before I do, uh, I'll remind you, Senator Stirl, once the tellers are appointed, you need to remain in your seat. So the question, the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I'm going to put the question again. So the question is that the um, motion is moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, senators, I will ask you to leave the chamber uh, orderly so we can move on with business. I call the clerk. <coughs> Government Business Notice of Motion No. 1, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, exemption of the bill from the cutoff. So we're there. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, sorry, Minister. If, if senators could leave the chamber in a quiet and orderly fashion, please, or if you're going to stay here, just be quiet. Um, Minister. Uh, thank you. I move the motion. Uh, Senator Hanson? No, that's not Senator Hanson. Oh, sorry, Senator Hanson Young. Sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, I'm just uh, wanting to make it clear that the Greens do not support uh, this exemption. Um, we are concerned about the rush, rush nature of this. We're concerned that uh, we are now uh, halfway through the second week of the first sitting fortnight, and we haven't been able uh, to get uh, a, a a, um, adequate uh, briefing or understanding of the true implications of this bill. We don't believe uh, that this is a bill that should be uh, exempt from the cut-off order. We believe the Senate should consider this properly, that the process should not be rushed. 
And it's not a good enough excuse from the government of the day to want to circumvent uh, a, a court, uh, particularly uh, when the legislation has a retrospective nature. We're concerned about the principle that this sets and also about how this chamber works. We heard the um, manager of government business already this morning uh, pleading with this place to run orderly, to be uh, collaborative, and we think that uh, rushing bills like this through um, is not uh, an appropriate way uh, to, to do that. Um, we are genuinely concerned about the real impacts of this legislation on both the people it includes and the people it does not include. We are worried about what it means for uh, the um, liabilities of the government uh, uh, budget, of course, but we need the real information about that. And at this point, um, we have not um, been given that. Um, the public service deserve our support, and rushing uh, a piece of legislation like this through um, uh, really thumbs uh, its nose to the hard-working uh, public servants, particularly uh, those who um, are here in this very uh, territory of which this wonderful uh, parliament exists. Um, we uh, plead with the government and the opposition to allow more time for consideration of this bill, to consider the real implications, to make sure everybody is aware of the, uh, the um, a precedent that this sets, a retrospective uh, a bill uh, that changes uh, the circumstances of everyday people uh, and uh, making the precedent in relation to rushing bills like this through this new parliament. Um, we are genuinely concerned that if every time the government uh, has the support of the opposition that we are going to be confronted in this chamber with a bang, 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 bang it through. We are not, uh, uh, that is not the type of parliament that the Prime Minister promised. It is not the type of uh, collaborative nature that we continue to hear from all sides of how we are going to operate in this chamber. So, um, look, uh, there's the deal being stitched up between the government and the opposition uh, to uh, effectively cut the wages of public servants. Well, you can wear that, uh, but we are not going to be part of it. Uh, and we are not going to be part of a bill uh, being smashed through this place uh, when we haven't even got answers to some basic questions. Um, we are concerned that we won't be able to go into a proper committee stage uh, in relation to this bill to get to the bottom uh, of these issues. We are concerned that uh, those who are being asked to speak uh, on this bill have not been given thorough enough briefings. We are concerned that even if we had a committee stage and were able to ask the government questions, they wouldn't even know the answers because uh, this hasn't been considered uh, properly and thoroughly enough. Um, I hope uh, that uh, this is um, uh, not going to be um, business as usual uh, for this new parliament, that every time uh, the Labor Party can get the support of the Liberals uh, to gang up, whether it's uh, wage theft, whether it's a cuts to superannuation, whether it's attack on the public service, whether it's handing out money to their fossil fuel mates, whatever it might be that they can find agreement on, uh, that, thing, that this chamber gets upturned uh, and that we can't do our role uh, being the chamber of scrutiny and accountability. So um, we feel very strongly about this uh, and we plead with the opposition. Uh, you know, this, this chamber has a job to do, and our job is to hold government to account, to look at the details of legislation, to consider in detail legislation, and to make sure that uh, when things pass this place, we know exactly what uh, it is doing and who it will affect. And no one on either side here today can tell us what the real implications, the real life implications, or even uh, the financial implications and the precedent implications that rushing this piece of legislation through, the place, through this place today will mean. And until you can answer that, you're not, you don't have the green support. Thank you. Minister? Uh, thank you. I'm just checking that nobody else wants to speak before, because I'll close the debate. Did you want to say something? Okay. Senator um, Ruston. This is, we're only speaking on the exemption at this stage, aren't we? Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. No, Jane will speak in the substantive. Um, look, um, uh, can I acknowledge the contribution of um, Senator Hanson-Young um, and uh, say that, as a principal, 
um, we support the, um, the full processes of the Senate um, being applied to, uh, to legislation and any other business of this place um, because we are the House of Review. Um, today um, on, uh, we have made a decision to support the bringing on of debate of this bill uh, at the request of the government. Um, but that is all that we will be agreeing to. Um, and we believe that the appropriate process for debate of this bill um, should not be truncated. So whilst we will accept the exemption, uh, that is all that we are accepting. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you. And just to respond uh, to the concerns that have been raised by Senator Hanson, um, Hanson Young, sorry, Senator Hanson Young, my mind was moving um, quickly because uh, I'm just unclear about what um, Senator Rustin just said, but um, this is not and will not be uh, the way normal practice of how we deal with bills. This is an exceptional set of circumstances and an exceptional uh, or an issue that has been compounded by um, the election and the commencement of the new parliament. And in an ideal set of circumstances, um, we would. Uh, have much preferred to have more time for people to consider the legislation, albeit that it is fairly straightforward. This has been an issue that's been under the attention of the former government for a period of time, and it came to me relatively early in um, in me taking on the role of the minister, uh, Ministry of Finance. Um, and uh, I think um, the assurance we give you is that this is not the way we will be conducting. Um, legislation in this place. It is a very unique set of circumstances in relation to the comments, and we could probably deal with this better in in debate on the bill. Um, but this is is not about um, ripping things away from the public service or or being disrespectful to the public service. The bill is about clarifying the administrative practice that has existed for um, a period of time since 1986, and uh, ensuring that the legislation basically follows the administrative practice. Um, but we're happy to have that debate um, during the bill itself. Uh, but yes, I can guarantee that this is not the way that we will be proceeding with legislation in this place. Uh, it is the exception rather than the rule. Thank you, Minister. The question before the chair is that the motion moved by the manager of government business be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. So that the question is that the motion moved by the manager of government business be agreed to. I appoint Senator Pratt, teller for the eyes, and Senator McKim, teller for the nose. The question is that the motion moved by the Manager of Government Business be agreed to, and that has pa passed with ayes being 27 and the noes 12. I call the clerk. Government Business Notice of Motion No. 2, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. Introduction of the Public Sector Superannuation Salary Legislation Amendment Bill 2022. I call the Minister. Thank you very much. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to public sector superannuation and for related purposes. The question is that that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Minister. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to public sector superannuation and for related purposes. Minister. 
Thank you. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Uh, is leave granted? Yes, uh, leave, leave is granted. Uh, Senator Hume. Thank you. Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak on behalf of the government on the Public Sector Superannuation Salary Legislation Amendment Bill of 2022. I note that the provisions that this bill seeks um, to amend are currently the subject of an action in the Federal Court of Australia, and so I'll limit my remarks out of respect of that pro to, for that process. Schedule 1 of this bill repeals Section 5E of the Superannuation Salary Regulations with effect from July 1, 1986. And this will regularise regular, the past administrative practice of the Commonwealth uh, employers and employees by effectively restoring the position with respect to rent-free housing that all relevant parties have treated as governing the Commonwealth civilian public sector superannuation scheme since 1986. Schedule 2 of this bill contains exemptions which will ensure that individuals where explicit arrangements were in place about the treatment of rent for salary purposes will not be affected by the repealed provisions. Now, I note that the quantum of financial impacts is presently unquantified and that the administrative task involved in quantifying the financial impacts is prohibitive. However, based on the briefing that we have received from government, we accept that the quantum would involve a significant unintended cost to the federal budget, a significant unintended cost to the taxpayer. So, In putting on the record the opposition support for this bill, I would like to note that the government has provided assurances that this is the most preferred option to resolve this unintended anomaly, that it is not a precedent for retrospective legislation or for such legislation to be rushed through the parliament, and that this is the earliest possible that this legislation could be considered, with an urgency that it must pass before we head into a four-week break between sitting weeks. So I thank the government very much for, and for making officials uh, from the Department of Finance available to brief the opposition on this legislation and the cooperative way that they have approached this matter, and particularly the minister and her office. And I commend this bill to the chamber. Thank you. Senator Pocock. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, this is not my first speech, um, but I rise to speak on this bill and um, to make a few comments uh, from the perspective of the Greens. I appreciate the briefing we had yesterday from a, 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 community, a group of public servants uh, who um, attempted to illuminate the complexity that is before us. But it was a very short uh, presentation, less than 30 minutes, 35 minutes, and um, it illuminated a number of elements in this bill which uh, illustrate its complexity. Um, so I, I've, I rise to express and reinforce the concerns that my uh, friend Senator Hanson Young has put before us. This is a very rushed consideration of a complex question. It's one of the first bills that I've had the opportunity as a new senator to deal with, and I'm surprised that we didn't have before us an analysis which showed, as they suggested, that there would be some people benefited from this bill, but others who would be disadvantaged. But the, the general analysis about how those numbers would fall and what the characteristics were of people affected weren't put before us. So I am surprised that the analysis was thin and inadequate for the complexity of the matter uh, around, uh, in front of us. Superannuation is complex. The schemes that we are dealing with, several of them, are complex. So I am resisting the notion that this is an urgent question which doesn't allow consideration of, of the proper facts, the full facts before us. We don't have adequate information at the, about the bill. We don't know who will be benefited and who will not, who will be disadvantaged. And we need that full analysis. Uh, for the consideration of bills in this place and certainly on this issue. So a rushed process, lacking a fulsome briefing, is problematic. Um, secondly, it's not clear to me why this needs to be uh, rushed through with, with such urgency. What's the reason? We haven't had a full explanation. And I think that uh, setting a precedent for the urgent and very, very quick consideration of this matter is a mistake. Um, the, um, we've been here in this parliament, for a, a, in this sitting, for a week and a half. To find ourselves suddenly dealing with this at this pace uh, is a mistake. 
uh, an issue that's been around, certainly in the court, for over two years, we heard yesterday. That's long enough for us to have had a proper briefing around and it hasn't arrived. The bill is retrospective for, for 30 years. That's a long time. Um, and it's a, really, a real concern to us that that will create some retrospectivity and a precedent around uh, an important piece of legislation, one that we still don't understand the negative or unforeseen implications of. Uh, the bill, it seems, will overturn possibly a, a court outcome in a case that's not yet been concluded. It's important that government doesn't interfere with the courts and that we have a, a, a deliberate and clear separation of powers in what we're doing. Um, we understand here in the Greens the importance of superannuation. Um, it's, it's a really important issue that affects the lives of so many Australians. And we care about making sure that that system works properly, and especially in this case, works well for hardworking public servants over many decades, as this bill would affect them. So we're unable to support this bill, given that Labor haven't given us enough information about how it would affect people, and especially our public servants. We want to ensure that uh, those who do all of the work and in the public sector with their commitment to service are not inadvertently disadvantaged through the rapid progress of a bill that's not well understood, even in this place. So our public sector has been cut to the bone. We have to make sure everything we do rewards and supports and protects public servants, increases their pay and conditions and does no harm. Thank you. Thank you. I call the minister. No one else? Um, okay, thank you. Um, and I thank, can I firstly start by thanking uh, senators for their contribution? Um, in particular, I'd like to thank um, Senator Hume uh, for the cooperation and for our engagement over this issue, and Senator Birmingham prior to Sen Senator Hume's appointment, uh, and also for other senators uh, who have had briefings uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, we accept that this is um, an unusual way of dealing with legislation, um, and it's not. I don't bring this legislation to the chamber lightly, um, and uh, have no um, intention of dealing, treating the um, chamber with any disrespect at all. But this bill is urgent. That is the very, very clear advice uh, from officials um, to the government. The uh, risk. Um, to the Commonwealth in terms of um, financial risk is high uh, and in the order of billions of dollars. Um, and I have responsibilities uh, to ensure um, that we are protecting the interests of the Commonwealth and balancing that with, up with a whole range of other uh, pressing needs. But I would say that this is not mine or the government's general way of operating to be introducing retrospective legislation. Uh, the unique circumstances of this issue leaves us with very little choice if we are to avoid the unintended and inconsistent outcomes that would be really at odds with communities' expectations about what is reasonable in terms of superannuation payments. And I don't think anyone could come into this chamber and argue uh, any other uh, case. I want to um, thank senators for engaging on this, except that it is unusual, um, but um, I think anyone who is engaging on the content of the bill understands why we are taking this action. The bill ensures that the superannuation entitlements of current and former Commonwealth public se sector civilian employees remain as they were understood to be by Commonwealth employees and employers over many years prior to the commencement of a superannuation claim in the federal court. And I think this goes to one of the concerns that Senator Pocock raised around uh, the retrospective nature of the legislation. Um, prospectively, this issue has been dealt with under um, Senator Birmingham when he, it was brought to his attention. Um, the uh, relevant section of the superannuation regulations were repealed uh, prospectively uh, from February I think 28, um, 2022, but we do have this issue going back to 1986. And the important point for the Senate to understand here is that um, this bill enshrines, in a sense, the retrospective nature of it enshrines the administrative practice that has been followed since 1986. Employees were not making member contributions. Employers were not making uh, employer contributions on rent-free housing that was provided to employees on top of their salary and conditions um, as 
in, in free. Since the taxpayer pays the rent, uh, the employee uh, gets their salary. Um, super is paid on their salary, but not on their rent. Um, this is the issue here. So it's in the rental payment was over and above their salary, um, and this is the issue that's that's now in question. But it was administrative practice of the Commonwealth since 1986 to uh, uh, you know to pay super on employees' salary, uh, but not on the rent-free accommodation they were receiving as part of their posting. Um, I want to also go, if I go to the question of um, urgency, um, if this matter were not resolved um, by this week, the differing views about the operation of paragraph 5e of the regulations would not be definitively resolved, and this could perpetuate the possibility of widely variable and inequitable outcomes for different cohorts of employees. And I have been briefed um, and spent some time looking at this uh, by the department. But, for example, you could have a situation where somebody's, an employee's um, lump sum payment of $1.2 million, depending on their posting and their point in their career and a range of other things, which is um, why it does vary widely could go from receiving a lump sum payment of 1.2 million to 11.7 million. That is the consequence of um, not dealing with this. Um, it will also leave other employees with hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially in unpaid member contributions that would need to be dealt with. Another situation, different posting, different stage of the career, receiving an annualised pension in the order of $200,000 could increase to over a million dollars a year. Now, I think that is widely, it doesn't pass the pub test. It's, it's out of um, line with community expectations about the adequacy of superannuation arrangements. And that is why we are dealing uh, with this today. In terms of Senator Pocock's concerns about numbers and how they're affected um, and the analysis um, that um, she's arguing should have been done. Um, there is some uncertainty about that um, because um, you know, if we were to, to do that level of detail, it would require going back individually from 1986 onwards for everybody who has had a posting um, to, to provide that analysis. Um, where the actual, and I'm, that would take a lot of time and resources, and I'm not sure it's particularly useful when we know that this bill is about ensuring that the administrative practice that has been followed since 1986 is essentially reflected um, through this legislation. Um, so I'm not sure we need to fully understand it, every individual circumstance, because every individual will be slightly different based on you know, lengths of service, posting, point in their career, things like that. Um, we do know that we have had thousands of public servants who have um, served overseas and had a posting overseas in the last 30-odd um, years. So we know that the potential reach in terms of numbers affected is you know, in the order of um, 10,000 um, public servants, but we can't be exact on that. But again, I'm not sure that understanding every individual's individual situation and, um, is relevant to the broader question of um, this legislation, which is it do we need to deal with this? We would argue yes. Um, is, the, um, is there an issue about um, you know, I guess um, the differential impacts and the, the way the variable and inequitable outcomes that would apply if we left this um, the way it is now? We would say yes, and that's what this uh, bill does uh, before you today. Um, I think I've covered. Um, I'll just check. Repealing. I've made that point. Repealing the regulations regularises the past administrative, administrative practice of Commonwealth employers and employees by effectively restoring the position with respect to rent-free housing that all relevant parties have treated as governing the Commonwealth civilian public superannuation scheme since 1986. As the purpose of the repeal of paragraph 5e of the regulations is to regularise the long-standing practice of employees and employer, the bill makes provision for certain cases, if any, 
in which paragraph 5e was applied historically, in particular employee relationships in a way that included the value of rent-free housing in superannuation salary. The bill does this by including a limited cohort of in individuals excluding a limited cohort of individuals from the effect of the repeal of paragraph 5e of the regulations where contributions have actually and previously been paid on the basis that a person's super explicitly included the value of rent-free housing. So that is to say that where, where your employment arrangements did explicitly include rent-free accommodation um, counting for superannuation purposes, they are not affected uh, by this bill. Uh, but I do thank um, other senators for their contribution to the debate. Um, this is an important um, piece of legislation, um, and I thank uh, members for their contribution. Uh, thank you, Minister. The question is: the bill will now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Yes. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the bill be read a second time. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Pratt Teller for the ayes and Senator McKim Teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 40, noes 12. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Noah oh, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to public sector superannuation and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. Thank you. I move that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The help. Senator Pope, those of that opinion say no. I think the, the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young, are you? I'm put on the record that the Greens are opposing this bill at the third reader, so we don't have to have another division. Okay. So um, uh, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to public sector superannuation and for related purposes. 
Government business orders of the day number one, uh, Social Security and other legislation amendments, self-employment programs and other measures bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. If senators could please leave the chamber in a quiet and orderly fashion, that would be appreciated. And I'm also in the hands of the chamber as to who is uh, the next speaker or the speaker who might be in continuation on this. Senator Chisholm. Summing up. You're summing up. I call the minister. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. And I thank uh, senators who've contributed uh, to uh, the debate on this bill. Uh, so this is the Social Security and Other Legislation Amendment, Self-Employment Programs and Other Measures Bill 2022. Uh, and the substance of this bill uh, seeks to amend the Social Security law and related elements of the veterans and family laws so it will make it clear that the law operates in the same way for people assessing self-employment assistance programs uh, through the new enterprise scheme. Uh, as many have said earlier uh, in their contributions, uh, the NEIS, uh, NEIS is a proud Labor legacy that was introduced under the Hawke government in 1985, and the program has supported unemployed people to establish their own small businesses. Since, in, it's, since the program's inception, it has helped almost 200,000 people to start a small business, and it's testaments to its success that it has lasted as long as it has uh, through multiple changes in government. Um, some of the people who made contributions in the debate shared success stories, uh, and you can appreciate the important contributions this program provides uh, for people who might not be able to find a job in the traditional sense, but have been given the skills and opportunity to take that leap and start a business as a result of this program. Uh, the bill makes clear that the provisions for NEIS payments uh, also apply equally to self-employment assistance payments as has been the policy intent. Uh, and I just wanted to finish. I uh, was at a community function in Caboolture on Saturday, uh, and I met Rebecca, who uh, talked to me about her partner, who was a uh, veteran out of the armed forces, who was participating in this program and actually talked to me about this legislation. So I can report, Rebecca, that uh, this legislation is before the Senate this week. And I would uh, again thank senators who contributed on this legislation and commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. The question is now that the bill be read, uh, bills be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against? The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to family law, social security and veterans entitlements and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move that this bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to family law, social security and veterans entitlements and for related purposes. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1 Bill 2022 for concurrence. Minister. Right. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation to make miscellaneous and technical amendments to the statute law of the Commonwealth and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, I seek leave to move a motion to exempt this bill from the bill's cut-off order. He, uh, the motion is that leave be granted. Is, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, Minister. Thank you. I table a statement of reasons justifying the need for this bill to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statement incorporated into Hansard. Uh, is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move that the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of the Standing Order 111 not apply to this bill. And the motion agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, Minister. 
Uh, thank you. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. It's leave granted. Yes, uh, leave is granted, and I call Senator Hume. Thank you, Deputy President. The opposition welcomes this bill to the extent that it extends and implements key measures of the former government's economic plan. This bill delivers key measures of the former coalition government's commitment to provide cost of living relief to disaster affected communities, to support women's sport and to cut red tape for business. The bill brings together a number of Treasury measures which were included in bills that lapsed at the election, <coughs> noting that the opposition will be supporting the bill. The bill covers a number of measures from the previous government. Schedule 1 implements important protections around recovery grants for Cyclone Saroja. Schedule 2 uh, supports transitional provisions relating to the repeal of Superannuation Resolution of Complaints Act of 1993. Schedule 3 implements income tax and withholding exemptions for the FIFA World, Women's World Cup. And Schedule 4 makes a number of minor and technical amendments, including tidying up drafting errors and consequential amendments in previous legislation and extending the automatic commencement date for the Modernising Business Registers Bill. This is an uncontroversial bill that wouldn't normally be debated, and uh, the fact that we are, um, we are debating points to the lack of an economic plan from this government. And indeed, just this morning, we've seen another important report from the Productivity Commission, and we have all seen in response from the government, and all we've seen in response from the government is more economic commentary, but not a plan. We could be debating the cost of living. We could be debating cost of living relief. But, and measures to support families, measures to support businesses, but instead we're debating this. Now, Schedule 4, among many minor and technical changes, extends the automatic commencement date for, mo for modernising business, business registers. A lot has been written about this in recent days. All decisions taken with regard to the Modernising Business Register program were included in the Coalition's 2022-23 budget, and then they were independently confirmed by the Secretaries of Treasury and Finance at the 2022 pre-election economic and fiscal outlook. And noting the Minister's second reading speech in the other place, I must add that the government's attempt to politicise this would be far more credible if they weren't planning to drive up de debt and government spending even further. The fact is that this government went to the election proposing to run bigger deficits, bigger deficits, and this was confirmed by the Independent Parliamentary Budget Office, which showed the platform that this government took to the election would actually make the budget bottom line worse. In contrast, the PBO confirmed that the coalition was the only party that went to the election with a pathway to improve the budget bottom line. So while the opposition will be supporting this bill, the politicisation of this measure by the government, despite their supposed support of it, is a damning example of this government's approach to economic policy. The Modernising Business Registers Program is a key deregulatory measure, deregulation measure that will cut red tape reduce the compliance burden and support small businesses around Australia to manage their own affairs. It will unify the systems and the data, allowing users to manage their registrations and compliance in one simple location. This will support small businesses and small business owners to save time. It will make it easier to deal with government. It will cut red tape that's a drag on productivity, a drag on business owners' time and a drag on the resources of government. It is a proud initiative of the former coalition government. So, while we welcome the, the government's commitment to continue the program, it is astounding, astounding that the government is seeking to delay this measure further, not to next year, but to kick it into the long grass all the way to 2026. So much for improving productivity. So while we don't oppose the bill, as it continues a lot of good work that the previous coalition government did, we call upon the government now once again to outline a plan to address the challenges facing Australia's economy. The government can make choices to address these pressures, and they can make those choices right now. The opposition can and will hold them to account as to how they respond, for how they respond to it. 
And the risk for Australia is that this government will make a bad situation worse. Senator McKim. Thank you. Sorry. That off. Thank you um, uh, very much, um, Deputy President. And I can uh, indicate that uh, the Greens will be supporting this legislation, although, um, as uh, senators will be aware, uh, we do have some amendments to this bill which have been um, circulated uh, in my name. And I want to um, speak to um, the issue of corporate tax transparency, uh, because uh, our amendments um, are uh, for the benefit of sen senators. Amendments 1596 and 1597 circulated in my name. And um, the first of these amendments, and I understand we'll get an opportunity to, uh, to debate these in detail, but I do want to place um, uh, on the record that the first of these amendments changes the corporate tax transparency requirements by removing the distinction between Australian resident and foreign resident private companies for the purpose of corporate tax transparency. Uh, and it requires um, uh, instead the ATO to publish information on the tax paid by private companies with a turnover greater than $100 million, regardless of where those companies are domiciled. The second uh, of um, the Greens' amendments abolishes the grandfathered list of private companies who, since 1995, have been exempt from having to lodge financial reports with ASIC. Now, um, those senators who have been in this place for a while might recall the pretty unusual circumstances that resulted in the corporate tax transparency requirements that we currently have. And I want to be very clear about how we find ourselves in this place. In 2013, the former Labor government, with the support of the Greens, legislated that the ATO would publish the gross revenue taxable revenue and tax paid by all private companies with a turnover greater than $100 million. So that was legislated in 2013 by Labor with the support of the Australian Greens. But in October 2015, before the first of those transparency reports was released by the Australian Tax Office, the former government, Liberal government, repealed this requirement in relation to Australian resident private companies. Shortly thereafter, uh, the Greens, in um, uh, the name of my friend and colleague Senator Wish Wilson, uh, rem uh, moved an amendment to another tax bill to reinstate those requirements that uh, the LNP government uh, repealed in October 2015. And at that time, former Senators Xenophon and Muir reversed their previous support for the abolition of those tax transparency requirements. And so the amendment to reinstate corporate tax transparency requirements passed through the Senate. But the Turnbull government rejected that amendment shortly afterwards in the House. Now, following sustained public and political pressure, in December 2015, the Turnbull government relented and agreed to reinstate the corporate tax transparency requirements for Australian private companies, but at a higher turnover threshold. And that threshold that um, was uh, agreed to by the Turnbull government was a turnover threshold of two hundred million dollars a year. Now, it was the Greens who secured this agreement from Prime Minister Turnbull to partially reinstate corporate tax transparency requirements for large Australian private companies that only two months earlier he had repealed. And of course, what we got from Labor at the time was they didn't like it. And what we got from Labor is that they didn't like it that the Greens were being pragmatic. 
that we didn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. That's what we got from Labor. They got cranky with us because we didn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We got all pragmatic and actually worked to deliver something to improve transparency around corporate tax arrangements. And of course, uh, they didn't like it that we led a successful political and community and public campaign to force Prime Minister Turnbull to back down. So they spent collectively a good part of the next four years telling a lie to the Australian people that the Greens watered down tax transparency for big companies, when in fact we didn't, not only did we not water it down, we improved transparency in regards to corporate tax arrangements. And that was a lie at the time and it remains a lie today because you can't water Senator down Mc something that doesn't exist. Senator, sorry, excuse me, Mr. Senator McKim. Point of order. Senator McKim continues to use the word lie and I ask and I ask you to rule whether that's unparliamentary in the context that he is using it. Uh, Senator McKim is referring to the, the party, a particular party as a whole, and not inferring against any individual senator. But uh, Senator McKim, you may wish to reflect on your language, but it's within my understanding, within the standing order. Thank you, uh, President. Um, and, it, uh, and it, it, as I was saying, it was a lie then and a lie now because you actually can't water down something that doesn't exist. I mean, that's a pretty straightforward proposition. Pretty obvious, pretty straightforward. Actually, you can't mount a reasonable argument against the proposition that you can't water down something that doesn't exist. There, to sum up, there were tax transparency requirements, then there weren't, and then the Greens ensured that tax transparency requirements were brought back. We got what we could out of Prime Minister Turnbull, and we improved tax transparency arrangements as a result. It's just that the Labor Party didn't like the Greens not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. So they told this big fat lie and they repeated it. So now, with the Liberal National Party gone out of government, and uh, what a massive sigh of relief I'm sure many people in Australia heaved uh, when that result became known and confirmed. With them gone, we are now putting forward an amendment, which is on sheet 1596, to restore tax transparency thresholds for Australian private companies to levels that were in place before the LNP repealed them and, importantly, at levels that Labor supported at the 2006 and 2019 elections. Curiously, I will note that Labor did not take that policy to the election that we've just held. I have no idea why and um, perhaps someone from uh, the new government uh, might like to address that question um, in a future contribution on this legislation. So I do want to be clear about what happened, and I've, I've been clear about what happened, because there's been a lot of misinformation out there spread by the Labor Party about what's happened, and it's important that folks understand the historical record here. As I said, we had tax transparency requirements, then we didn't, and then the Greens ensured they were brought back. We didn't water down anything because you cannot water down something that does not exist. And just very briefly, um, Deputy President, to the second uh, of our amendments, um, during the course of debate surrounding corporate tax transparency, the issue of the 1,500 or so private companies who were exempted from filling financial statements with ASIC gained um, 
uh, sorry, filing financial statements with ASIC gained prominence. Basically, um, uh, in, in very brief terms, at the point at which the Keating government introduced public financial reporting requirements on private companies, a political fix was organised that meant that some of the biggest and oldest private companies were given a free pass. And, uh, I'll just pause there to observe that so much of what is wrong with neoliberalism is about the inside track that political donors get and that corporate mates get. And that is because we have a system of institutionalised bribery in this country where companies, and in uh, many cases some of the biggest corporations in this country, bribe major political parties to get policy outcomes. And that's why, for example, about one third of the top 100 earning companies in this country pay absolutely no tax whatsoever. It's why the robber barons who run the big gas corporations are laughing all the way to the bank as they pocket their multi-million dollar CEO bonuses, these corporate psychopaths that are cooking the planet. It's why they get away with that stuff, because they bribe the major political parties in this place. It's why the planet's cooking. It's why we're in the sixth mass extinction event in the history of this little ball of rock that circles the sun. It's why um, people are being reduced to economic units, which the pandemic um, has ripped away the facade and, uh, and exposed for all to see that ultimately people are units of an economy rather than human beings, and that's how neoliberalism views them. And part of the reason that the major parties are so beholden to neoliberalism as uh, a philosophical and economic construct is because they bribe the major parties. And interestingly, I reckon in those corporate boardrooms, when they look at their ROIs, their returns on investment, right up at the top with the highest ROI that they achieve on anything is their political donations. It's the best return on a dollar they ever got. Because for every dollar they throw in to the coffers of the Labor and Liberal parties, they're making multi-million, multi-tens of millions, hundreds of millions and, in some cases, billions of dollars in return. And those corporate psychopaths don't care that their actions are cooking the planet. They don't care that there is a chance that billions of people will die this century, mostly brown and black-skinned and poor people, I might add, because they'll be right. They'll have their little uh, retreats on little islands in temperate parts of the world. They'll be able to buy you know, ongoing survival for them and their kids for a little bit longer than the rest of the world because they've grown obscenely rich by cooking the planet. That's the story they tell themselves at night and the story they tell themselves in their corporate boardrooms is some of the best returns on investment they get are from the institutional bribery of political donations. So, back uh, when the Keating government uh, introduced uh, public re financial reporting requirements, the political fix was organised, and that meant some of the biggest and oldest private companies were given a free pass. And um, since it's worth uh, placing on the record that since um, the debate around corporate transparency, corporate tax transparency has been up and running, the Senate has voted to repeal this exemption on numerous occasions. On numerous occasions. Finally now, we've got Labor with the numbers in the other place, in the House of Representatives. So we urge the Labor Party to support our amendments. They deliver a greater level of corporate tax transparency. They are in line with the way that the Labor Party has repeatedly voted on many occasions uh, in this Senate. And we believe in the Greens this is um, an opportunity for this new parliament, with a balance of power in the Senate, where Labor plus the Greens plus one other vote 
can deliver legislation that in this case will improve uh, transparency around corporate tax arrangements and with labor with a majority in the house of assembly uh, in the house of representatives sorry I was going back to my old days in the Tasmanian parliament there president I'm sorry about that uh, labor with a majority in the house of representatives uh, we can make these things a reality and remember corporate tax transparency is critical for applying political pressure to make sure the big corporations pay their fair share of tax so we can invest that revenue in things like dental health into Medicare, mental health into Medicare and making childcare free, making people's lives better. Uh, Senator McKim, I understand that you have a second reading amendment. Would you like to move that? I move uh, both of the amendments standing in my name. Thank Deputy you. Deputy President, thank you. Uh, Senator McKim, uh, I just need to clarify for the benefit of the table staff. Do you have two second reading amendments and you also have obviously some amendments for the committee of the whole? I don't uh, have them before me, so just to make sure we know what we're moving. Th uh, thank you, President. I, just so I appreciate the opportunity to clarify this. I move the second reading amendment that is uh, standing my in my name and I flag that in the committee stages I'll be moving the uh, the amendments to which I just um, referred. Thank you for that. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And I too rise to make a contribution on the Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1 Bill 2022. And um, I I've been in this place for a while, but I remember when I first got here the technical language of all of these. It can be overwhelming. and We've got lots of new senators in the place and they're going to try and come up to speed with things quickly. And Of course, we have people in, in the chamber here who are listening and it's a, a pleasure to see our fellow citizens come and see democracy in action. So when we say we've got a T-Lab bill, which becomes the shorthand contract, people go, what on earth is that? Why does this even matter? And then we have, sadly, uh, and I, as, a, as a Labor politician in, in the government, I would say that there's been an increase in cynicism in the community over the nine years of the previous government, that the government's actually listening to you and will do what you require it to do. So I am very pleased today to bring my contribution to this debate about legislation that the government has already, uh, the opposition has indicated that they are going to support. They had a, a little bit of a whinge about some bits in it, and that's kind of normal for this place. Sometimes that's really helpful, sometimes not so. But uh, that's where we are. We're in the middle of a debate about something that's going to change now. If you are ever one of those people who thinks that politics doesn't affect you and that you can't make a change and you can't have an impact and it will all just happen without, with or without you, I really want to use the opportunity to indicate why this bill is really important. Some of you might be overwhelmed by the level of disasters that have struck this country in recent times. It's overwhelming when you look at the television and the images that come through of disasters that just seem to be coming one after the other. Well, this particular piece of legislation uh, deals with uh, one of those major events that affected the community in Western Australia, and it was a cyclone, Saroja. Um, I've just got an article here that it, it made the BBC News, but it also is covered by our ABC. And this is uh, some of the sense of what happened with cyclone Saroja. So it tore through the Western Australian town of Northampton uh, and one of the school's principals stayed on the telephone to the local priest as the house around the cleric fell apart. Finally, Father Larry Rodillas got out from under his kitchen table and ran for his life to the school next door, sheltering in a classroom until the Category 3 storm had passed the next morning. That's just one story of one incident that happened as a consequence of that storm. You can imagine families left without homes, incredible disaster. Everything that people had worked for, all of a sudden, it's, it's all gone. And when the storm blows out and the deafening silence returns, people have to try and pick up the pieces of their life. Um, that article was an ABC article by um, ABC Midwest Wheat Belt by Cecile O'Connor. And I'm sure that you know, the power of recording that story and putting it on a public record 
And then the advocacy of people from the region to parliamentarians helps make these processes that we undertake here very, very important, because those stories of what's going on do matter. Um, the actual uh, description that the BBC have is that Cyclone Saroja ripped across a thousand kilometre stretch of Western Australia. A thousand kilometres. Can you imagine how many people, not just houses, and often if we hear this as people who live um, in cities or in, in regional towns, you sort of think about the housing. But the impact is massive on the agricultural sector and indeed the mining sector. You know, once you've had things ripped up and thrown around, You've got to replace them and try and make things work. It's very, very difficult for the entire community and the economy of that entire community. Um, Kalbarri resident Debbie Major said the storm, which hit the resort town around 7 p.m., uh, raged through the night and was absolutely terrifying. You just thought, this is it. I would have thought that when we opened the door, there would be nothing around us except that roof. We're a small town, half of it has been flattened. So the problem that arises then is how quickly a government can respond. And we've seen very, very different models of how governments choose to respond to the crises that exist. In my home state of, Lis of uh, New South Wales, we all saw the images of Lismore, just overwhelmed. And we saw a politically timed non show by the former Prime Minister, an abandonment of that community, you know, leading figures in the community who have some wealth on their side, including some of our foremost entertainers and performers, brought in their own private helicopter to winch people off roofs. That's one way a government can choose not to respond to the reality of its citizens. And then there's the other way, in which I want to uh, applaud the efforts of my uh, newly minted Senator, uh, Minister uh, Murray Watt, who is from the great state of Queensland. And of course, we know that there's huge problems with insurance because of all these disasters in the northern part of our country. And that problem has been around for the entire time of the previous government and not dealt with. So what can we do and what is this legislation doing today to help the people of Kalbarri and the people of the Midwest of Western Australia? What, what are we going to do? Well, currently, the law as it stands says grants provided under Category C of the Disaster Recovery Funding, arrangements 2018 to small business and primary producers with a farm enterprise of any size that were affected by Cyclone Saroja, are assessable as income for income tax purposes. Now, let's sort of break that down. You're running a business. You got smashed by the cyclone. You do get some support from the government, and it's going to be taxed. Now, that makes life very tricky because, <laughs> in addition to the physical tumult, there's a huge emotional burden and some people just pick up sticks and they move. The ones who stay, the ones who keep their businesses going, the ones who keep showing up to work, we need to support those people and we need to make it as easy as possible for them to get on and do what they do best. So what we are going to do, and I am hopeful that this legislation will pass the place, is the new law is re referring again to grants provided under Category C of the, discover the Disaster Recovery Funding, says that uh, arrangements 2018 to small businesses and primary producers with a farm enterprise of any size that were affected by Cyclone Saroja are non-assessable and non-income non-exempt income for income tax purposes, meaning that they are not subject to income tax. And that matters. It matters because it simplifies the way in which a tax return will be prepared for those businesses and those individuals. And I think it also shows to people who have survived Cyclone Saroja that a government can show goodwill support them in what they do. We all pay our income taxes and we all get the benefit of that in the services that are provided and the roads that we drive on and all the infrastructure that's there. But I don't think any fair-minded Australian wants to see tax coming from somebody who suffered incredible damage physically, financially and emotionally by disaster. 
So that's what the very first section, the first schedule of this bill will do. Now there are four sections to the bill, and in the time that I have remaining, because I only we only we only have limited time to uh, make a contribution, um, there are four sections of the bill. I think I might go to one I think that will be of great interest to people right at this moment. Uh, many Australians will be watching with great joy the incredible success of our sporting people over in Birmingham at the Commonwealth Games. Uh, remarkable performances from individuals and remarkable support from a whole organisation that wraps around it. Well, there are implications for FIFA uh, and the Australian subsidiary from income and withholding tax um, with regard to from the period of 1 July 2020 to 30th of, uh, 31st of December 2028. Uh, and this is with regard to the FIFA Women's World Cup. So when things aren't organised uh, sufficiently, sometimes there is a cost. And the role of government is to make sure that great organisations like FIFA can do what they need to do and that they can operate in a way that allows us to be successful and to also enable sporting diplomacy. I mean, there are amazing people who will be travelling to the country for FIFA, and we want to make sure that it's uh, the best possible experience. So for the successful delivery of the 2023 FIFA um, Women's World Cup, we know that we'll have uh, the benefit of enhancing Australia's reputation as a host for major international sporting events, if we can get it right, and that stimulates the other sections of our economy as well. We also want to promote women's sport in a very authentic way, and we've had incredible success with our team, uh, so we want to make sure that we support them. And We also want to make sure that this, the current uncertainty about the tax arrangements that exist is currently impacting the um, capacity of the organisers of the FIFA World Cup, the women's FIFA, the FIFA Women's World Cup, um, they're having trouble putting in place all the arrangements that they need, and it's particularly in relation to a part that faces into the community, which is with regard to ticket sales. Now, those ticket sales for this phenomenal event, the FIFA Women's World Cup, which is going to be a privilege for us to host, uh, need to be ready to be able to advance with ticket sales from September 2022. So the third uh, schedule of this bill is actually going to be fixing up that problem for the FIFA Women's World Cup to make sure that we can provide the best and most seamless possible uh, opportunity for that organisation to do their job. Um, the other two schedules deal with uh, very, very important matters, um, and I will probably only be able to speak to Schedule 2 in the time that's left. But it's about superannuation. So we've got a whole lot of tax you might be following here. We've got a whole lot of different bits of the tax law that's getting slightly amended. So this Schedule 2 actually relates to what's called transitional provisional provisions relating to the repeal of superannuation resolution of Complaints Act 1993. So people will be familiar that in um, 2017 the government agreed to the recommendations of a very important review, the Ramsey Review, to establish what's called the Australian Financial Complaints Authority to replace the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal. Now, Having superannuation is a labour legacy. It's a fantastic asset for our country to have trillions of dollars in funds enabling people to plan for their retirement, to anticipate that they can live a great retirement with dignity and having had the benefit of that saving and it's multiplying through investment through their superannuation to a point where they have a really great nest egg at the end of their life. But sometimes there can be debate amongst a provider and somebody who has that superannuation, and they need somewhere to go. So that is really uh, a very important part of what this particular schedule is going to do. We know that the SCT uh, stopped operating on the 31st of December 2020, 
At that time, they had six remaining cases that they successfully tr transferred to the new body, the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. And uh, the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal finally closed on the 5th of March this year. Now, what we're seeking to do with the amendments that are embedded in this bill in Schedule 2 of the bill is to ensure that the necessary administrative arrangements are in place, which will allow the Australian Securities Investment Commission, much more commonly known as ASIC, and I note that there were comments on the radio from ASIC this morning about budgeting in this climate. Uh, so ASIC talk to us about money and they are going to have a role in managing people's complaints about superannuation. Um, they need to undertake the ongoing management of those superannuation co um, complaints tribunal records and they are also going to take over managing any uh, outstanding cases in the federal court um, and they are going to be appropriately remitted back to AFCA. So, What's good about this is it's an administrative change in the background to make sure that records are going to be kept. The people who need to be able to do the job are authorised to do the job. Now, the great thing by doing that and putting that in this legislation, doing the job of being a government, taking the careful work seriously, we are going to make sure by this action, this schedule, that complainants are going to benefit from it. They will not be adversely affected. Uh, and that AFCA is clearly now the primary external dispute resolution body responsible for handling superannuation-related companies, and uh, that it is properly resourced to resolve any outstanding uh, superannuation complaints tribunal matters. So that is the business of government that's going on in the chamber today, and I'm pleased to have been able to make a contribution on the Treasury Laws Amendment Bill. Thank you, Chief Deputy. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I rise to speak on this bill in my capacity as the Shadow Emergency Management Minister. I note um, that the Shadow uh, Finance Minister has always already put the um, opposition's uh, perspective on the record, but I rise to talk to this bill because of exactly the um, case studies that Senator O'Neill was raising. Um, the benefit of the passage of this bill to those communities and businesses that were devastatingly impacted by Cyclone Saroja in April 2021. This was the worst cyclone to hit Western Australia in 22 years. Um, as uh, Senator O'Neill said, Schedule 1 of this bill amends the Income Tax Assessment Act 1997 to ensure that the people who were provided grant assistance as a result of Cyclone Saroja don't get penalised through our tax laws. The amendment will confirm that payments provided to these small businesses and primary producers as recovery grants under Category C of the Disaster Recovery Funding Arrangements will not be treated as tax in the sense of an assessable income. And this makes sense because anyone in receipt of any of these grants They've, more often than not, they've lost everything, and um, they are given a grant to help them get back on their feet, and then the tax man comes in with his hand out to take it back. So, this is why we particularly support Schedule One. But I also want to take the opportunity to talk about the other side of these grant programs that the Commonwealth Government uh, participates in. It's, there's no point having a tax exemption if the money through the grant program is not forth, forthcoming or is frustratingly slow at being dispensed. I know that we've um, heard a lot about our major emergency events over the last few years. We've had floods, we've had cyclone events in Queensland. Um, and we've had the bushfires, but Cyclone Saroja was certainly a doozy, and it lived up to its Category 3 uh, classification. But it also hit areas that have never been hit by cyclones, that were just not prepared for cyclones. And therefore, so much of the damage was not just from winds, but also the debris that the winds whipped up and flew around wide, wildly. 
Cyclone Saroja started on the 7th of April as a relatively weak cyclone. But as it started to move towards the southeast, it intensified and within four days it had increased to category three, a severe tropical cyclone. The impact area was estimated to be 133,000 square kilometres, with maximum wind gusts of around 170 kilometres an hour. And there was significant damage to critical infrastructure, including roads, telecommunications and emergency service buildings. Several towns were severely damaged, and it was estimated that in Cal Calbarry and Northampton, around 70 per cent of homes were seriously affected. A later report found that debris, not just winds, was the main cause of damage. And because the buildings in this region were not built to cyclone standards, it increased the extent, the extent and breadth of the damage. So in July last year, our government, the coalition government, in conjunction with the WA state government, announced more than 104 million would be made available under the Commonwealth State Disaster Recovery Funding Arrangements Program. This was the largest funding made available in Western Australia's history. The DR DRFA is a joint funding program uh, which we initiated in 2018, under which the Australian government may contribute up to 75 per cent of the costs of assistance spread across the four categories. And, uh, it is then delivered through working with the states. The, category, the four category areas range from category A, which provides assistance for individuals immediately impacted, category B, which then also provides assistance for state and local government areas for restoration of essential public assets and counter disaster operations. It also covers assistance to small business, primary producers, not for profits and needy individuals through concessional loans, subsidies or grants. As we build up through the categories, category C is assistance for severely affected communities, regions or sectors and includes clean-up and recovery grants for small businesses and primary producers. And then finally, category D provides exceptional circumstances assistance. But importantly, under this program, while the Commonwealth can fund up to 75 per cent. It is a joint program, and it is the states who assess the type and level of assistance available. It's the states that go out and assess, assess whether it should be Category A or Category D funding. It's also the states that are then responsible for administering these assistance measures and getting the money out the door. After Cyclone Saroja, 16 local government areas were deemed eligible for funding. I'm not certain how many have applied, but I know because of the contact through my office, there is general disappointment and disillusionment at the um, efficiency of getting the funding out the door. In fact, I have been contacted by many councils who are complaining about the slowness of delivery. Um, they're asking why, when the 140 mi 104 million sorry, was announced, <clears throat> there is still people waiting for funding to come out the door. Now, over the last couple of years, as I said before, we've had a lot of emergency uh, crisis arise. And the now Minister for Emergency Management was very quick to constantly deride and criticise efforts of federal coalition in getting grants assessed and delivered. Yet it was our government that actually implemented schemes through Services Australia to enable money to immediately go to individuals uh, after times of crisis. It's also our government that established the disaster recovery allowance to let small businesses and tradies and employees who are impacted by emergencies have an ongoing allowance for up to 13 weeks so that there is, uh, they can keep food on the table. But 
There was no acknowledgement by those on the other side where the states have to play their part. And um, now, in government, I have not yet heard from the emergency management minister uh, any comments about the slowness of getting these grants out the door. I'm not sure if he's applied the same level of scrutiny and derision to his colleagues in the Western Australian Labor government as he did to our Commonwealth government in previous uh, emergencies. I suspect they've not been handed at all. I suspect that now the minister, Senator Watt, has got the portfolio he was so expert on in opposition. He's decided that it's either too hard, too uninteresting, or, in his words, not his job, because it's the state government's job. Or has he passed it on to his new envoy, Senator Tony Sheldon? Is it now Senator Sheldon's job to make sure that the states are delivering the funding that we are providing to the states to get it out the door? Now, this portfolio is not without its challenges, and it is certainly not the piece of cake to manage, as Senator Watt used to make out on a regular, ba regular basis in estimates or in snipes at question time, and he's heckling across the chamber, which I do also note he doesn't really appreciate getting when he's rising to answer questions uh, now that he is minister. So, whoever's in charge, whether it is Senator Watt or Senator Sheldon, I ask them to get on the phone to their state Labor ministerial colleagues in Western Australia and ask what the hold-up is. Ask them what they are doing to ensure that the $104 million put on the table by the coalition government, which has been carried forward by the new government, and I, I applaud them for that. But what is Western Australia doing to make sure these grants are assessed and processed and the money is getting to where it's needed? Otherwise, it doesn't make a difference if it's treated as taxable income or not. If it is not in the hands of the people who need it, it doesn't matter whether we treat it as tax or not. Um, in closing, <coughs> I also I do want to echo the comments of my colleagues on this side of the chamber about what we are doing here today. There was no reason that this bill needed to be put up for debate. It was a non-controversial bill. Uh, it's a mechanical tidy-up that shouldn't have taken time on the Senate program. While I'm pleased to have had the opportunity to highlight the taxation changes for those who may receive disaster recovery grants, and I appreciate the opportunity to highlight the issues of the state commonwealth jurisdictions when it comes to administering such grants, um, I fear that having this debate today highlights the dearth of economic plans from the government and the economic plan the Prime Minister talked so much about during the election campaign, but we're still yet to see, and where the business is that should be being put before us to help Australians address cost of living issues. In saying that, uh, we support the bill and I commend the bill to the Chamber. Um, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And I too rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1 bill of 2022. Uh, and, uh, I begin by noting the wide support in the chamber uh, for this bill, uh, including uh, amongst uh, the opposition, uh, and uh, note Senator Davies' um, uh, support, uh, particularly for Schedule 1, uh, which is incredibly important uh, in making sure that people affected by um, the devastating cyclone Saroja, um, which hit parts of, of WA last year, 
um, are able to receive the, the full amount of relief uh, funding uh, without losing uh, that much, much needed relief uh, in their tax returns. Uh, and of course, um, I would also uh, note some of Senator Davies' uh, comments about the government's uh, emergency services minister, Senator Watt, uh, and, uh, and I would commend uh, Minister Watt um, for his work um, in getting straight out to the flood zones in South East Queensland uh, and northern New South Wales. Uh, and of course commend his work uh, in his portfolio uh, in doing what this government um, will always do, uh, which is turn up, show up, take responsibility uh, and make sure that people on the ground uh, have exactly what they need uh, in times of, of crisis uh, Walsh, like this. Uh, standing orders require me to interrupt you. Uh, we are now into Senator's statements. I note that speaking times have been agreed by the whips. With the concurrence of the chamber, I will ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator O'Neill. Deputy President, and uh, these contributions where senators are able to actually make a statement about matters of import are really very important parts of the way the function, uh, the chamber functions. And uh, today, I'm really pleased to be able to put on the record uh, a small uh, indication of something that happened here in the building just last week. It was a pretty big thing because it involved people coming to fight for fairness, and it was a, a delegation by the Transport Workers' Union who came in to make sure that this parliament understands what's actually going on in the transport sector. And I acknowledge many of my colleagues who have been very active, including uh, Senator Jana Stewart in the Transport Workers' Union prior to coming to this place. Uh, and they're, they're, they're a vital part. Unions are a vital part of making sure that the voice of those who are so busy working whether they're driving trucks as owner drivers, whether they're business owners who own large business companies, or whether they're drivers who are now feeling very, very under the burden of uh, the gig economy and the insecurity that is embedded in that. All of those people were represented in the room. Now, I did say that I felt privileged because there were so many amazing workers there who were speaking for the people that they know and that they work with. The TWU certainly been at the forefront against the, in the fight against the, what they call the Amazon model, which is leading to the continued exploitation of workers in the gig economy and in the road transport industry. Now, we all drive on the roads. I recall, and I'm sure, uh, Deputy President, you know, you've probably spent a few hours doing some driver instruction uh, in, in the car. 120 hours in New South Wales. I've got three children. You can do the maths. There were a lot of interesting conversations over the course of that. And now they're out on the roads. I do think that they're safe drivers, but I need everybody on the road to be able to operate the vehicle that they're driving safely. And that doesn't happen when people are under incredible pressure. The transport industry, sadly, is the most dangerous industry in Australia. And it became much more dangerous when the previous government gutted the Road Safety Remuneration Tribal, tri Tribunal. And uh, thanks to the action of the coalition, uh, working with dodgy operators, they gutted workers' pay and conditions. And that terrible decision has actually cost lives. Government policy impacts how we live. And when you don't look after the wages, when you don't look after the conditions of people who are on our roads driving for a living, when you allow their conditions to be eroded and risk to be built in, we are all at a disadvantage. Since the removal of the tribunal, there's been over 1,000 truck crash deaths, and the surveys uh, that I was able to, uh, to be able to see show a shocking pressure, a pressure cooker that many transport workers are trying to eke out a living in. One in four drivers have been involved in a crash while at work. 55 per cent of owner drivers have delayed repairs because they cannot afford them. One in five are pressured to illegally speed to meet deadlines. 
One in four are pressured, pressured to drive past legal hours and skip needed rest breaks. And 52 per cent of drivers have experienced wage theft. Now they are alarming statistics. And they impact how I feel about driving on the road since I heard them and was reminded of them. Now, what's going on in the sector is fundamentally an unsustainable model. And it's imperative on the sector, both the owners and the workers to find a way forward together that makes it safer for all of us and our families on the road. We certainly need to do more to protect workers who are the ones who are moving this country and ensuring that our supply chains are intact as much as they can be because they've been so profoundly impacted and disrupted. We should not allow a system to continue that puts the lives of truckers at risk. We should not allow a system to continue that forces them out of the industry by increasingly intolerable conditions. Now, we support the move as a, the, the Labor Party and the party of government for business to become much more tech savvy, more agile, for workers to have more flexibility about where and when they work. That's all good. But what we do not support is a system whose secret source is simply worker exploitation and using loopholes in labour hire laws to make sure that workers do not even make the minimum wage. That is not the country that I want to stand up and represent. That is not the country that my immigrant parents came to and grew a great life in. Fair wages, a fair day's pay for a fair day's work is absolutely fundamental. A business model that is as brutal as that cannot be allowed to stand. Amazon Flex and other models who try to emulate it rely on three key practices. Undercutting workers' conditions, outsourcing to labour hire and other insecure work models so they can pretend they can pretend that they are not responsible for what's going on down the food chain. It's just completely untenable that those who are driving the system, making profits from the system and taking those profits offshore without paying tax, that those people get to put Australian lives at risk. That cannot continue. It cannot continue. FedEx is trying to bring in a model like this, where owner drivers are to be paid to deliver 93 parcels in a 10-hour shift, or one every six minutes. Give me a break. That is a truly impossible expectation for anyone. And that's why they're being paid less than the minimum wage. More work for less money. That is not how you grow a country. That is not how you enhance the lives of Australians. That is not how you grow our economy. The more we shrink the money that goes to our workers, the worse it is, particularly in local economies in regional areas of this country. At a meeting last work week, week, we saw really incredible, le incredible leadership by honest business owners who have a lot of experience in this field. They stood shoulder to shoulder with workers, calling for safe rates and an end to this race to the bottom model of doing business that is being imported into this country, brought into Australia to totally remove our proper, our proper sense of what fairness is, to exploit the most vulnerable. Now, under the previous government, business and unions were treated like oil and water, that they couldn't work together. But I was here in this building with great business leaders and workers standing together shoulder to shoulder saying, this model has to change. We cannot allow the lie that was perpetuated in the time of the previous government's nine long years of decay. We cannot allow the lie that business and unions can't work together and that unions do not deserve their place in the public, in the public converse, conversation. Unions are vital. When you're working every hour that God sends, you need somebody who's doing the job of standing up for you. 
That's what unions do, and that's what they were doing here last week. The myth has to be broken, and it will be broken uh, in the way that this government responds to it. I just want to put on the record a couple of the quotes that I took down as I was listening from a business owner. I'm here to support reform that allows good business, safe business, to, pr to prosper and grow. Why would anybody stand in the way of that? When good businesses prosper and grow, jobs grow, people's lives are enhanced. From Arthur, 1,500 employees who might know a little bit about this sector. There needs to be a positive change to sustainable ways, to primacy of safety. The supply chain is incredibly disrupted and it's not viable. We are not in the position, he said, in Australia to allow practices in USA, in Asia and some places in Europe to proliferate here. The damage will be devastating. Workers, owner-drivers, employers, union, we share concerns. I share their concerns. I applaud them for their efforts in coming here and raising these issues, and I want those on the opposite side not to stand in the way of the necessary reform for Australian safety on roads. Senator Brockman. Deputy President, I rise today uh, at the first opportunity in this new parliament uh, that I have had to make a few reflections on the uh, election campaign of a few months ago and the election result of a few months ago and to pay tribute uh, to the many people in, Western in the West Australian Liberal Party who did so much for our cause uh, in what was a very tough result. My, my, first memory, my first political memory is the dismissal in 1975, and I can remember very, very clearly the excitement uh, of my father in the dismissal. But I also have a very vague memory um, from December of that year of, of standing at a polling booth with my dad, uh, with my dad handing out how to vote cards. And uh, obviously that was a great result for the Liberal Party of Australia, a great result for the nation, I would also contend. Uh, but it doesn't always go that way. But you'll still find on those polling booths across my home state of Western Australia across Australia, supporters of the Liberal and National Party out in force, handing out the how to vote cards, standing up for our principles, our values and doing the right thing by Australian democracy. The tenacity and commitment displayed by our volunteers, by our candidates, by all members of parliament is remarkable and deserves recognition. And that is why I rise today to thank particularly those volunteers and candidates, particularly the unsuccessful candidates, for their time and energy on the campaign tra trail. Most of our supporters are volunteers. They get little recognition or praise for the work they do, uh, but they deserve recognition and they deserve praise. We believe in a government that lim limits interference in the everyday lives of Australian families and individuals that incentivises success, that encourages equal opportunity and lets everyone reach their full potential. That is what Liberal governments surprise to do, uh, strive to do. And to all Liberal volunteers who support that, I thank you for setting aside your time for fighting for those shared values. Uh, it was a tough result for those on this side of the chamber and for all our supporters across Australia. I had the privilege to be involved particularly in two campaigns. Uh, one of those was the Swan campaign, uh, where we had an amazing team, an amazing team of volunteers, uh, particularly from the youth wing of our party. The young Liberals stepped up extraordinarily and did an absolute power of work. And I can genuinely say that even though the result was not what we wanted, it was one of the most energetic and well-run campaigns I have seen in my political life. Uh, our candidate, Christy McSweeney, thank you. Senator Matt O'Sullivan, who is in this place uh, as a good friend of mine, 
uh, chaired an absolutely outstanding campaign effort. Uh, the door knocking, the letterboxing, the sign waving, uh, just making sure that all volunteers uh, were fed and, and looked after, that everyone knew what their task was and performed it to their highest ability. Uh, the, the result was in no way a reflection on the efforts of that amazing team of volunteers. To everyone, the supporters of our party who weren't necessarily intimately involved in the campaign but who turned up on election day or at pre-poll to hand out how to vote cards, uh, in particular the clean-up crew, and you know who you are, uh, those four days when we knew what the result was, cleaning up after the election in icy winds, in the pouring rain. Uh, with some dodgy cheeseburgers, and uh, those who were around know what I'm talking about. Uh, but thank you so much for your efforts. Uh, there was an amazing legacy in Swan from Steve Irons, 14 years of leadership. He delivered for Swan as a local member should. Infrastructure, roads upgrades, local community projects. Uh, it was a remarkable uh, legacy that Steve has left for Swan and that all Liberals can be proud of. Now, the second campaign I just wish to reflect on briefly is a, a very different campaign. Uh, it's in the seat of Fremantle, which is obviously one in which uh, we do not necessarily perform uh, quite as well. But what we did do is fly the Liberal flag very proudly. Uh, the Fremantle campaign was very active and alive, and I particularly wish to thank our candidate, uh, Bill Cool. Bill took time out from his own business to run as a candidate to promote the Liberal cause. Obviously, Bill gets nothing in return for this, but Bill provided somewhere for Liberal supporters to rally, but he also provided endless enthusiasm optimism. He stood on pre-poll handing out those How to Vote cards uh, every day. And you never talked to Bill without an optimistic word about the people he had met on pre-poll in Fremantle, the, um, the amazing uh, conversations he had had when he was out and about door knocking, the positive, re positive response he was getting from people right across the electorates. So, as, as Bill said in his congratulatory message to the, the sitting member, Josh Wilson, democracy demands more than one candidate or one party to run. So right across Australia, um, right across um, the nation, we should all thank those candidates who stand in seats where they know they're very, very unlikely to even get close. But where it is vitally important for democracy that we have individuals who are willing to put their hands up. And that's what the constituents of Fremantle received. Bill Cool put his hand up, put in the long hours spent on the hustings, door knocking, letter boxing, standing in the rain at voting centres, and those unwavering efforts for the duration of the campaign certainly deserve my acknowledgement, and I certainly do so. And to all, again, the Fremantle campaign volunteers, uh, it was an, an, an outstanding effort from the division. Uh, we put in the work uh, that was needed in, in Fremantle, and uh, we thank Bill sincerely for all his efforts. So the result was not one we wanted, though I will remind all Liberal and National supporters out there that our, our primary vote was, in fact, uh, more than the Labor Party's—36 uh, per cent to 32.5. Now, there are enough preference flows, and the Labor Party secured enough preference flows to get over the top in terms of the two-party preferred, and that is what is required to form government. We understand that. But there were more people out there who chose our philosophy than chose the Labor Party philosophy. And that is something I would certainly encourage all members and supporters of the Liberal Party, the Liberal National Party, the country Liberal Party 
to remember as we take the fight up to the government over the next three years. Senator Polly. On the 1st of May 2022, Australia voted for a better future. For only the fourth time since the end of the Second World War, they voted for a Labor opposition and, in, do, in doing so, voted for an Albanese Labor government. The people of Australia voted for a future full of hope over division, substance over spin, a future which embraces progress and change, a future which is, embraces the principles of opportunity for all, not for a few. It was a vote for common sense, compassion and integrity. People voted for a plan to create secure local jobs, to address cost of living pressures, something which all Australians are suffering from right now, to bring manufacturing back to Australia, to strengthen Medicare and access to health services, including affordable prescription medications, to make childcare cheaper, for action on climate change, to ensure dignity in ageing and aged care. That's why I was so proud our first piece of legislation was about aged care. Congratulations to um, our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, and to our ministers. To make access to TAFE and skills more accessible and for integrity within our political institutions, an Albanese Labor government will embrace the opportunities of the future and, as our leader, Anthony Albanese, said on election night, our policies and actions over the next three years will be embedded by the Uluru Statement from the Heart. History is calling, so I quote, we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. The Uluru Statement calls for a permanent forum of representation from the First Nations people can, so they can advocate for their people to the parliament and to government. This voice should be enshrined in the constitution so it cannot be removed by any government of the day. And I call on those in this parliament across the country to embrace this reform. It will forge a strong and united future for a better Australia. The election victory was a win for Labor values, which I firmly believe are Australian values. These are the value of hard work, compassion and fairness. But let us not be under any assertion that our politics is not fractured in this country, because it is. Australians voted for conciliation, cooperation and negotiation. We now owe it to the Australian people to do just that. If our politics is to be more effective, if we are to be trusted again by the Australian people, if we are willing to listen to us more than our politics, then we must be kinder, less toxic and less divisive. If we are to restore that faith and commitment to the people and to our nation's discourse, then the nation's starting point must be a national anti-corruption commission. After almost 10 years of inaction from those opposite and the fact that we drifted, I believe that our nation's conscience can now be restored with all the hope it first had. We are a lucky country and we deserve a na national government that will put the people of Australia first, to serve them to the best of our ability and to serve all of their interests. That must start with strong economic management as the global economy teeters on the edge of recession. People's wages have been kept low by the former Morrison government by design. That was their, that was their strategy. That was their priority, to keep wages low. That must change. And we have started this with an increase of $40 per week to the minimum wage. We must embrace the future and react to the global challenges. Australian sovereignty capabilities must be strengthened, and we must ensure that we are keeping pace with the rest of the world in terms of what we produce at home and what we export across the globe. Australia can be a renewable energy superpower, and we can lead the world on climate action, which pays economic and social dividends for the future generations. A target to reduce carbon emissions by 43 per cent by 2030 is a realistic and a tangible target we have now set. Business and the Australian people now have a target and a mechanism to work to 
towards this end. Ultimately, Labor was successful at this election because we were willing to stand up for the, to the former government and to say enough is enough. Australians deserve better leadership and they will receive it under the Albanese Labor government. We are an intelligent country and everybody has a place in it, a contribution to make. We are at our best when we embrace all Australians to reach for the stars of the Southern Cross and achieve great things as a whole. Labor has become the natural party of government in Queensland, in Victoria, in West Australia, South Australia, the ACT, the Northern Territory and now in the federal parliament. And I hope in the years to come that we will follow in my home state of Tasmania and elect a future Labor government there. Labor will always be the party of working people, of Australian families trying to get ahead, of inspirational Australians doing the very best for themselves, their family and their community. We will always be the party of compassion, the party that does not leave people behind, the party of a strong and united and a resilient people. That's the leadership that we will bring to this country. For me, the Australian dream is ensuring that regardless of where you are from or who your parents are, you can make it. You can dream big and you can achieve your goals. We all are contributors and everyone has that right and opportunity to contribute to our society in whatever capacity you choose. That is the definition of success. Now we know that Australia is a lucky country, but if Australians can't reach their full potential out of the fruits of their labour, then we're not so lucky. We as a people have significant challenges facing, facing this country. The cost of living is on the rise, inflation is on the increase, house prices are some of the most unaffordable in the world and wages have flatlined under the previous government, no matter what they say when they come into this place and try and rewrite history. Labor will act decisively in government to make Australia the lucky country once more. So future generations have not been worse off than the current generation, because that is currently the case. This election victory does not come without a cost to the people who have campaigned for a better future for many, many years. Over the years, we have lost some very good people. Yes, some will come back, but others will not. I want to thank each and every one of our true believers across the country who have gone beyond what is expected of them. They helped us campaign, as they always do, and your support and your campaigning was invaluable. And that's why we are standing where we are now on this side and being part of the Albanese Labor government. Prime Minister Albanese has much work to do, and you know that that job is never complete. It is not complete and never will be, because while there exist barricades to opportunities and success, Labor will be there to tear them down. While there are gatekeepers of privilege, the Labor story will continue. We will fight the good fight. We don't divide people or try to control what they think through big donor donations or one-sided media landscape. We are Labor. We are better than that. We believe in freedom and aspiration, the right of people to make up their own mind with information based on fact. We engage in good faith on the basis that we can talk to as many people and to listen to those people as possible. We want to listen to their hopes, their dreams, and to try to align our policies to their aspirations every single day to make this country even better. All Australians deserve to live in a country that has decent wages, affordable childcare, modern infrastructure to create the economy of tomorrow, including serious action on climate change and emission reductions. I've been re-elected to this place, and I hear you, I respect you, and I will continue to fight for you every day that I remain in this place and thereafter. During the election campaign, Labor committed to many projects and as a positive future for Tasmania, I plan to embrace that future and I urge those opposite to come on this journey to move away from your born to rule mentality and cooperate with the government to make this country even better. And the way that we can do that is by
by working together. We need to change the discourse in this place to embrace that aspiration and to be the voice of the Australian people. You will get used Your to opposition. Your time has expired, Senator Polly. I call Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. History is littered with unfathomable acts of evil, acts so vile when reflected upon one is forced to consider the moral deficiencies of mankind. Madam Acting Deputy President, if we do not stand against those who act in the most egregious and abhorrent manner, their disease will infect many nations across the globe. Which is why I rise today to once more raise the plight of the people of Ukraine. Since the Russian invasion began 160 days ago, there have been 5,200 Ukrainian deaths, 7,000 injured and over 17 million people displaced. Ukraine is currently on the front line of renewed great power rivalry, one the West has not had to contend with since the Iron Curtain fell in 1991. The of support, in the absence of continued support for Ukraine would not only be a moral failure of the highest order, but a strategic and security failure on a magnitude not seen since the policies of appeasement pursued some 85 years ago. On the 24th of February, when the Russian invasion began and Russia sent tanks across the border and rockets hurtling across the sky, it had the aim of denying Ukraine's right to self-determination, but also threatened the order of which the world, in, with whatever its faults, is supposed to be based on, this, on the inviolability of this right. Unable so far to achieve outright success on the battlefield against the Ukrainian military, Russian war doctrine has once again has gone to siege warfare, a tactic which has brought about death and destruction to the civilian population. In doing so, they have signalled clearly that they intend to terrorise the civilian population of Ukraine as a means of compelling the government to give ground at the negotiating table. Nothing is clearer in both international law and the ethics of war than the absolute prohibition on precisely what Russia is doing directly targeting civilians. Now, this is not the first time that the international community has been faced with such belligerent acts against human rights, and I'm pretty sure it won't be the last. But how we re respond to these acts now will shape the future and may prevent violations from occurring again in the future. After the failures of the 1990s to prevent the atrocities that unfolded in the Balkans and Rwanda, the international community engage in a debate in how to react to gross and systemic violations of human rights. The result was 138 countries agreeing in 2005 to the pr principle of responsibility to protect. Responsibility to protect, or R2P as it is known, gives the international community a mandate to act against gross injustices such as genocide and crimes against humanity. To quote Plato in The Republic, of all things of a man's soul which he has within him, justice is the greatest good and injustice the greatest evil. It is therefore incumbent on the world to look within and seek justice for the people of Ukraine. The trials and tribulations mankind suffers from is great and will continue to burden the globe unless we stand against the injustice being perpetuated by tyrants and dictators such as President Putin. As English philosopher Thomas Hobbes famously argued in his book Leviathan, without government life would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. And if Russia gets its way and removes the Ukrainian government, this will be the reality of all in Ukraine, not just on the battlefield. As Foreign Minister Wong argued first in 2017, foreign policy must be based not just on national interests or transactional diplomacy but on the values that define the country. Freedom, democracy and justice and all, are all values that define Australia. If the government believes so, then our policy towards Ukraine should reflect such commitment. The changed geopolitical conditions and the pressure that Russia now places on the rules-based order is now undeniable. Australia must call on all 138 signatories that their responsibility to protect exists right now. 
NATO's most recent strategic concept states that the Russian Federation is the most significant and direct threat to security and to peace and stability in the Euro-Atlantic area, and that it seeks to establish spheres of influence and direct controls through coercion, subversion, aggression and annexation. While it is clear that NATO and many other global leaders understand the threat that Russia places on global peace and security, it begs the question why more is not being done to help the people of Ukraine. Europe's, and in fact global human, and global human security, is intimately linked to the survival of Ukraine. We are already experiencing higher fuel costs and their flow and inflationary effects around the globe. However, this is only the beginning. As a major exporter of critical food supplies, we will likely see an increasingly more volatile and, and unstable world as food shortages increase. One only has to look to Sri Lanka to see the effects that poor economic conditions and food shortages have on a nation's stability. If Putin's war is to continue, economic decline will spread to other and poorer and vulnerable countries, risking further unrest and violence. The world must act and act now. It is incumbent upon those who believe in the inalienable rights of mankind to stand against the injustice being perpetuated. The most immediate action required is to convince Russia to allow further grain, seed and fertiliser shipments from Ukrainian ports. There's been one this week and that's it. If the blockade cannot be kept open to food trade at a minimum, then the international community should take appropriate military action. While to many this sounds unpalatable, the cost of inaction now will result in far more disastrous consequences in the future. I make it very clear that I'm not proposing boots on the ground. However, humanitarian no-fly zones established by EU or NATO states could be a powerful response to this problem. Such zones could offer greater protection to civilians fleeing a city under siege, and such zones could also further weaken Russia's military advantage by depriving them of what is now their best negotiating tool, dead and injured Ukrainian civilians. And despite what many say, I believe this is possible. In the first instance, NATO UAVs or drones should be used to knock out air defences in command and control centres. This would provide a much safer theatre for NATO air forces to create air superiority, if not air supremacy. If enough nations contributed aircraft and hosted forward bases using traditional formations of strike fighters, air, airborne early warning and control uh, planes and refuelling tankers, enough pressure could be applied to exclude Russian Air Force from almost all Ukrainian airspace and, to, and be able to hold off Russia's S-400 long-range missiles. This would change the risk calculation for Russia and provide Ukraine with an effective, enforceable no-fly zone. This, along with continued supply of NATO weapons, munition, training and maintenance, would provide Ukraine's military with a fighting chance. It would also contain the conflict to Ukraine, reducing the risk of death and destruction in other EU and NATO nations if Putin decides to continue down this path of destruction. Now, I recognise this option is not risk-free and lives may be lost. But what is the alternative? The now depleted military, as we know it is, means a much lower risk environment than it would be if Russia captures Ukraine and all its has all its resources at its use. Europe nor the world cannot have a do-nothing policy. The costs will increasingly amass, more lives will be lost, and dictators around the globe will continue to be emboldened to act out against the rights of the most vulnerable. The risk of nuclear escal escalation is the reason given for not doing th this action. However, I contend that nothing other than the loss of Ukraine to Russia will reduce this risk. And I think we all agree that this cannot be allowed to occur. The best calculation for the EU, NATO, Ukraine and the world is to take a stand now before even, before the even more unthinkable happens. Europe and the rest of the international community simply cannot bide its time and wait to pick up the pieces down the road. Slava Ukraini.
Senator Wish Wilson. Acting Deputy President, well, today, uh, Wednesday, 3rd of August, uh, the Albanese Labor government has introduced its climate legislation, and I can understand why a number of Australians are excited and optimistic uh, that we are seeing some climate legislation in this building uh, after nine years of not just inaction but a government that has undermined climate action. But this climate bill that's being brought on today, and we're going to hear a lot more about it uh, in this place in the weeks to come, uh, has been commented on by a number of experts, and of course uh, those comments have been widely reported, uh, that it is a largely symbolic bill that uh, lacks ambition, uh, lacks substance, lacks a pathway or a mechanism to effective climate action. But at least unlike the CPRS, uh, which was introduced by the Labor Party back in 2009, uh, it doesn't take this country backwards. Um, so fair to say that it's not the main game. For those who voted for climate action from this parliament, and millions of them voted for the Greens to come into this building and to do what was necessary to take effective climate action, the main game this parliament is going to be on stopping new fossil fuel projects, stopping oil and gas projects going ahead in offshore basins, stopping new coal projects going ahead. What we know is effective and real climate action. But there are other things we need to do too. Uh, we need to throw the kitchen sink at this problem. And today I want to briefly outline a couple of policies uh, that the Australian Greens took to the federal election. We know our native forests. Uh, in fact, all our forests, all our trees are our first line of defence against climate change. Because trees sequester carbon and breathe out oxygen and we couldn't survive without them. Unfortunately, Tasmania's native forests are still under relentless assault from the loggers. And this is backed in uh, by both the State Labor Party and the State Liberal Party, and sadly, uh, unless uh, sentiment has changed, by the Federal Liberal and Labor Party too. So here was a, an original idea from the Australian Greens in the last federal election, and my colleague uh, Senator Janet Rice came down to Tasmania to announce this with me. Um, Given we know the carbon value of these forests is so significant, and they have been studied, uh, studied in detail, why not have the Commonwealth pay the state government, like the Tasmanian state government or potentially the Victorian state government, why not have the Commonwealth transfer the emissions reduction value of those carbon sequestration forests to the states? And in Tasmania, we took a policy of the federal government paying for a billion dollars worth of carbon offsets to permanently protect Tasmania's forests. Now, under the Emissions Reduction Fund, and it may of course be subject to change in this parliament, uh, native forests are exempt from payments under the ERF. Why? There's no valid reason. If we're paying for carbon offsets to farmers or to other projects, uh, other organisations or corporations, why not pay to permanently protect Tas uh, Tasmania's native forests? The money would be spent anyway, and we know these forests are significant stores of carbon that are so valuable in a time of our climate emergency. Tasmania would be a winner. We would receive the carbon value of those forests. In fact, a billion dollars is actually only a small percentage of what the carbon value of those forests truly are. But we know that from recent studies it's a fair price to pay to permanently protect those forests. That money would then be used by the state government uh, uh, and we, we proposed a uh, committee, uh, a task force set up to spend that money on a number of exciting projects that would help create employment for those in the forestry industry. Uh, who would be looking for new employment. However, saying that, of course, most, most of the, uh, the loggers in uh, Tasmania uh, are private contractors. Uh, there's been a number of payouts to contractors in the past, uh, but there would be very exciting opportunities for, for new employment, especially, especially uh, in ecosystem uh, restoration. Um, it's a win-win. 
we get to take action on climate change and real action on climate change. And uh, to give you an idea, a recent report released by Dr. Jen Sanger and other scientists uh, show that um, native forest logging is the highest emitting sector in Tasmania, emitting 4.65 million tonnes of carbon a year. That's equivalent to the emissions of 1.1 million cars and is 2.5 times the entire Tasmanian transport sector. So here we go. We have a state that's essentially 100 per cent renewable. Order. We have a state that's essentially 100 per cent renewable energy. However, it's not on a net basis because we're still logging our precious old growth forests. So Dr Sanger's report reveals that if all Tasmania's public forests were protected, an additional 75 million tonnes of carbon could be drawn down from the atmosphere by 2050. This is equivalent to 2.6 billion in carbon sequestration services. So, uh, a billion dollars transfer from the Commonwealth to the state government is a very fair price to permanently protect these forests, to take effective action on climate change, to protect biodiversity in an extinction crisis, and give Tasmania uh, and the Tasmanian state government, uh, Tasmanian communities, Tasmanian forestry workers, and a whole bunch of other people. Uh, funds that can be reinvested in the industries of the future. There is no future in native forest logging. The Western Australian government has committed to phase out native forest logging. The Victorian government has committed to phase out native forest logging. Uh, New South Wales has a way to go, and so does my home state. In this day and age of climate emergency, it's actually insanity to be cutting down these beautiful old forests uh, that are not only important for their biodiversity, important for their cultural values to First Nations, and important for their carbon sequestration, they are also effective in helping us uh, with fire management in Tasmania. That has also been proven through scientific studies. Another forest that I would like to see protected and the federal government to fund in are, of course, the most carbon-rich forests on the planet, which are our giant kelp forests which sadly 95 per cent of our forests have vanished in recent decades thanks to warming oceans and nutrient-poor East Australian current. Uh, we've seen invasive urchins uh, come down and create barrens on our reefs, eating entire habitats. That's impacted commercial fisheries. It's impacted local communities. It's in impacted Indigenous communities. Uh, why not reinvest in uh, ecosystem restoration for our giant kelp forests. There's some amazing work going on within the scientific community in Tasmania. This, by the way, has been backed in by the commercial fishing sector in Tasmania uh, and the recreational fishing groups. Both of those uh, groups, who represent tens of thousands of Tasmanians, asked the Liberal Party and the Labor Party at the last election, as they did with the Greens, to back in federal funding to have a full recovery plan funded for the critically endangered and listed under EPBC law, Tasmania's uh, forgotten giant kelp forests. We need to work hard to bring these forests back from the brink to protect uh, and regrow our ecosystems that are so important to the commercial fishing industries. And that's going to require a coordinated response to remove the invasive Centra stephanus, the long spine sea urchin. Uh, that's an unwelcome invasive pest that's come down from New South Wales. Uh, it's laid bare our reefs in southern New South Wales and Victoria, uh, as it has in Tasmania. It is one of the biggest issues the fishing industry faces in the Great Southern Reef, as well as local communities. And unfortunately, there's been no federal leadership shown on this issue in the past decade. Uh, it's been left to the states to try and raise re revenue, to tackle the spread of these urchins, to try and remove them, to try and turn it to fishery, but that has been largely unsuccessful in stopping the spread of these invasive pests. If we don't do it now, uh, we will lose our roots. Uh, the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies have released a very detailed research uh, paper on this. Uh, our reefs are at threat if we don't act. Uh, this is the cost of climate inaction, but it's not too late to do something about it. So today, uh, while we, the media is going to be focused on uh, the issue that we have with the, all issues around the release 
of uh, the government's bill and action on climate change. There's so much more that this parliament can do. Here's two good ideas that we could all get behind. Uh, you'll be hearing a lot more from me on these issues, as you'd expect, uh, but Order. I'm very proud to represent expired. a party that has Senator these policies. Hanson. The creation of a voice to parliament will not, as the Prime Minister would have us believe, be a unifying moment. I've already been contacted by elders of, on traditional lands who say they do not support the voice and had no say in the Uluru Statement. This will be no different to the stolen generation apology. Let, let me remind you of the reason for this apology. We were told it was necessary for us to move forward together as a united nation. How has that worked out? The Prime Minister's contempt for these dissenting voices, include Aboriginal's voices, is very clear. His contempt for those who rightly and justly request details of the proposed voice, such as its powers, functions and costs, has also been very clear. He is not promoting unity at all. The Prime Minister is deliberately stoking division and stoking it on racial lines. As Senator Price noted in her landmark, landmark landmark first speech in this chamber. Many Indigenous Australians have not been consulted about the voice and many have no clue what it's about. This is coming from an Aboriginal woman. The Prime Minister has dismissed her comments, saying they don't stack up. No, his comments do, do not stack up. That Prime Minister, that's because the Prime Minister is only listening to the Aboriginal industry whose gravy train relies on separating Australians by race and entrenching Indigenous disadvantage. I've been saying this for decades. There is nothing in this proposal which addresses real disadvantage. There is nothing in this proposal that will end the violence, poverty and failure of service delivery in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. There is nothing in this proposal which indicates how much this entire exercise will cost Australian taxpayers. However, I feel compelled to note the annual funding of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission in its final years was well, well north of a billion dollars. It's almost certain a referendum alone will cost in excess of $120 million. A better solution would be to hold the referendum at the next election. What's the rush? There is much in this proposal which is open-ended, ill-defined and fraught with peril. The risk is very real that the sovereignty of all Australians have over their land and country will be handed to a racial minority. Why does this have to be in the Constitution? What is the real ulterior motive? This can only be about power creating a nation within a nation. This can only be about taking power from white fellas and giving it to black fellas. This is Australia's version of apartheid. Are they prepared for the compensation or reparations which will be demanded when the High Court decides traditional ownership means sovereignty, sovereign control? Where will you stand given you acknowledge traditional ownership every day? Do you acknowledge that I, like millions of Australians, legally own my land and worked very hard for it? Do I have rights to my land too? Can't you acknowledge my connection to my land and my love for my country? I note Lydia Thorpe's racist injection in the past when she told me to go back where I came from. She can rest assured that I did indeed go back where I came from, back to Queensland, where I was born and where I raised my children, where my parents and grandparents were born. This is, where, this is nowhere else for me to go. Australia is my home. Australia is our home, Indigenous and non-Indigenous alike. The Prime Minister says the voice won't have a veto power, but he cannot speak for future governments and what legislation before Parliament must be referred to the voice for consultation. Who will be eligible to stand for election to the voice and who will be eligible to vote? We need a stronger definition of Aboriginality. From 2016 to 2021, the number of Aborig Australians identifying as Indigenous rose from by 92,000 or 26 per cent, while our overall population increase, including immigration, was only 8 per cent. This is what we call jumping on the bandwagon. There is much in this proposal that reeks of the empty gestures and symbolism which make progressives feel good about themselves but otherwise achieve nothing. It also reeks of the disgusting patronising attitudes that privileged bureaucrats and lawmakers routinely adopt towards Indigenous Australians 
proud members of a culture which has endured for tens of thousands of years. This is an attempt to rewrite the past, manipulate the present and destroy the future. Unlike both sides of the chamber, I have listened to Indigenous Australians and their elders. Stop using them as fodder for your own purposes. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Can I just remind senators to uh, address members of this chamber and other places by their full title? Uh, Senator Stewart. <laughs> Thank you, Acting Deputy President. What a delight to go on after Senator Hanson. On Thursday, the 28th of July, I had the privilege to meet with the parliamentary delegation led by the Transport Workers Union. The TWU are calling for urgent reform of our transport industry to protect wages and conditions to improve road safety and save lives. In the room, we had employers, associations, owner drivers, couriers, food delivery drivers, employee drivers and family members affected by road safety accidents. Parliamentarians heard directly about the serious impacts of the evolving Amazon effect and gig economy on eroding pay and safety across the transport sector. The delegation told us about companies at the top of the supply chain, chain squeezing transport contracts, pressuring workers to drive past legal hours, speed in order to meet deadlines, delay vehicle maintenance and ignoring fatigue management measures, all to shamefully put profits before people. Workers also told us about being exploited by unregulated gig mega companies such as Amazon, who undercut traditional transport operators from the bottom. Then we have Amazon Flex and Uber push our workers to, into precarious and insecure work with low rates of pay and no workplace rights or entitlements. And just as I indicated in my first speech, it is sadly too common for our migrant workers and communities who undertake the heaviest work for the lowest pay. They are the very people and communities who absorb the unfair brunt of these appalling practices. But along with the stories of the wage rip-offs and workplace, workplace exploitation, we heard about the devastating impact this exploitation has on real lives. The heavy vehicle and road transport sectors are Australia's deadliest industries and deadly in the worst way with an average of 180 deaths per year and many more hospitalizations associated with heavy vehicles these workplace injuries traumas and deaths have immense social and economic impacts on drivers their families businesses and the broader community however rather than take action to stop the devastation the previous government in 2016 chose to dismantle the road safety and remuneration tribunal the very measure designed to keep our roads safe and workers paid fairly. Absolutely shameful. Since this unforgivable decision by the Liberals, there have been over 1,000 associated truck crash deaths on our roads, with 250 of these deaths being truck drivers. How incredibly devastating for each family affected. But we can do better and we must do better. As identified by the Senate Committee inquiry into the viable and safe transport industry, chaired by my good friend, Senator Glenn Stirl, there is an immediate need for government intervention to change the practice and culture of an industry that literally, literally carries our entire country. An industry that carried us all through the height of the pandemic and an industry that will be key as we continue to reopen, recover and rebuild. Along with the inquiry's 10 recommendations, Federal Labor's National 2021 platform pledged to introduce a national system of safe freights to lift standards across the transport sector. This included an independent body to lift the safe standards of work, payments and conditions, elimination of economic and con contractual practices that place undue pressure on trans transport workers, fair and enforceable payments for all workers, regardless of labels, the capacity to resolve transport supply chain disputes, chain disputes, appropriate resourcing of supply chain training, auditing and education through an industry fund. And I would like to thank all of the representatives who attended Parliament to tell their personal stories, who took time off work 
unpaid to come up here and advocate for the rights of workers like them who aren't even getting the minimum wage, who can't go to work and expect to be able to come home safely like almost every other uh, worker in this country. I want to thank the TWU representatives, including Michael Kane, Mike McNess and Mem Suleiman for facilitating uh, the workers attending parliament. And I'm proud to stand in so solidarity with the Transport Workers Union Order. who are Your fighting time to— time has expired. Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. This is the first opportunity that I've had uh, to rise in this place in the new parliament to speak about uh, a very moving uh, meeting. I attended a very moving community event I attended on 25 June 2022 with members of the Queensland Sudanese diaspora, a wonderful community in my home state of Queensland, uh, which contributes so much to our state. And the purpose of the meeting was to consider human rights abuses which have been occurring in the country, the nation of Sudan, since the military coup which occurred on 25 October 2021. And I should note that there were a number of community representatives uh, from a number of different communities present at that get-together, including representatives, senior representatives of the South Sudanese community and of the broader Australian African community. On 25 October 2021, there was a military coup executed in the nation of Sudan and the declaration of a state of emergency. A report was done to the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations in relation to what has occurred on the ground between 25 October 2021 and 10 April 2022. And it is extraordinarily disturbing reading. What has occurred on the ground during that period and subsequently, and subsequently includes the excessive use of force and unlawful killings. Dozens and dozens of people have been killed, including children. There have been thousands of people injured. And deaths have occurred through the use of live ammunition against peaceful protesters, the use of tear canisters at short range, again against peaceful protesters and uh, through other uh, excessive use of force. There's also a recounting of arbitrary arrest and detention, torture and ill treatment and enforced disappearance of democratic protesters following the military coup, sexual and gender-based violence of the most egregious kind, including events which occurred on the 19th of December last year where female protesters were actually gang raped by security forces after they'd been dispersed from a peaceful protest. The shutting down of all forms of communication and freedom of expression and a range of other, of other egregious human rights violations. And the community in Brisbane got together to draw attention to these human rights atrocities. And it needs to be known, it needs to be known by those members of the military dictatorship in Sudan that the world is watching. The world is watching. And our Sudanese diaspora is our human bridge, our human bridge between Australia and Sudan. And we are watching what you are doing in Sudan. We are keenly interested. We stand shoulder to shoulder with our Sudanese brothers and sisters in terms of watching what is occurring on the ground. I would like to conclude this statement by reading a few verses from a poem written by an extraordinary young man who was part of the Sudanese diaspora, a gentleman by the name of Mr Osman Garol Nabi. And he wrote a poem called Earth in 2019 following uh, the use of excessive violence uh, against uh, Sudanese protesters. And I want to read this poem. He's doing a few verses. He's doing amazing work, work working with young people in our Queensland community. And I quote, I'm learning all the lessons I already know. I've lost a lot of brothers where so many go. The chances of us rising up were very low, but love can free the mind from this mental war. Love can free the mind from this mental war. 
You started this war but will never recede. The blood of my brothers are what I wear in my sleeves. See, I didn't come out of the dirt just to die overseas. That's why our spirits will never decease. I said I didn't come out of the dirt just to die overseas, and so our spirits will never decease. But just look how the system made us enemies. They're chaining our brothers up without a reason, and you thought that would never see freedom. Convicting our brothers of treason, how? When the earth is our land, it's because of our people you're breathing. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. One in three Australian women experience abuse in their lifetime. That's not just a statistic, it's people's lives. And when this violence intersects with our broken income support system, we see victim survivors of domestic violence be further victimised. Successive governments have designed, implemented and defended a punitive system that not only traps people in poverty, in some cases it traps them in cycles of abuse as well. Domestic violence exists in many forms and, like other forms of abuse, is predominantly about control. It is about social, verbal, emotional and financial manipulation. And it is so much harder to escape this violence and find safety and support when you are financially insecure. The Greens welcome the government's introduction of 10 days of paid leave for people affected by domestic violence. This has been Greens' policy for many years. But domestic violence leave is not enough. It doesn't address the urgent needs of people who are living on income support or who, by escaping domestic violence, will be reliant on income support. The vast majority of people on income support are living below the poverty line. and This means making difficult decisions every single day about what you can afford to buy, how many meals you're going to miss that day. Victim survivors are relentlessly re-traumatised by a system that has been shown time and time again to fail them and to keep the cycle of poverty going. In addition to the 10 days paid leave for domestic violence victim survivors, the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children was developed specifically to address family and domestic violence on all levels. But sadly, actions to enhance access to income support have been largely missing from the National Plan and its associated action plans. And we know that First Nations women, women from culturally diverse backgrounds, women in regional areas, older women, LGBTIQA plus women, and women with disabilities are even more likely to experience violence. We need a plan that protects all Australians, not just the ones that are fortunate enough to be employed. So, Despite Labor's commitment to supporting domestic abuse survivors through this plan, there has been next to no consideration for survivors on income support. I mean, we've heard from the government that job seeker payments are going to stay at $46 a day. And this is why Labor has supported the Stage 3 tax cuts, which will see the highest paid workers in Australia receive an effective pay increase. I, mean, I find the plight of the one million single parent families in Australia particularly distressing. Analysts undertaken by Anti-Poverty Week found that there are 300,000 single parent families in Australia headed by women caring for around 600,000 children who are living near or below the poverty line. What are the options here if they are facing domestic or family violence? And we've also heard harrowing reports that the income support system has been exploited by perpetrators. The Guardian reported last week about a domestic violence victim survivor and mother of three who was left without vital Centrelink payments for six weeks after the perpetrator exploited social security rules and the fraud tip-off line. And she was denied family payments for six weeks after a false tip-off. In a cost of living crisis, no one should be forced to navigate through such uncaring bureaucracy and left to struggle to survive. Neither of the major parties seem to have a plan to ta tackle domestic violence or the poverty crisis in this country. The Greens have committed to a $12 billion, 12-year national plan to end violence against women and children that will comprehensively address issues relating to prevention and early intervention in gendered violence, appropriate response and support and recovery services for victim survivors. 
So we're fighting for all government income support payments to be raised above the poverty line, for mutual obligations to be abolished and unfair restrictions on who can access the payment removed to ensure that everyone has got the means to cover their basic essential needs. Our social safety net is broken. It is failing to not only support people escaping family violence, but to protect them from facing further harm. So the government must immediately fix our social security system and raise the rate of all income support to above the poverty line. Poverty is a political choice. Enough is enough. We have all clearly and consistently received feedback from victim survivors who have been forced to navigate a brutal system, with many being re-traumatised in the process. Now is the time to listen to what they Order. have to say. Your time has expired. Senator Babbitt. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I note this is not my first speech. I rise here today to speak of the disastrous economic situation we now found ourselves in due to high levels of government debt, which is approximately $963 billion, an absolutely massive amount of money. But how much is a billion dollars? Well, it's $1,000 million. These numbers are almost incomprehensible—$963 billion. Now, unfortunately, both of the major parties have had a hand to play in racking up this debt and will continue to have a hand in racking up the debt, and it is something that must be dealt with and not just swept under the rug. Now, neither side of politics has, dis has discussed a clear plan on how we can pay back this debt, and we cannot keep ignoring the issue. Now, paying back the national debt was a core part of the United Australia Party policies which we took to the election. Now, the increasing interest rates and the inflation that we are now seeing at the moment are a result of the high levels of debt. There is a clear relationship between high levels of public debt and higher interest rates. There was a publication from the European Central Bank which studied the relationship between long-term public debt and increasing interest rates of the economies of Germany, Italy and the USA. Now, this publication set out the relationship between high debt and interest rates in those countries over a 10-year period. It essentially concluded that high levels of debt have little impact on short-term interest rates, but in the years to follow, they start to increase and at a rapid rate. Now, most economists here in Australia agree that interest rates will continue to rise. Now, millions of Australian families are already experiencing mortgage stress, and this is only set to increase. ANZ and Westpac are predicting that the RBA crash rate will be 3.35 per cent by the end of this year or very early next year. Now, prices for fuel, energy and other basic essentials are increasing, severely impacting Australian families, Australian businesses and will go on to destroy the independence and freedom of our nation. We cannot ignore the national debt and if we do not act and we, if, if we allow it to continue to grow unabated, it will cause Australian families to default on their mortgages and lose their homes as interest rates obviously continue to rise. It will also remove the underlying security for many of our small businesses. We must act now to save our homes, to save our country's economy and to protect our freedom and our independence. We need a solution. Sweeping it under the rug, expanding the debt, it will only make it worse. We are simply kicking the problem down the road for future generations that will have to deal with it. The RBA cash rate is currently sitting at 1.85 per cent, up from 0.1 per cent only four months ago. That means that compared to four months ago, the average $700,000 mortgage will cost around $550 more per month. Many families cannot afford this rise. Current inflation is 6.1 per cent, with real wages growing at only 2.4 per cent over the past 12 months. Essentially, that means that the purchasing power of your money has reduced by 6.1 per cent and your wages have not kept up. The government has now confirmed that inflation is set to hit 7.75 per cent by the end of this year, making things even worse. Now, the UAP took a plan to the election to help pay down our national debt. We suggested introducing a 15 per cent export licence for all iron ore exports from Australia and pledging the proceeds from such a licence to repay our near trillion dollar debt. Our modelling showed that this export licence and its proceeds Will help, would help reduce the debt level and, in the process, save Australia from high interest rates. Now, Australia, we supply over 80 per cent of all iron ore export to the Asian manufacturing markets. Tens of trillions of dollars are invested there in manufacturing in China, Japan, Korea and the rest of Asia. Asia achieves its strong position in world trade 
by using Australian iron ore. Asian economies have no alternative but to purchase our iron ore. Now we must leverage this position to the maximum benefit of all Australians. In effect, we can have the buyers of our iron ore pay off our debt, thereby taking the burden off the Australian taxpayer. Now the United Australia Party has a clear policy to deal with this debt. It is designed to save all Australians' homes, designed to increase our living standards and our wages, and the best part is that the buyers of our iron ore will pay for it. Thank you. Thank you. The time approaching 1.30, we shall now move to two-minute statements, and I call Senator Rustin. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, well, today, um, as we stand here, day five of the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham is coming to a close, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to recognise all of our amazing athletes that are in, uh, competing in Birmingham. 430 Australians are over there, and uh, that includes 76 of our incredible and inspiring para-athletes. Um, so far, we have 106 medals, uh, and 42 of those medals are gold. Uh, so that makes us number one in Birmingham at the moment. But sport is so important to the Australian lifestyle. It is absolutely a quintessential part of the way of life in this country. And so it has been absolutely amazing and inspiring to watch these, these incredible athletes perform on the international stage because they demonstrate the importance and the benefits of an active and healthy lifestyle and the physical and mental benefits of sport and good health, as well as the great community spirit and wellbeing it generates back here in Australia. We are a proud sporting nation. And it's been great to see so many Australians getting behind our athletes over there in Birmingham as we cheer them on to ever-increasing levels and numbers of success. So congratulations on behalf of Australia to every single athlete that was selected to go to Birmingham. Super congratulations to those that have won medals, uh, particularly to, to Emma McCann. What an amazing Australian athlete. Um, she is now the most successful Commonwealth Games athlete in history, um, having broken uh, so many records um, there. We also, um, from my home state in South Australia, congratulations to, to Jessica Stenson, uh, who we all remember as Jess Trengove, who, uh, who won a gold medal in the women's marathon. Um, big shout out to the, both the, uh, the men's and the women's three by three chair basketball teams, exceptional efforts, taking home a gold and a silver. Uh, and over the next uh, few days, we encourage all Australians to support our great Aussie athletes. Uh, Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I visited Ballina and Lismore at the weekend in my capacity as a special envoy for disaster recovery. I met with mayors and general managers, uh, some from the local, many local councils from the Northern Rivers, plus unions and uh, businesses, and local the local community, and had conversations with the representatives and uh, First Nations people from the Bundalug, uh, Bundalung. Uh, nation. I also heard about people who have been ripped off by Origin Energy. Origin, a company that made a profit of $318 million last year, has been charging Lismore residents for power they didn't even use. Not only did they not use that power, in some cases their homes were actually uninhabitable and have been uninhabitable for months. One resident, Ella, was given a quarterly power bill of $460, which included charges for, what? for water usage. Ella actually saw her hot water system float away during the floods and was still charged for hot water usage. When Ella tried to rectify the issue, and I quote, she said, it's the chaos of it. It's been going on for months. They ring me, put me on hold, I don't have time for this. It goes on and on. Another Lismore woman received a bill from Origin of $336 for a house that doesn't even have walls. And she said, I quote, I haven't had the energy to fight. It's a full-time job between chasing down insurance and calling services. This sort of corporate predatory behaviour after disasters makes me sick to my stomach. I call on Origin to make the right, to make sure this never happens again and those that haven't made claims are rectified. Senator Wish Wilson. Australia is the last country left in the world 
that still uses lethal shark nets and drum lines to kill sharks, and they are weapons of mass destruction for protected marine life. I hope that in this term of government, when we review the EPBC Act, which provides exemptions for the New South Wales and Queensland state governments to kill protected marine life indiscriminately, that this issue is solved by a change of our environmental problems. I also wanted to raise that the Senate inquiry into shark mitigation, uh, which took extensive evidence all around the country that shark nets do not make beaches safe, uh, they are killing our protected and endangered marine life, and they have better solutions for protecting human, human beings and ocean goers. This Senate inquiry is the only inquiry in the last government that has never been responded to. So I look forward to working with this Labor government to get a response from the Federal Environment Department and actually lay out what the federal government can do to show leadership on protecting our marine life and also striking the right balance between protecting surfers and other ocean goers off our coastlines. Uh, I would also like today uh, to shout out to the over a thousand parliamentarians around the world now who have started to take action to free Walkley Award-winning journalist Julian Assange. It is a national disgrace and shame that this parliament and this last government has done nothing to intervene actively to free Julian Assange and bring him back to Australia. But let me tell you, there is momentum building all around the world now. This issue is only going to get bigger. And the Albanese government have made the right noises, but now is the time to explain to the Australian people about what you're doing and step up and make sure this Australian hero is freed from a UK hellhole. Senator Wilson, your time has expired. Senator Smith. Thank you very much. There are two immediate challenges facing our country. No matter where you live, whether it be in our cities, in our suburbs, in our regional towns or our rural and remote communities, Australians are facing the very, very real challenge of meeting cost of living preferences. Pressures. Food and beverage is up 2 per cent. Clothing and footwear is up 3.5 per cent. Fuel is up 4.2 per cent and housing is up 2.5 per cent. And yet there is no relief in sight. The second challenge is being experienced everywhere again across our country. On our farms, in our cafes and restaurants, in the garage and service stations and on the building sites everywhere. Australian business is being crippled by a lack of workers. The labour shortages are strangling the enterprising spirit of small and medium-sized businesses everywhere across our continent. Just today, the WA Chamber of Commerce and Industry released its Regional Pulse report, which said over 80 per cent of WA's regional businesses cited workforce issues as a significant challenge. The combination of inflationary pressures and severe labour shortages is real and it's immediate. At a time when there are almost 500,000 job vacancies across Australia and more than 62,000 of them in Western Australia, the Albanese government should be looking to implement urgent reforms to enable pensioners and veterans to work if they want to. Let people work more if they want to, Mr Albanese. Australians have waited too long for a plan from Labor. So who does have a plan? I'm proud to say it's the coalition. Today, I'll introduce a private senator's bill that will remove some of the disincentives that make it harder for older Australians and veterans who want to improve their living standards by working or increasing their hours of work. This initiative will have the added benefit of making it easier for small businesses across Australia to meet the challenges of worker shortages in their communities. This is an important reform. Thank you, senator. Senator Stirl. I'm acting Deputy President. And, uh, Look, I think it's timely. We know the shortages of staff and labour and all that. But I've got to bring this to the attention of the Senate. And this dropped in my lap a couple of days ago, and it's an article from the Big Rigs uh, magazine. And it's headed, ATO received 727 tip-offs about dodgy road freight operators. Isn't this amazing? We've got driver shortages. We are about 22,000 uh, drivers short in uh, seat.com only a, a month ago. That's before we start talking about forkies, receival staff, loaders, that we fought before we start talking about diesel mechanics, tyre fitters, spray painters, auto electricians. And yet, what the ATO can tell us, 727 dodgy operators. Well, I've got to tell you, ATO, good on you for, for, for letting us know that, because someone's dobbed someone in. 
I'll give you another 300,000. Piece of cake. And if anyone doubts me, come and join me. Just walk the line at Coles or Woolworths or Aldi or, or Costco. Walk the line with me and ask all these truck drivers who are paid on kilometre rates as they run interstate. Kilometre rates are supposed to be so fan damn-tastic while they sit at the DCs three, four, five hours, no pay. Then you know what they do? They don't log the hours they're sitting there. No, 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 you can't do that. Not because it's bad enough not being paid. They can't log their hours because then they can't get back to Melbourne or Sydney or Adelaide or halfway back. This is well known. It came up in my Senate inquiry. I didn't make this up. Drivers told me. So I know there are some very decent employers out there who pay kilometre rates. I know there are some very decent employers who look after their staff and they go on hourly. Sadly, they're in the minority. So I'd say to the Australian Truck and Lawyers, uh, uh, sorry, the ATO, if you've got a spare day or two, come and walk the line with me and I'll throw that, comment, that challenge out or that offer out to any other senator or one from the other side. This is national wage theft and it's right, and Labor will fix this with an independent body Thank with enforcement. Senator. senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Our Australian forestry industry is one of Australia's largest manufacturers, employing around 80,000 hard-working people across the value chain and contributing more than $24 billion of economic turnover to our economy every year. A further 100,000 people are in jobs supported through flow-on economic activity. Yet now the people's wealth is under threat. Green ideology working for globalist predators seeking to control people threatens all this wealth going into the pockets of everyday Australians and regional communities. Timber, look around, is a natural material with great warmth and versatility. In this beautiful building, Australia's seat of government, native hardwoods are used throughout the building, chosen for colour and durability. The Sydney Opera House rely, uses timber in the public areas for the same reason. The use of timbers from all over Australia expresses our national identity. That's probably why the globalist Greens are trying to destroy the Australian timber industry. Under globalist policies, there is no national identity only unrelenting oppression of individual sovereignty and slavish adherence to a woke agenda that borders on evil. Regional forestry agreements preserve the important principle of competitive federalism and states' rights. Regional forestry agreements protect our timber industry, and One Nation will defend the right of states to defend their timber industry. One Nation strongly supports the Australian plantation industry and the workers, communities, regions, states and nations that it supports. Timber is the original renewable building product. We will hear about a circular economy in this parliament where the elites that own and use the green movement get to buy expensive new things while everyday Australians are left with second-hand and recycled goods to rent, supposedly in the name of sustainability. Like hell, we are one community, we are one nation, and plantation timber is an amazing, beautiful, durable building product that should be available to everyone. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy Chair. Uh, now, I just want to address the issue again of the uh, Auditor General's Leopardkin Triangle uh, report uh, that came out two years ago. And one of the criticisms, of course, was the fact that there was a lack of documentation on behalf of the department in regards to the purchase of the land. Now, I, I spoke about this yesterday, and I uh, pointed out that the land, the market value, was paid for the land in accordance with valuation standards and accounting standards. However, I thought to myself, well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So I asked the Auditor General if he could provide minutes of meetings held with staff and his office involving the audit of Leppington Triangle. Well, well, well. And guess what the reply was? The ANAO does not release specific items of audit evidence that were not included in an audit report as the public interest benefit in the ANO, ANAO providing the audit evidence is outweighed by the potential for public interest harm to the operation of the legislative framework for dealing with sensitive information in the Auditor General Act. Well, that's interesting because, first of all, I didn't ask for specific audit evidence. All I asked for was the meetings of minutes. Uh, now, if the Auditor General wants to criticise the previous government for not disclosing and, and apparently having uh, minutes of every meeting that they hold every you know, five minutes of the day and criticise people for having meetings in coffee shops, I mean, if we're all going to be locked up for having meetings in coffee, uh, you know, get in trouble for having meetings in coffee shops. I think we'd all, all be in jail pretty quickly. I don't know about you, but I like to have my meetings in coffee shops. I'll have a coffee in the morning. But the point is this: is that I want to know why the Auditor General isn't disclosing the minutes of the meetings that he had with his staff, and what is it that he is hiding? 
Now, it should be disclosed that the Auditor General was a former Labor staffer, and it is very important that the Auditor General remains impartial. And I fear that the fact that this was nothing but a stitch job, and it calls in uh, to doubt his credibility uh, and whether or not he can continue in this role. Thank you. Senator Payman. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Before I start, please note this is not my first speech. I rise to ex express my support for the Uluru Statement of the, from the Heart to express my support for voice, for treaty and for truth. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri elders and knowledge holders who have paved the way for those here now, for those proudly following in their footsteps and for those yet to come as custodians and owners of country. I also acknowledge that my home and electorate office in Western Australia are on Wajak Noongar Buja and pay my respects to their elders as well. I recognise their resilience and strength and appreciate their knowledge sharing and stories that influence the lives of new Australians like me. The Uluru Statement from the Heart calls on all of us here elected to this parliament to rise to the moment, to accept the hand stretched out to us by the First Nations people. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese's history-making speech on Saturday has given us a path to approaching this work with humility and hope. Like our Prime Minister, I believe there is room in the hearts of Australians for the statement from the heart. The question to support the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice is simple. Let's engage in good faith. Let's live to the Australian values of decency and fairness. A constitutionally enshrined voice to the parliament is significant and practical reform to get long overdue outcomes for First Nations people. This government is looking to bring people together, not to divide them. A First Nations voice on First Nations matters. It's not that difficult. It's not too much to ask for. It's the least we can do. This work will help to close the gap and make our nation stronger. It's time to get this done together. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. There's rightly a lot of talk about workforce shortages. For example, it's estimated that the aged care sector is now facing an annual shortage of 35,000 workers just to meet the basic care needs of older people. Yet we have a potential workforce right here in Australia, people who want to work but are denied the ability to work. These are people seeking asylum who are waiting for an outcome of their application process. The Asylum Seeker Resource Centre estimates that 10 to 20,000 of the over 60,000 people right now here in Australia seeking asylum lack work rights. These people are ready to work but are denied the ability to work and begin to rebuild their lives because of successive government's punitive regimes. I've heard from one young woman who is seeking protection in Australia on gender and sexuality grounds. She has an MBA from an Australian university, and prior to her application for protection, she worked here. Yet once she applied for protection, she was denied her right to work and has had to rely on social service organisations to survive. This woman is desperate to work and to return to financial independence, yet she and many other people waiting for, for their application for asylum to be processed are being denied these rights. In July this year, the National Skills Commission revealed that occupations such as carers, health workers and automotive trade workers, among others, are in urgent need of workers. And the ARCC has reported that nearly half the people in their employment program have worked in these industries. So let's help fix the skills and workforce shortage by providing people seeking asylum the right to work. It will cost the government nothing and, more significantly, is critical to people's human dignity and their social and economic inclusion. Are there any senators seeking the call? Senator Babbitt. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I know this is not my first speech. Now, I rise here today to speak of a negative environmental consequences of moving towards so-called green energy, mm -hmm. namely solar panels and batteries. Now, many have been sold a narrative that these technologies are somehow better for the environment. Now, this could not be further from the truth. Solar panels have a typical 
performance warranty life of approximately 25 years, after which these panels will surely end up in landfills where they could potentially contaminate groundwater with toxic heavy metals like lead and cadmium. Now, although around 80 per cent of the solar panels are technically recyclable, it is not economically viable to do so, and the widespread use of solar panels is setting us up for a future environmental catastrophe. Mm. Batteries have a short service life and are extremely resource intensive to manufacture. Manufacturing a battery for an electric car requires digging up hundreds of tonnes of earth, processing it to have a disastrous effect to our natural world. Now, to meet demand of the rare earth minerals using batteries and solar panels, we will need to massively ramp up mining operations all around the world. One rich source of these rare earth minerals is pristine and undisturbed habitat, such as the seabed of the Indo-Pacific. Now, the International Seabed Authority believes that China is set to become the first nation to begin exploitation of the seabed. China currently manufactures 80 per cent of all solar panels produced globally and dominates in battery production. We all want to protect our environment, but current green technology is doing the environment more harm than good, and their manufacture requires us to harvest more from the natural world, not less, not to mention all the fossil fuels used in their manufacture. We are in effect transitioning from digging up fossil fuels to digging up rare earth metals. None of this solves any of the issues that we are facing, while at the same time placing us at the mercy of the CCP. We need genuine, well-balanced solutions. Thank you, Senator. To Your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. Uh, and I just commend Senator Babbage on his uh, contribution just then in acknowledgement for the, uh, what is actually involved when it comes to renewables and solar panel production going into landfill and a complete lack of understanding about what is actually being done when it comes to these renewables. But it's not only just using these renewables, it's the fact we need to build new connectors into the grid because those opposites don't seem to understand what the national electricity grid is and the fact that renewables are unable to be connected at this stage and will require new connectors to be built. And this is why I particularly welcome the Leader of the Opposition's announcement yesterday that it is time that we have a grown-up conversation in this country about nuclear. That we have put everyone over there on the opposite side in the government now and at the end of the, of the chamber put their big boy pants on and start to have a conversation about nuclear energy. How the fact we've had a nuclear industry for 60 years in this country—60 years anstow has been running at Lucas Heights. Yet we will not look at nuclear energy, which is able to provide baseload, affordable, reliable power. And because those of us opposite, those of us, those of us sitting here in opposition now, we actually understand. We're not talking about Chernobyl big reactors like those scaremongers over there. We're looking at small modular, like they use in France, the only country in Europe actually weathering the Ukraine war storm when it comes to energy, because 70 per cent of their power is derived from nuclear. But of course those opposite don't have the intellectual depth or courage to have this conversation, while those at the end of the chamber are more about ideological than they are about reducing emissions. It's all about politics, not about producing results. Let's have a big conversation about this. You guys don't even want to talk about it because you're so Senator. frightened. It's about time we put the Australian people first and provided affordable, reliable baseload power. Senator McCarthy. Madam Acting Deputy President, thank you. I take this opportunity in the few minutes I have uh, to, to thank our health workers and clinicians across the country who still keep us focused on the fact that we are still in a pandemic. In particular, I, I want to uh, reach out to our Aboriginal community health sector who are still sending the message across our remote and regional areas of the country in all sorts of languages of First Nations people to still reiterate the importance of staying safe, being safe and making sure that uh, they are still listening to the requirements uh, in order to keep safe. Today, the Albanese government accepted a recommendation from the Australian Technical Advisory Group, ATAGI, uh, to make a Moderna COVID-19 vaccine available to children aged six months to under five years in certain at-risk population groups. And the primary goal of the Australian COVID-19 vaccine program is to minimise the risk of severe disease, including hospitalisation and death from COVID-19. 
We are some years now into this pandemic, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, and one of the things I've certainly heard uh, constantly said uh, from health clinicians is the sense of weariness, tiredness, exhaustion. Uh, we still need to keep going, and that's why it's uh, important that here in the Senate and in the House we continue to acknowledge uh, the ongoing work uh, of those clinicians who are still trying to keep uh, Australians safe. Around 70,000 young children at high risk of developing severe illness from COVID-19 will be able to receive a vaccination from 5 September this year. The Albanese government has secured 500,000 doses of the specific vaccine for this age group, and initial supplies will be arriving in Australia later this week. Senator Cadell. Acting Deputy President, I note that this is not my first speech. The Hunter region of New South Wales is known for many things. It's wine and agriculture, it's coal and energy generation, it's beaches and it's lifestyle. But what truly sets us apart is the people, their passion in work and play. In that, I quickly rise to acknowledge the people from the Hunter taking part in the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. At 17, Jesse Southwell of New Lambton is one of the youngest members of the entire team and will be bringing home gold to the Hunter after winning in the Australian Women's Seven rugby team. She's also a mighty Newcastle Knight. Rose Davies from Newcastle has been running from the age of 12, and boy is she tight now, but she will be competing in the women's 5,000 and 10,000 metres. As someone whose fitness has struggled to drive that far without being a little bit tired, I am envious of her. Sam Fricker is 20 years old and one of Australia's most exciting divers. After his Olympic debut in uh, Tokyo, the men's 10 metre platform, he's one to watch out for in these games, including his signature dive and inward three and a half somersault. Maitland girl Natasha Van Eldick has represented Australia in lawn bowls from a club in Raymond Terrace. Also a shout out to Maitland swimmer Jenna Jones, who completed in the S1350 metre freestyle, and Meriwether uh, wheelchair athlete Christy Dawes, a seven-time Paralympian who finished fourth in the women's T53 and 54 marathon. These people from the Hunter are doing their very best, playing with passion and doing everything we can to represent Australia. I hope to do the same thing here, and with Australia clocking 106 medals, including 42 gold after day six, I'm excited to see more competition and success. Thank you. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting mm. Deputy President. Well, a defining moment for the Great Barrier Reef occurred almost a century ago. In 1975, the Gough Whitlam Labor government made the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park uh, a, a, an act and was established to protect the Great Barrier Reef for many years to come. This legislation gave it special protection against oil and gas drilling and the biggest threat to its survival at the time. And I stand here today on another day, another defining moment for our Great Barrier Reef. This week, historic legislation reaches this place to enshrine 43 per cent emissions target in legislation, a week which we can finally see serious climate action getting underway. Almost like half a century ago, Labor is again on the right side of history when it comes to protecting the Great Barrier Reef from climate change. Today, the Great Barrier Reef's biggest threat is climate change, and it will take a Labor government to fight for its future of this magnificent natural asset. Unfortunately, precious time has been wasted fighting the climate wars of the last decade, and it has cost us dearly. No one from this side will ever forget or forgive the former government for putting the reef and the jobs that rely on the Great Barrier Reef at risk at every step of the way. No one will forget that they vetoed renewable energy projects because it was against their energy policy, projects that would have created jobs. No one will forget that they actively repealed uh, actively supported repealing water quality legislation. They refused to commit to an emissions reduction target and again today refused to commit to the legislation to reduce these emissions and they hid power price increases until after the election. The Labor government's Powering Australia plan will reduce emissions, reduce power prices, create jobs in renewable energy and it will protect the reef and protect our future for many generations to come. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Askew. Thank you, President. Earlier this week I spoke about the retirement of the Flinders Council Mayor, and today I would like to acknowledge the Mayor of another idyllic Tasmanian island, the King Island Council, Mrs Julie Arnold. Mrs Arnold recently announced that she would not recontest her position as Mayor and Councillor at the October Council elections. 
Julie and her husband Charles have sold their property on the island and plan to build a new home on, on King Island in the near future. But first, they will spend an extended period travelling Australia and researching alternative construction options like pods or containers for their new home. Elected to King Island Council in 2018, Mrs Arnold was initially appointed as Deputy Mayor. She took on the role of mayor in 2019 after being elected unopposed and was the first woman to serve as King Island's mayor. Mrs Arnold's term as mayor was punctuated by COVID-19 and the impact of this pandemic on the small island community, but she is confident she leaves council with processes in place for King Island to successfully live with the virus. The aspect Mrs Arnold considers her main achievements is restructuring the committee work of councillors to match their individ individual strengths. This work was matched to the key issues councillors champion, like shipping, youth, sport or tourism, and she hopes the framework will continue in successive councils. I met with Mrs Arnold in May and she spoke about her desire to see a shipping solution developed for King Island's future, which includes a wharf for roll-on, roll-off ships, a direct route to Victoria and a plan for small cruise ships that extend beyond day trips. She's also hopeful of positive results from the reopening of the King Island Shelight Tungsten Mine and Council's $830,000 telecommunications investment to improve connection on the island. Enjoy your well-deserved break and travel, Julie. We look forward to welcoming you back to Tasmania to build your new King Island home soon. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Askew. Uh, now being 2 p.m., we'll move to uh, questions, and I call Senator Askew. I see. Yeah. Yeah. My question is to the minister representing the treasurer, Senator Gallagher. How much extra will an average mortgage holder be paying in monthly repayments as a result of the recent interest rate increases? Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, President. And, uh, we went to this. Uh, yesterday, I think, in question time, but I'm happy uh, to repeat it. Essentially, depending on the loan, uh, the size of the loan, uh, people will be paying a couple of hundred extra dollars um, a month in payments. Well, I can go exactly to it if you want to break it down. Um, and Of course, these increases that they'll be paying are on top of the increases that have occurred over recent months when the uh, RBA started increasing uh, interest rates on the 1st of May. Um, if you'd like it by state or by size of mortgage, I can give it to you. Um, but essentially the cumulative increase in monthly repayments uh, for uh, average mortgage holder in New South Wales um, is, uh, I think, about $330 extra uh, per month. Um, but we can, there is significant impact on households, no doubt. Um, and we know this stings households, absolutely. But we are living in a high inflationary environment, and the RBA is increasing interest rates. They are increasing interest rates to deal with higher inflationary costs across the economy. And these, the factors that led to this have occurred prior to the last election. Correct. Prior to the last election, the factors that are leading to this, we inherited an economy with an inflation issue and rising interest rates. Right. And these are hitting mortgage holders, without a doubt. And that's why our economic plan is more important than ever to invest in the productive side of the economy to put downward pressure on cost of living impacts for Thank households. You, Minister. Uh, Senator Askew, first supplementary. Minister, on top of the cost of interest rate increases, how much extra will it cost a family to fill a 60-litre tank of petrol once the government ends the reduction in fuel excise? Minister. So, order. Order. Order, Senator Wong. Senator Searle. Senator Searle and Senator Wong. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. And uh, talk about leading with your chin again. This is a policy that the former government put in place to expire. Um, the former Treasurer, saying it was targeted and temporary, and made it very clear 
uh, because of the significant cost to a budget that is already heaving, heaving Minister, with a trillion dollars in Liberal debt. Senator Askew. On relevance, it was actually a question about a dollar figure. It wasn't asking about consideration of previous policies. Uh, thank you, um, Senator Askew. The um, minister is being relevant to the question, but I'll continue to listen and uh, ensure that relevance continues. Minister. Thank you. Uh, and the former government, at the time when they designed the policy to be a six-month exemption, noted the significant cost to the budget, $3 billion over a six-month period. Uh, which um, I've heard Senator Hume talking about the need to be fiscally responsible, while it, on the other side, and depending on who you're talking to in the coalition, it's all about uh, you know, spending more and adding more to the budget problems that we have inherited. Um, the petrol excise uh, changes were for six months. The budget cannot afford, cannot afford to continue uh, these concessions at a time when Thank we are Minister, dealing with the increasing cost of Senator Askew, second supplementary. Uh, Senator Stirl. Senator Stirl. Senator Askew. Thank you. The Albanese government was elected on grand promises to fix the cost of living. What precisely is the government's plan to help senior Australians, young Australians, and Australian families, including the majority who do not have children in childcare? With the cost of living. What's the plan? Thank you, Senator Askew. Our Minister. Thank you, and I welcome the opportunity to talk about Labor's economic plan. Our plan is our plan is a comprehensive plan, a comprehensive plan that does include cheaper childcare for 1.2 million families. In your seat. Order, order. Our Minister Wong, Minister Wong. I'm waiting for quiet from both sides of the chamber. Minister, please resume. Thank you, uh, President. Labor's economic plan is about making sensible investments into the productive capacity of the economy, including cheaper childcare for 1.2 million, fa um, million families. It is important. Talk to anyone with children. That is a huge impact on your household budget. So that is what we are doing. Minister, Cheaper medicines. Your seat. Uh, Senator Watt. Senator Watt. That's disorderly to make uh, comments across the chamber. Order on my left. Senator Henderson. Minister. Thank you. For, for those families without children, but this helps with, for families with children as well. Uh, cheaper medicines for uh, skills and training, helping those with children and those without children, free TAFE and more uni places, investing in cleaner and cheaper energy, again, helping all households across Australia. This is the core parts of Labor's economic plan and we'll be Senator implementing Cruz. it as quickly Thank as we you, can. Minister. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Sheldon. Uh, good. Thank you, uh, President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Can the minister outline steps the government is taking to assure Australia's security? Minister. Thank you. Uh, I, I thank the minister. <laughs> I thank the senator for his question uh, and for his interest in um, international relations and foreign affairs and security. Uh, and today, the prime minister uh, and the defence minister announced details of the defence strategic review. Uh, in 2020, the Defence Strategic Update identified that changes in Australia's strategic environment were accelerating far more rapidly than was predicted in the 2012 Force Posture Review. So, To meet these challenges, the Defence Strategic Review, which was announced today, will examine force structure, force posture and preparedness. Uh, it will also inv examine investment prioritisation. Uh, and the objective, which I would hope is shared across the chamber, is to ensure that the Defence Force, Australian Defence Force, has the right capabilities to meet the growing strategic needs Australia faces. The government has appointed two eminent leads to conduct the review, the former Minister for Defence and for Foreign Affairs, Professor the Honourable Stephen Smith, and the former CDF, uh, Air Chief Marshal Sir Angus Houston, retired. This work will help ensure that the ADF is well positioned to meet the security challenges we face over the next decade and beyond. 
Uh, you see, the Albanese government understands well that Australia's security in a more complex and contested world means we have to use all elements of state power and we have to ensure all elements of state power are fit for purpose, that is strategic, economic, social and diplomatic. And the purpose, of course, is always the advancement of Australian interest and Australian values. Unfortunately, we do know uh, there was a great deal of damage done to Australia's international relationships by the previous government. But we have made a strong start. Where we have made a strong start. Order. We Order. have made a. We have made Order. a strong start since the change Minister, of government. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. Good. Uh, Thank you, Minister, for a comprehensive answer. Can the Minister outline the government's engagement with regional partners, including ASEAN? Minister. Thank you. Uh, and I again thank the Senator for a very important question. And of course, Southeast Asia uh, and the uh, focus on Southeast Asia is just so important for Australia's security. Uh, and something that we on this side of the chamber have always understood, we have always understood, and which is why if you look at the history of government in this country, it is Labor government which have brought such a strong focus to Southeast Asia. We recognise on this side of the chamber that our future is tied to the future of the region we share. So deepening our partnership with ASEAN is one of my top, top priorities as Foreign Minister. Australia's interests lie in shaping a strategic equilibrium in the region where countries are not forced to choose but can make their own sovereign choices, and ASEAN is central to that. Uh, I am today departing uh, for Phnom Penh for um, ASEAN meetings. Uh, it a junket. Well, I'll take that interjection. It shows the disrespect for ASEAN and the importance of security in our region from the other side. And I suggest you should speak to Senator Birmingham about yeah. that interjection. Uh, order. Uh, your time has expired, Minister. Um, Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Uh, how is the government working to shape a region that are peaceful and, is peaceful and predictable and where disputes are not simply guided by power and size? Minister. Thank you um, uh, to the senator for the supplementary. And he, he phrases the question in a way that is really important. Um, others have described it differently. Uh, we want a region that is non-hegemonic. We want a region where sovereignty is protected. Uh, but it is in Australia's interest, and this I do think is a bipartisan objective, even if how we get there we may differ on. We want a region where disputes are not simply guided by power and size. Uh, and central to that is working with the countries of our region, including ASEAN, uh, as well as the Pacific, uh, ensuring we have relationships that are deep and trusting. Uh, and relationships where we uh, are able to be a partner of choice. Uh, partnerships matter because it's how we build the kind of region we want. It's how we build the kind of region uh, that serves, uh, that, that is in accordance with the interests of the Australian people and the interests of the nation. A region at peace, not in conflict, which is why we will continue to work with partners to promote peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. Thank you, Minister. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Will the level of government spending in the Albanese government's first budget be higher or lower than was projected in the pre-election fiscal outlook? Minister. You'll have to wait and see. Order. Order. <laughs> Thank you. Order. Thank you. I'm going to wait for quiet on both sides. Order. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. Um, the short answer to the question from Senator Smith, and I thank him for the question, is you'll have to wait and see. That's what happens when you're in opposition. Um, the budget will be published. The budget will be published and you will be able to see. Well, well, um, I think anybody who followed Labor's very comprehensive um, fiscal uh, plan, and Hughes. Labor's plan for a better budget, better future, better budget, better future. Minister, please resume your seat. Order, order. I'm aware that you're standing, Senator Smith. I'm waiting for quiet, Senator Smith. Point of order, Madam President. Standing order 211. I'm just wondering whether Senator Gallagher could let us know how many pages are in the plan. 
I think How many might, page? that might be a supplementary <laughs> question you may wish to pursue. Uh, Senator Smith, Minister, please continue. Thank you. Senator Smith, that was tried in the campaign and it didn't go very far, I must say. It's, uh, it's more about the content, I think, um, than the number of pages. And this is a very successful plan that we outlined. Very successful, Order. as evidenced Order. by this. Um, that's how successful this plan was. Uh, the budget will be released um, in the normal way uh, with the papers that accompany it. And I would say, in, in respect to, um, because I do respect Senator Smith, um, we are going through a process which we have been quite clear about of looking at previous um, budget measures from the March budget about which ones of those should go ahead, which ones um, might not need to go ahead. We're looking at savings where, uh, where they can be sensibly found. We're implementing our savings on um, consultants and contractors, the audit of waste and rorts indeed. Uh, that we are looking at, uh, and we're going through it program by program with a big red pen. Um, and we are looking. Well, we are going to be fiscally responsible. We are not going to be the vandals that you were, where you would just get huge lump billions of dollars and go. You know what? Order. Barnaby Joyce wants some money somewhere, so Order. here we go. We'll chuck it over there. We'll chuck it over here. We're building better regions funds. Oh, sorry, Barnaby. Here's some more uh, money. Minister, we're not going to do that. Minister, we're not going to do it. Resume, not your, right. resume your seat. Senator Henderson. Madam President, on a point of order, could I ask oh, Just these... a moment. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Uh, Madam President, on a point of order, could I ask the Minister to refer to members by their proper name? Thank you. I will draw that to the Minister's attention. Thank you, uh, Senator Henderson. I remind all uh, senators that. Um, People in this chamber and the other chamber need to be referred to by their correct titles, Minister. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. And uh, the point I was making is that we will be fiscally responsible. We want to build a budget for a better Thank future you, for Minister. Australia. Your time has expired. Senator Smith, first supplementary. Thank you very much, Madam President. Will decisions of the Albanese government in its first budget add, in net terms, to government spending and debt, or reduce? government spending and debt. Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister. Thank you. Well, as we've been clear, we've been clear. Order. Order. Senator, uh, Minister, resume your seat. Minister Wong, Senator Wong and Senator Henderson, exchanges across the chamber are disorderly. And my beg your pardon if it wasn't you, but it is very hard with the level of noise um, to work out who is making the noise. But Comments across the chamber are disorderly, Minister. Thank you. Well, the, the answer to that question uh, is contingent on a number of decisions that are yet to be made. Um, but we, through through the budget. Well, what do you expect? Well, well I'm being honest with you. I'm Minister, being honest. Resume your seat, please, Senator Billick. Huge trouble hearing Senator Gallagher's wonderful response. So could you? Uh, thank Quite you, Senator Billick. I'm trying my very best, which is why I keep sitting the minister down, sadly. Order. Order. I'm sure that minister, Senator Wong and Birmingham. Right, Minister, please continue. Thank you. Um, so the, that's the very clear answer. Is the decisions that will be uh, made to answer his question are going to be made during the budget process which we are underway now. But I can tell you that it will end the rorts, um, it, it will end the waste, it will uh, make the savings we promised in reducing advertising. Remember all those advertising campaigns yeah. that were yeah. they were always ready to go before the actual programs were ready. Uh, they were out the door pretty quickly. We will, uh, the budget will be Order. handed down the 25th of October. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Smith, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. If government spending will be higher, and I noticed that Senator Gallagher didn't rule that out, if spending will be higher under the Albanese government, won't this see fiscal policy work against monetary policy and mean that the Albanese government's spending will place Order. further upward pressure on interest rates. I'm not going to call the minister until there is quiet. Uh, Senator McGrath and Senator Wong. 
I'm waiting, um, Minister. President, no, I, I think they've set Senator Smith up here because, on the one hand, we're being uh, had arguments to uh, spend $3 billion more over six months for petrol excise, and on the other hand, I'm being asked, I'm being asked about um, if we're spending Minister, more, whether it's going to be Minister, pressure on interest rates. Please resume your seat. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Madam President. Standing Order 211, I was very, very specific. I wanted to know whether or not there was a risk that the government spending would mean that its monetary policy would end up working against fiscal policy. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Smith. I believe that the minister is being directly relevant, but uh, let's uh, continue with her response. Thank you, thank minister. You, President. Well, the opposition's policies would be working against monetary policy, I have to say, or as I understand them, and I'm not sure wh who's got the, um, the power at the moment. But this question comes from the highest spending, highest borrowing Shame. government in Shame. Australia's history. That, that's what you guys were. That's what you guys were. My job is to try and fix that. My job is to try and fix that, Order. rebalance the budget, end the rorts, tidy up the waste, get rid of the waste, find the savings where I can find them and invest in the productive side of the economy, which is absolutely in line, hand in hand with monetary Order. policy. If you are investing in the productive side of the economy and putting downward pressure on inflation and the interest rates that we inherited from you lot. Thank you, Minister. Uh, before I call you, uh, Senator Hanson Young, order. I would like to acknowledge that um, we have uh, Minister Ubio from the Northern Territory, um, who is the Minister for Indigenous Affairs uh, in the gallery. So welcome. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, my question is to Minister Wong, representing both the Prime Minister and the Minister for Water. 450 gigalitres of water was promised under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan for South Australia and the environment, but the Liberal National Party have monumentally stuffed up the delivery of this water at the expense of taxpayers and the health of the river. In the election campaign, the Albanese government promised and committed to delivering the 450 on time and in full. Is this still your government's commitment? Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank uh, Senator Hanson Young for the question. And uh, I think one thing that we can all say is that every South Australian in this chamber should, and certainly those on this side of the chamber, and I don't include yourself in that. Order. Every. I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Wong, address your comments to the chair, please. Oh. Well, I am a senator for South Australia, and so Senator Hanson Young. I apologise for the constitution, Senator. Senator Wong. But I mean, the reality is this: that we, we had a water. We, the Minister for Environment and Water tabled the second review of Water for the Environment Special Account Report, and just like the member for Hume, who hid a price rise uh, of, for electricity, this was also hidden to the South to the, to the Australian yeah, people before the election. And you know why? You know why? Because what it showed is the decade of sabotage that those opposite have engaged in when it comes to the Murray Darling Basin Plan. They promised 450 gigs. You know how many, how many they delivered? Two! Two out of 450. Two out of 450. And we know why? Because they never wanted to deliver it. They never wanted to deliver it. Well, never wanted to deliver it, and we know that because the National Party are still saying that and Senator came into Hume. the chamber whilst in government, whilst in government, and tried to blow up the Murray Darling plan. Now I invite Senator Birmingham, as the most senior South Australian, to pull um, rein in. I, I will get to it. We'll, to rein in uh, those on that side who continue to want to sabotage this important reform. Uh, we have made clear Labor is committed to delivering Senator the basin plan in full. It's what we signed up for. Uh, and the minister has made it clear uh, that remains uh, the approach. But I would say this. It has become a great deal harder now that it has been disclosed that you delivered two out of 450. Why did you think that was OK? Why did they think it was OK to hide that before the election? No, I'm not surprised um, you Senator take a Walt, point of order. Please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Davey, wait, point, point uh, of Senator order. Davey, wait until you're called. Senator Davey. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Point of order, uh, Senator Wong is actually misleading the chamber with her claims that only um, two that gigalitres was recovered. Point. Thank you, Senator Davey. Please resume your seat. Minister. The State of the Environment report makes it clear 
uh, that two out of 450 was delivered. Senator Hanson Young, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. I note that the uh, minister did not answer the question about on time. Uh, given the legal requirement to deliver the 450, given the promise to South Australians, what is the government's plan to make sure that 450 gigalitres is delivered, is used to save the river and not stolen by those upstream? Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Minister. Thank you, thank you, President. And I again hear the interjections from the National Party. We wonder why a coalition never delivered on this. And I do remember when I was water minister and I bought a lot of water. How angry, how angry they were that we actually bought water for the environment from willing sellers, from willing sellers. Order. Oh my goodness! Isn't it dreadful to use a market to deliver an environmental and a social outcome? Oh, that is, I mean, it's a dreadful thing, isn't it, to actually actually. Order. <laughs> Order. I am unable to hear Senator Wong's response. Please remain quiet and show courtesy. Thank you, Minister. Uh, uh, the Minister for the Environment and Water confirmed yesterday she has written to and is speaking to Basin Water Ministers because obviously uh, we have to work with the states uh, in order to deliver this. Uh, Minister Plibersek has also tasked her department to consult widely on creative and collaborative approaches on how we can deliver the plan in full. And I say this, nothing is off the table, including voluntary buybacks. Yeah. Including voluntary buybacks. Uh, because it is clear, it's, it is clear that the approach that was taken on the other thank side you, Minister, did not work. Thank you, Minister. Your time work. has expired. Senator Hanson Young, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. I'm very uh, pleased to hear that voluntary buybacks are uh, on the table because it is clear from the government's own report that this is the only way 450 gigalitres will be returned to the river. Will the government commit to working with South Australia? the South Australian government and the South Australian people to make sure it is delivered. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Um, I'll... Senator McKenzie. Minister. Thank you, President. Uh, thank you to Senator Hanson Young for her question. And, and I just might pick up two comment, uh, part, parts of her question. She, she, she talks about the need to change the policy settings effectively, and she's right. Uh, the, the report says Order. the report that was commissioned by your government, which you hid prior to the election, says that these targets cannot be met under the settings that you put in place. Shame. You can't meet it on the sense you put in place. Now, it's the easiest thing, isn't it, for a politician to go, go to upstream and downstream and say different things to different communities and pretend they're going to do something. At least tell people the truth. I, I accept you don't agree. I accept you don't agree with our position. So I am uh, Senator Henderson. Rise and, and um, draw to your attention the need for Senator Wong to direct her comments through the chair. Uh, Thanks thank very much, you, Madam President. Um, Senator Henderson, I would also draw to the Chamber's attention the general disorderly conduct in here. So I would ask all senators to um, be courteous to one another, and I would uh, just remind senators that comments are directed to the chair. Senator Wong, please continue. Fair enough. I, I, I do get. I do like to respond to the misinformation that's provided by the National Party, and I shouldn't. I shouldn't take the bait because they've been doing it for years. They've been pretending for years. The report indicates there are not enough off-farm projects to reach the 450 gigs, even with unlimited time and money. Uh, so clearly, Thank you, clearly Minister. a different Your approach has, has to be expired. taken. Senator White. Uh, President, this is not my first speech, but it is my first question. <laughs> my question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister outline the findings of the Productivity Commission's inquiry, five-year productivity inquiry, the key to prosperity interim report that has been released today? Good question. Uh, minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. And I congratulate uh, Senator White on her first question, and thank you. Um, and it's an honour to to um, have be the answer of your first question. Uh, the report out today paints a dismal picture of recent productivity growth. Over the last decade, growth has been the slowest in more than a century. 
Yeah, yeah no surprises there. Gross national income was $4,600 lower per person than what it could have been if productivity growth was in line with the long-term average. This is important because 80 per cent of income growth in the past three decades has come from productivity gains. So we should not be surprised, sadly, that the past decade that we've seen with real wages is largely due to the poor decade we've also had on productivity. The report said very clearly almost all sustained increases in real wages are underpinned by improvements in labour productivity growth. And being more productive means Australians can consume higher quality and, completely new and access new goods and services. Getting productivity moving again is a huge challenge that has been neglected under those opposite, and it's a challenge that we take seriously, which is why Labor's economic plan is so important. Investments into the productive side of the economy, the productivity agenda is at the heart of our economic plan. Childcare reform, skills and advanced manufacturing, and of course the opportunities that are going to come in the energy sector. The report is yet another Senator scathing Anderson. assessment of the former government's failure to drive reform or grab the opportunities for jobs and growth that they should have, and Australians have paid an enormous price for that. Thank you, Minister. Senator White, sec first supplementary. Now, can the minister advise the Senate on what has caused the slow pace of productivity growth as outlined in the report? Minister. It's very, very quiet over there on the opposition benches. The Productivity Commit Committee's report states that most OECD countries— Order. Order on both sides, Minister. Thank you. You should, you should ignore me. <laughs> I don't know about that. Minister. The Productivity, Committee's, uh, Productivity Commission's report states that most OECD countries have experienced a productivity slowdown. However, we know that the productivity challenges we face have been made worse by a decade of wasted opportunities right. and wrong priorities of those opposite. And there is no starker example of this than the Coalition's wasted decade on energy. 22 different energy policies over their term in government. It's seen the opportunities for investment, innovation and jobs go begging. We pay the price for that. This really was uh, the Morrison government, a government that spent more, borrowed more and delivered less, including in the productivity agenda, which has been outlined you, uh, in the Your public time release has today. Expired. Senator White, second supplementary. Uh, can the minister further advise the Senate what the government's plans are to boost productivity in the Australian economy? Minister. Thank you. I, thank you, uh, President. Yes, I can. Thank you, Senator White, for the question. The Albanese government's economic plan is a plan to boost productivity, Senator take Hughes. the speed limit off the economy and create the right kind of growth. It will be a key focus of our up upcoming Jobs and Skills Summit. Our plans include investing in cleaner and cheaper energy, better training our workforce through fee-free TAFE and more university places, investing in cheaper childcare, boosting GDP Order. through higher workforce participation, upgrading the NBN to begin capturing the digital ec um, economic opportunities, creating a future made in Australia President, with procurement and co-investment plans through the National Reconstruction Fund to stimulate billions of dollars in private investment. And this is in line Senator and in Henderson. step with the direction of the PC's report released today. Uh, Senator Hanson. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. We are constantly hearing from businesses, farmers and industries that they can't get workers. In the meantime, almost 950,000 people are collecting unemployment benefits. Something has to give, and the answer is not higher immigration, which will only put a greater burden on our hospitals, doctors, schools, nursing homes roads and infrastructure, especially housing. How do you intend to address this crippling shortage of workers? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Thank you to um, uh, Senator Hanson for the question. And, and she is right that labour shortages and skill shortages are, are identified by uh, uh, many in the private sector, well, by the private sector, by business leaders as being uh, a, a handbrake 
uh, on on the economy uh, and on you know, the profitability of many businesses. And you know, we know that from the data, and we also know that if you if you go and talk to small and medium enterprises as well as to business leaders. Um, obviously, there is no quick fix to this. Um, the, the first point is, well, you know, obviously, what, what the government can do uh, is to implement its policies, which include uh, in establishing fee-free TAFE places in areas of school shortages, additional university places, to try and ensure we give Australians the skills that are needed for the jobs of today and tomorrow. So, you know, that is a very important part of our investment in people. Um, uh, the, the senator um, raises migration. You know, w the view the, the Labor government takes is you have to address uh, it, l labour shortages through a, a balanced approach, which includes efforts to train and upskill Australian workers, uh, but also recognises that there is a place for migration, whether that's um, permanent migration or other forms of migration. Uh, from, from Labor's perspective, uh, we, we don't want to see a situation where, as it was under the previous government, migration is used as a stopgap, uh, as a fill-in, as a way of dealing with a skill shortage, which uh, in great part arose because there was a failure to properly fund and support Australians to get the, the skills that are required. Equally, you know, with the Labor Party, we don't want workers being exploited. And, and you might recall in the previous parliament there was quite a lot of focus on the exploitation of migrant workers, particularly uh, in, in the agricultural and other areas. So my answer is uh, a balanced approach. Obviously, our priority Thank you, is to, Your time to invest in the skills. Senator of Hanson, first supplementary. Thank you. Well, actually, um, Minister, I do have a quick fix for you. With thousands of people having been on long-term unemployment benefits for decades, even passing it on as a family tradition, will you move legislation to ensure? that no one can receive unlimited dole payments for more than two years out of five if they are capable of doing a day's work. Minister. Uh, uh, thank you to Senator Hanson. Uh, and uh, obviously, I'm sure the minister, representing the Minister for Social Security, uh, or uh, might be able to, or employ, uh, Employment and Workplace Relations, might be able to provide a, a more detailed answer on, on mutual obligation. Uh, both parties of government at different times and have had different approaches but have obligations frameworks in relation to receipt of social security benefits um, so um, you know that is uh, obviously uh, an approach that is taken bearing in mind the need to be you know, sensible and balanced and responsible through that I would make the point that actually at the moment we, we do have a participation rate that is uh, quite high um, so the participation rate is at 66.8 per cent and the employment to population ratio of six, is at 64.4 per cent so actually there are quite there are a great many Australians who are participating in the economy and are participating in the labor market thank you Senator Thank you, Ministers. Senator Hanson, second supplementary. Minister, this is why I've asked the question of the Prime Minister. In the lead-up to the election, he said he had answers for these problems with Australian people. So this is why I want a direct answer from the Prime Minister with regards to this through you. We have a vast untapped workforce of older Australians on the age pension with um, more than willing to work to supplement their income in these difficult times. Will you legislate for age pensioners to be able to take on more work without penalty to their benefits and give independent retirees who are no burden on the taxpayer the same opportunities to fill our critical work shortages? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Senator Hanson. Well, I, I will uh, ensure I, I'll answer what I can, uh, and I'll ensure that if there is more information that can be provided to you, that it is provided to you. Uh, you, you, you uh, I, I was a member of a, a government previously, which uh, put in place the work bonus in 2009 for precisely the, the reasons that you outlined. That there were people uh, who wanted. Uh, to do more work without it affecting uh, their pension, uh, and there is obviously a disincentive, just as there is in relation to childcare, but it's a different, slightly different issue, a disincentive for pensioners to work if it was going to affect their income. So when last in government we did introduce measures which enable people to, to earn more before their pension was, was uh, affected. Um, I think that um, obviously uh, the, the, the jobs and uh, the, the summit that is it is uh, the jobs and skills summit uh, which the uh, which the 
Well, so actually having people talk to each other sometimes yeah, isn't a bad idea. <clears throat> I know that seems I know that um, seems Minister, unusual. Your time has expired. Thank you. Senator Henderson. I thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. I refer to the Treasurer's statement that you will be going through the budget line by line and making sure that spending is about building value and not buying votes. In light of this, will the government be honouring its pre-election promise to spend $20,000 building a frog bog at Malmesbury Primary School announced in the Labor electorate of Bendigo just 15 days before the election? Minister. Um, uh, thank you, President. I'm trying to drop the madam, and I thank Senator Henderson for the question. And I, Order. I thank her. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Henderson has asked a specific question, which the minister has stood to answer, and there's disorderly calling out on both sides of the chamber, Senator Stirl. Order, Minister. Um, President, and I thank Senator Henderson for the question and for reminding the chamber of the uh, fiscally responsible way that we are going about managing uh, a broken budget, heaving with a trillion dollars in Liberal debt after we inherited a budget from a government that had spent more, borrowed more and delivered less than any uh, other government. Minister, please resume your seat. I'm waiting for your own side, Senator Henderson, to be quiet, so I can uh, ask you your. I'm assuming it's a point of order. Yes, but it is. I'm waiting ahead. for you to give me the call. Yeah, I'm waiting. Yes, Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, on a point of order, direct relevance. It was a very specific question relating to a pre-election promise to spend twenty thousand dollars building a frog bog. Yes or no? Will that be delivered? Thank you, and including, Senator is it fiscally oh, responsible? Okay. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Order! 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 Senator McGrath. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Henderson has raised a point of order. She is entitled to a response. It is, you did ask a general question. You talked about line by line, and then you asked specifically in relation to a budget measure at a particular school. So I, the minister is being relevant. Minister, thank you, um, President. And I, I will get uh, to the, uh, the, the substance of the question. But as you said. Um, the senator did go to the fact that we are auditing the budget and going through it line by line, and it is really important work. Um, it's essential work if we are going to reprioritise within existing funding uh, to take uh, to shift the budget from political buy-offs that um, plagued the previous government. Well, order. The member for New England seemed to get a lot of attention. The price of net zero wasn't zero, was it, Senator Birmingham? No. And we saw that in the we saw that in the budget with billions of dollars, billions order. of dollars. The government made a range of election commitments. They're all contained in this plan, which I'm sure you all have, because it's it's very very successful plan that order. we took to the last election. The election commitments, as Minister, outlined in this plan, Senator Henderson. Madam President, I regret to have to raise a point of order on direct relevance again. Uh, it was a question specifically about whether the frog bog, uh, oh, no. whether it's fiscally responsible, Senator is very Henderson, questionable. Will, will this? Your seat. Will I've asked. I've, uh, the, there is no point of order. It was a order. I'm um, Senator Stirl. Order. The minister is being relevant. Minister. Uh, thank you. This document, which outlined all of our election commitments and their fiscal impact, are uh, contained in this document, and it is the government's intention, as the Prime Minister has said on a number of occasions, to do what we promised we would do before the election if we were successful. So the answer to that is Order, where Senator we have made McGrath. election commitments, we will be delivering on them. Thank you, Minister. Senator Henderson, first supplementary. Uh, 
I again refer to the Treasurer's statement that you will be making sure that spending is about building value, not buying votes. And I'm quite confused by the last response because it sounds like the minister is contradicting herself. One minute it's assessing, and the next minute it's. I'm sorry, um, Minister, I haven't finished my question. <laughs> There's no point of order. I haven't finished my question. Resume your seat. <laughs> Senator Henderson, please sit down. Order. Order. Minister. Senator Watt. Order. Oh, no, it, it is hard. Senator Wong. It, that is not a question. The standing orders don't contemplate a speech where there's, instead of questions. Senator Birmingham. The point of order, President. Uh, earlier this week, President, you, uh, you provided some advice to the chamber in relation to supplementary questions, having been asked to do so by Senator Wong and those opposite. Uh, in that advice, you did uh, encourage those making supplementary questions uh, to ensure their supplementary question drew a link to the answer that was provided uh, previously, which is precisely what Senator Henderson was just doing. Um, Senator Wong, I'm going to rule on uh, the point of order, unless there's uh, a different point that you wish to make. Point of order. I'm not sure that the st confused state of the senator's mind, as she described it, her state of confusion, is something that is necessarily an important part of a question. Thank you. I draw um, Senator Henderson. Please resume your seat. Unless it's an entirely different point of order, which I will come to after I've ruled on your first point of order. So I haven't yet ruled on your first point of order, so please resume your seat. The point of I order. said I would come to that after I've ruled on this point of order. I draw um, Senator's attention to um, rules for questions 106, which simply say, and this has been reinforced by a number of presidents, that questions should not be prefaced by a statement. Senator Henderson, you have a second point of order. In relation to Senator Wong's derogatory statement about my state of mind— uh, and Senator Henderson, um, there was no point yes, of order sorry, there. Sorry, could I make the point of order, no, Madam you, President? No, I've ruled on it. There is no point no, of order. Point Please of order resume your seat. Please resume your This. May I also remind senators—please re resume your seat—that points of order are not opportunities for group discussions. That was Senator Parry. Please resume your seat. Senator Henderson, I'm not entertaining a point of order. Senator Henderson, may I draw your attention to the fact that I am the president of the Senate, not you, and that when I ask you to resume your seat, that is what I expect to happen, and I don't expect you to continue to try and debate an issue. Minister. Uh, Mr. Pres uh, Madam President, um, I, I thought I was referencing Senator Henson Henderson describing herself as being confused by the minister's answer, but if, I, if, if it was offensive to her, I'm very happy to withdraw. Minute. No. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Please resume your seat. Senator Henderson, I've just drawn to your attention that it's not a debating point. The question is live. Please resume your seat. Minister. She was only halfway through it. Yeah. So, order. Order. My apologies, Senator Henderson. There's been so much disruption that I was confused. I thought the minister was answering. Could I just get some clarification? Could I start the question again yes, and start the clock at the top? Yep. Thank you. Um, I again refer to the Treasurer's statement that you, will not, that you will be making sure that spending is about building value, not buying votes. In light of this, will the government be honouring its pre-election promise to spend $11,000 painting a mural at the Kingsway markets announced in the now Labor electorate of Pearce just seven days before the election? Minister. Uh, President, and thank Thank you, Minister. Please resume your seat. Order. Order. Senator Birmingham, Senator Wong. Order. Senator Henderson has asked a question to which the minister rose, and she's entitled to give her response.
in silence, Minister? Uh, thank you, um, President. Well, as I said, the answer is the same as the previous answer in that uh, where we have made election commitments, we intend to deliver upon those election commitments. Uh, we are ensuring well, we are building value. We are building value, and many, all of those uh, community programs that order, we order, order. Minister, please continue. Oh, I believe the minister is still continuing. Uh, thank you. We made a range of commitments across a number of electorates uh, around small community uh, programs and sporting infrastructure programs. They were detailed and outlined ahead of the election and in our election costings. They are modest and they are Order. important to local communities. And it stands in stark contrast to the approach that those opposite took when you embezzled funds from uh, the car park, car park rorts. Remember that? Established, told everyone it was eligible. You were eligible for them, and then Thank when you, Minister, put it in their your own time has expired. Senator Henderson, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. From frog bogs to murals, sand pits, splash parks, or even a wall of friendship, um, can the minister confirm the, con Henderson, the contrary please to? Please resume your seat. Did you have a point of order, Senator Wong? Order. 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 Senator Henderson, please continue. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. Senator Madam Wong. Madam President, I'm sorry. Sen Senator Wong order. is making order. A, on a point of order. On a point of order, Madam President, Senator Wong is making disparaging comments across the table about me continuously. Could I ask you to ask her to cease this behaviour? Um, Senator Henderson. There is so much noise in the chamber, it is impossible for me to hear. But if Senator Wong would like to re please resume your seat. If Senator, if Senator Wong would like to consider the comments she made, which I did not hear, and withdraw them if necessary. Thank is, you. I'm, I'm little, are you asking me to withdraw my comment that you've lost Karangamite twice? Is that what I'm asked to withdraw? I, I don't I've, understand. I, I'm always happy. I think people know in this place. I'm always happy to withdraw if it assists the chamber. Thank you. Senator Henderson, you I'm being don't asked have to withdraw. Call. What am I being asked to withdraw, Senator? What? That you lost Karangamite twice. Senator Wong. Is that that's what you want me? Senator Wong. Oh, Order. It's a fact. I'm not sure why I'm supposed Order. to withdraw, but if it assists, I withdraw. Senator Henderson, please continue. Um, from frog bogs to murals, sand pits wall, and the wall of friendship, can the minister confirm that, contrary to the Treasurer's lofty statement about not buying votes, the Albanese government went on, on, a, went on a massive pre-election vote-buying spree across Labor and Your marginal time has expired. electorates? Thank you. Order on my right. Order. Order. Minister. <laughs> Senator Mariel Smith. Order on my right. I'm Minister. Can I have the call? Order. Minister, please. Uh, thank you. Well, the first point I'd make, um, President, is I will not be lectured about buying votes uh, from a, gov a former government that spent nine years and billions of dollars doing exactly that in every single budget. Where we made local commitments, important community investments in local infrastructure and sport that was supported by local communities at the election, very modest program. We made those commitments before the election. In case you didn't notice, we won the election, and we will be delivering on those election commitments in full. In full. Thank you, Minister. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks very much, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Women, also representing the Minister for Health, uh, Minister Gallagher. Polling released today by Fair Agenda confirms that there's strong public support for improving abortion access, with 72 per cent of Australians agreeing that governments should make abortions more readily accessible. Fair Agenda, Murray Stopes and Children by Choice have all proposed solutions, including expanding Medicare coverage, 
nurse-led abortion care and better access to long-acting reversible contraceptives. Will the Health Minister support including medical and surgical abortions as an MBS item number to ensure that no one is denied the procedure because they can't afford it? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank uh, Senator Waters uh, for her question on this very important uh, subject. Um, in terms of the work that is underway uh, at the moment, and this is work that the Assistant Minister for Health, um, Minister Kearney, will be doing uh, alongside the Minister for Health, is looking at essentially access to health services for women. Um, and putting together a plan around that. Um, to, and I've had some discussions with her already about this. We also had discussions at the first uh, meeting of women's and women's safety ministers a fortnight ago, uh, where there was some discussion about um, looking at uh, whether legislation that regulates access to termination of pregnancy services around states and territories uh, could be um, aligned uh, better, harmonised, um, and that's work um, that we'll let, uh, leave to the states and territories as that's the, the appropriate place. But I did say uh, that access to um, health services is really important to the Albanese government, um, making sure that um, we are looking at areas particularly for uh, women living in rural and remote communities who have um, less access to termination of pregnancy services, in some cases no access, and uh, those issues will be discussed and examined through the work that um, the Assistant Minister for Health will be doing. So it's, I'm not in a position uh, to answer your correct question directly, but the answer I give you is that there is work underway, um, consultations that will happen uh, at the appropriate level, and then we'll go through a further process around that. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Waters, first supplementary. Thanks, President. The polling also showed that 69 per cent of Australians agree that the government should address barriers to access in rural and regional areas. As few as, uh, as, few as 1 per cent of GPs in rural and regional areas are currently registered to prescribe medical abortions. What is the government doing to increase the number of GPs who are able to prescribe medical abortions? And do you support nurse-led models of care to increase access? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, President, and I think those really are questions that will come up uh, through the stakeholder consultations that Minister um, Carney will do, um, will undertake. So again, it's probably it, it is too early for me to answer that question directly. Um, but um, we are um, the work where it'll intersect with my work is around the national gender equality strategy, and women's health will be a focus of that as well. So um, there is essentially we are doing further work. Um, both on the uh, gender equality strategy and the work that Minister uh, Carney is dealing with in terms of access to health services, uh, and further consultations will be held. I know this is an issue that has been raised with me, and it's appropriate that we allow those discussions to happen. Thank you, Minister. Second supplementary, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. Research uh, released today also shows an increase in women being subjected to reproductive coercion including from partners or from counsellors that they seek pregnancy advice from. Will the government address reproductive coercion in the new national plan to end violence against women and their children and take action to ensure that all pregnancy counselling is unbiased? Thank you. Senator Waters, Minister. Well, the issue of coercion um, is dealt with in uh, the national plan. So, um, you know, uh, I would have to go back and check. It's, we're currently in the process, or Minister Rishworth is leading that work and finalising uh, the details of that plan um, after our meeting with state and territory ministers. But the, the broader issue of coercive control uh, is absolutely um, part of those discussions. Um, you know, and I think part of your question would fall into that area. But I'm happy to take further advice on that and come back to the chamber if I can provide an update. Thank you, Minister. Senator Polly. Thank you, uh, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Tourism, Senator Farrell. Can the Minister provide an update on the condition of the tourism sector and tourism jobs? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank, I thank, uh, <laughs> thank, thank Senator uh, Polly, um, an excellent senator from the great state of Tasmania, and uh, always asks um, very very good questions. Um, 
Look, I. Senator McKenzie. Senator McKenzie. You, you can talk about handouts. You can talk about Sen handouts. Senator, Senator Farrell, McKenzie. Address your uh, comments to the chair and not across my, the chamber. My apologies, President. I will direct uh, the answer to uh, to you. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, look, the uh, tourism sector has suffered uh, terribly over the last uh, two, two and a half years, um, and I regret to say a lot of that, um, uh, that suffering was uh, brought about and exacerbated by the actions of the former, uh, former government. Um, just, just, just one example. Just, just, Order. just one example. Order. <coughs> Sorry. Just, just one example, President. Um, right, right, Order. right. Right, right. When um, close, uh, close, closings Senator and um, outbreaks were underway in a whole range of key tourist areas, what did this government do? Former government do? It, 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 it took away the job keeper. Now the job keeper, the job keeper, the job. The Minister, job... resume your seat. Order. Minister, no, you should have spent. You should have. You should have spent better. You should have. You should have. Minister, please resume your seat. When there's silence, I will go to Senator Henderson, who's on her feet. Senator Henderson, I would just ask the minister to direct his comments through the chair. Thank you. Uh, I would also ask. Uh, Senators, particularly on my left, to give the minister the respect to which he's entitled to and to listen quietly. Minister, please direct your questions through the chair. Minister of the Crown. Thank you, thank you, President. And I was directing my comments uh, to you following your earlier exhortation. Um, well, maybe you could have maybe maybe you could have saved some money on not spending five point five billion dollars on submarines on submarines that never ever got built but getting back getting back to the topic order order oh, you've got one of your own senators on their feet Senator, the wait for the call, Senator Henderson. Senator Henderson. Because are on their trading wheels, but I would again remind them to not to direct their comments uh, through you. Uh, the minister was doing that. There is a lot of noise uh, on the left-hand side of the chamber. Minister Farrell. I've continued to direct all of my comments uh, to you, President. Just to be clear about that. Now, um, throughout this period, um, these tourism tourism operators. Held on, held on to their businesses, sometimes by the. Oh, beg the your pardon. It's time. Sorry, <laughs> Senator Farrell. Uh, Senator Polly, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. It's been nine long years before I've asked a question that a minister has been able to answer. But how, how has this? Order. How has this? Order. That's a bit harsh, Helen. Order. How has this workforce and skills shortage led to challenges for tourism businesses and high costs for consumers? Minister. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, President. And I thank uh, Senator Polly for once again an excellent uh, question. Um, Order. I, look, I like all my colleagues. Uh, Unlike you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Farrell. Uh, <coughs> Senator Farrell. No, they just don't like him. They just don't like him. Boom. Please continue. It's going to be a, it's going to be a fun question Order. time tomorrow. I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> President, uh, businesses uh, were forced to let go of staff, and they've struggled to get them back. Why is that? Well, unfortunately, um, throughout this period, while people um, who really liked working in the tourism sector suddenly found that um, their employment was no longer secure. Every time there was a, uh, a lockdown, they lost their job. And so, uh, when the labour shortages occurred in other parts of the economy, of course, what Thank was the? Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Senator Polly, second supplementary. What steps 
are the Albanese Labor government taking to address the mess left by the former government? Senate, Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. And uh, another excellent question from um, uh, Senator Minister, uh, Polly. Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator McKenzie. I am looking for uh, the answer, along with Senator Polly, to probably her last two questions. But the point of order um, is, uh, I am having listened very carefully to Senator Polly's supplementary. I, I don't know how it's related to her first question on Tasmanian tourism. I have. Uh, I believe it's relevant. I will just uh, double check with the clerk. Uh, thank you. I am advised that it is irrelevant as long as Senator Farrell restricts his comments to the tourism area, which he actually has been doing. Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President. Uh, look, I know you don't like. I know you like, don't like hearing these, these answers, but, but I've, got, I've got 49 seconds to do it. Order, we order. are committed. The Labor Party is committed to working with the tourism sector uh, to address these skill shortages. The Albanese government will put real money on the table to support the industry, including, for money, in, including money, yes, promises that we took to the Senator last Birmingham. election to support this industry, which you failed to do for the previous— Minister Farrell. No, uh, no. Senator Henderson. Madam President, uh, you didn't fail to do anything. I would ask the minister to again uh, make his comments through the chair uh, thank you, Senator and to Henderson. be mindful of the error that he's Senator making Henderson. continually. Uh, the minister is making his comments through the chair. There is a fair amount of order. Order, order. There is a fair amount of joking going back and forward across the chamber. Um, I believe generally the minister is making his comments through the chair, and I would invite him to continue his remarks. President, and uh, thank you for that protection. <laughs> um, now we're prioritising the backlog of uh, migrant working visas to increase labour supply. We're opening up as uh, uh, the uh, um, Minister Wong previously said new fee-free uh, TAFE uh, places to skill up workers, and uh, that will include 45,000 places Farrell. across— Thank you, Minister Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Wong. I I'm tempted, Madam, uh, I'm tempted President, to move an extension of time, but I do. <laughs> I, I, do. I ask that further questions be placed Thank on you. notice and wish everyone well for the question time and won't be out tomorrow. <laughs> Minister Farrell. Uh, President, uh, yesterday in question time, in response to a question from Senator Pocock, I undertook to provide some further information in response to his question on housing and homelessness. Um, I understand the Senator is due to meet with the Minister, where he will be able to raise uh, the matters uh, directly. In line with my commitment yesterday, I have also written to Senator Pocock to provide some additional information uh, regarding the uh, government's priorities on housing and homelessness, and I now table my response to him. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, I also have two matters to follow up from question time. Uh, this week. On the 1st of August, I undertook during question time to come back and provide further detail to Senator Rustin in relation to questions uh, asked uh, to the Minister for Health. Um, uh, I'm pleased to be able to provide the further detail to the Senate now. Labor is committed to supporting patients to navigate the health system, including through nurse telehealth initiatives, particularly those patients with rare genetic and complex conditions. We recognise the role of telehealth nurses in assisting patients who are facing enormous life challenges in navigating the web of complex health services. That's why the uh, Albanese government committed to providing $2.47 million to address this through uh, the next budget. The government remains committed to implementing the election commitment to fund a program of supports for patients with rare and complex diseases to better navigate the health system. And Minister Butler has directed the Department of Health to identify the best way to deliver these services, working directly with the range of organisations supporting people with rare genetic and complex conditions. 
Um, I have one other matter which I, yesterday I undertook during question time to come back and provide further detail to Senator Lambie in relation to questions the senator asked to the Assistant Treasurer um, and the Minister for Financial Services. I'm pleased uh, to provide the further detail to Senator Lambie and the Chamber now. The government is currently in the process of considering and consulting on draft regulations related to superannuation annual member members' meeting notices. Uh, superannuation funds are required to provide certain information in AMM notices to members to support them in effectively engaging with trustees during the meeting. The question and answer process during the meeting remains the primary mechanism for members to obtain information from their fund that is directly relevant to their interests. The government's aim is to pro promote a high level of meaningful transparency for superannuation members by streamlining disclosure requirements for superannuation annual members meeting notices. Regulations issued by the previous government did not align with the national accounting standards and led to double counting and other misleading information. Under the draft regulations, funds will still be required to provide written notice to members which detail fund performance, their outcomes for the period, the total payments they make to industrial bodies, employer or employees, marketing and advocacy. There is no proposed change to the disclosure remuneration details. Thank you. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Bragg. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by uh, Ministers Gallagher and um, Watt. No, sorry, not what. Um, Farrell. Now, very important that I remember people's names. Um, so, what we've heard today in question time is a good opportunity to reflect upon the economic management of the nation, uh, the statements that were made in the last parliament about uh, expenditure and where we go from here. Now, uh, there were questions about certain components of the government's commitments uh, to spend taxpayers' funds. And of course, in the last parliament, uh, people who have a short or even a medium-term memory would recall that it was the then opposition that was wanting JobKeeper to be paid to uh, foreign nationals, uh, foreign students, foreign corporations, uh, and of course had a range of other expenditure proposals around uh, paying Australians to go and get vaccinations, even though we were, in fact, the most vaccinated nation on earth, pretty much. Uh, so um, I understand that people like to make these statements when they're in opposition. I try and restrain myself while I'm here. But certainly it is a matter of public record that uh, the Labor Party wanted to spend too much money. Uh, and and look, there will be analysis done over this period of time, and we have gone through a historically high period of public expenditure. And as someone who values uh, intergenerational equity, um, I would say that we spent perhaps more money than we should have. But it was a very significant crisis. It was a very significant economic shock, uh, and. The idea that uh, the talking points you hear from the government that there's a X number of liberal debt or whatever else they say uh, ignores the fact that everyone, every reasonable person expected that the government of the day would have put its hand in its pocket to protect and preserve the economy uh, in large part as we knew it, as we tried to address the significant health and economic shock. So yes, there was money spent. Uh, there may have been some wasteful spending on the margins, uh, but certainly the now government, I think, is in a very weak position to lecture the Liberal Party and the National Party, which is now the opposition, on expenditure, given its <laughs> attempted expenditure of uh, funds to foreign students, foreign corporations <laughs> and the like uh, in the last parliament. And of course, uh, I think we will long remember the, uh, the idea that we should, of course, pay Australians, the most vaccinated people on earth, effectively, to go and get a, a shot. Now, uh, that's on the expenditure side, and what we need to do in this parliament and future parliaments is to improve the budget position. Um, I don't think it's a fair approach for future generations that we are going to uh, have a, a significant 
level of debt that will make it harder for us to prepare for future shocks. Now, one of the issues we have in this place, I think, is that uh, we have too few uh, young people in the parliament. And I think if we had some more younger people in the parliament, I'm not casting aspersions here or saying anyone should try and solve this problem today, I think we would take a longer view on the build-up of debt that has occurred uh, over the past decade. Because um, at 30 per cent, 35 per cent of uh, GDP, a debt to, to, to GDP, it, it is a historically high position for the country. And we do need to find a way to get that down. Uh, because if we do go above 50 per cent, uh, uh, it would be very difficult for us to do the same, deploy the same economic measures that were deployed in the last parliament. And I say um, that many of those measures were deployed with bipartisan support. So uh, it is a challenge for us to try and look at the intergenerational reports findings, uh, that we have a significant issue with the tax base, uh, a pretty adverse dependency ratio, uh, and so we do want to try and improve that over the long term. Now, uh, the other thing that was uh, said today that I think was, was important uh, was uh, in relation to, the, uh, to the, the, well, I mean the tax side of the budget. Um, we also want to, over the medium term, have a good look at how we can uh, improve the sustainability of the tax base. Uh, we, of course, are too reliant upon uh, direct taxation. Uh, we should, over the long run, look at how we can have a more sustainable approach and a more competitive approach to taxation. Senator Green. And thanks for the opportunity to contribute um, to talk about the answers given um, by Senator Gallagher and um, Farrell, although we asked Senator Farrell that question. But um, I, I'm a big fan of tourism, so glad to be able to have that opportunity. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Um, and I'll remind the senator um, uh, it would be good to have more young people in parliament. And I congratulate Senator Payman on her election at 27 years old. She's going to make a fantastic senator, hopefully, for many years to come. Um, the uh, answers given by um, Minister Gallagher uh, around um, uh, our cost of living uh, uh, issues um, are important and, and we know that people in this country are hurting. And we know that this is a difficult economic time and it is a difficult um, uh, economic set of books that we inherited from the previous government. But it gave uh, Minister Gallagher another opportunity to update the Senate on the uh, economic situation that we are facing. And it is very important that Australians understand, and I believe that they do understand. And I believe that's why uh, the members opposite are, are sitting on those benches now, because we did inherit a trillion dollars of Liberal debt. A trillion dollars of debt. And we are committed to fiscal responsibility, unlike those opposite. Now they'll tell you that that debt was incurred at a time where they couldn't possibly have not spent that money. But we know that they doubled the debt before COVID-19. They had doubled the debt before the COVID-19 crisis. We've inherited high inflation and rising interest rates and historically low wages because those opposite were not invested in lifting real wages not interested in making sure that the minimum wage would rise. Uh, and that's why we've got a situation now where we've got high inflation and low wages. They, they're the highest, they were the highest spending and highest borrowing government in Australia. And this is the really important point that Senator, Senator Gallagher made today. And those opposite would do well to listen, maybe before their next tactics meeting, because it's how they spent their money that Australians really noticed. They spent that money in rorts, in colour-coded spreadsheets and buying off the National Party. And, that's, and, and they did that in a systematic way to make sure that all they cared about was themselves and not delivering for all Australians. But that's not what the Albanese Labor government will be doing. We've already started the really hard work of dealing with the cost of living crisis. The Albanese Labor government secured an increase to the minimum wage, finally, finally, for minimum wage workers. We've increased the minimum wage by putting forward a, a genuine 
and sympathetic proposal to the Fair Work Commission. It was our first step in getting the, our plan to get real work, wages work, um, moving. On top of that, we've got a plan to reduce vital, the cost of vital medicines and make them cheaper, cutting the maximum co-payment under the PBS by 29 per cent. We're also making it easier to get access to bulk build health care with the establishment of 50 urgent care clinics. And of course, uh, as we know, we are improving access and affordability of early childhood education, and we know this will be instrumental for our economy. It's, re it's always an, of interest to me the response uh, from those opposite in regards to Labor's childcare policy and investing in childcare and making childcare cheaper. Because I know this is not a view po possibly shared by everyone on the other side, but on this side we know that investing in childcare is an, is an economic policy. It's an economic policy because it saves families money and it gets people back to work. More affordable childcare means more opportunities for families to increase their weekly pay. And as Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said, this is a plan for reform that will deliver economic potential. It just makes sense. Australians can also be assured that we are addressing the skills crisis, and Senator Farrell addressed this crisis, the skills crisis we have in our tourism industry right now, something that the former government refused to acknowledge or address in their time. The very first piece of legislation we introduced was to create Jobs and Skills Australia so that we can get on with the work of getting Australians into work. And Jobs and Skills Australia will be pivotal for the economy and our economic recovery um, as we recover from 10 years of neglect, from mistakes and from mess, from trillion dollars of debt, from rorts and waste that the previous government left behind for every Australian. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. And, uh, it's interesting. I'll just take off there from Senator Green's comments about the skills crisis. The former coalition government spent $100 million on subsidising uh, TAFE apprenticeships by 50 per cent. That was a fantastic scheme. Uh, and it just goes to show that this is the party of the battlers now. Don't, don't kid yourself. This is the party that wants to throw money, throw money at the big end of town. Make no mistake about that. If you want, you know, and what's interesting, what's interesting about question time is, whenever questions were put to the Senator Gallagher, she had absolutely no answers for the way forward. Absolutely no answers for the way forward. And I tell you what, you won't say anything from Senator Wong either. I well remember when she turned up to RAT, um, when she, she was talking about trying to have a crack at the Leppington Triangle and claim that you know we'd paid $30 million for a $3 million block of land. And, Senator Stirl couldn't understand why I was being so quiet, and of course I just sat back there and let Senator Wong show how little she understood about finance. Because had she known, had she actually understood accounting standards and valuation standards and prior case law, she would have known that you pay the best use. Okay, AASB 13, paragraphs 29 and 30. Uh, and if uh, Senator Wong or anyone else on that side of the chamber would like a lesson in finance, I'm, I'm more than happy to help. And, uh, and I, will, I won't just sit here and bag you out. I'll actually give you some free solutions. First of all, you've got to identify the problem. And of course, the problem was none other than Paul J. Keating, who basically, under the Hawke government, uh, basically ripped the guts out of the manufacturing sector in Victoria with the Button Plan, uh, commoditised uh, the up higher education with the Dawkins Plan, where suddenly education was just treated like a, another commodity. Anyone who wants a degree can get a degree. And of course, that gutted the TAFE sector. So we've thrown all this money into the university sector at the expense of the TAFE sector. Now let me get this very straight, and I want this on record. This country was built by the battlers. It wasn't built by the blowhards. And you've got to put your primary industries in front of your secondary industries in front of your tertiary industries. And we've got to get people back in those workshops, back in the manufacturing sector, uh, back on the farms, and value adding our primary production. That's where we've got to go back to. And the way to do that is to cut taxes. And, and that is something that the uh, coalition government has a proud record on. I tell you, and, and also not shut the economy down. And you know they, they like to bag us out, the co former coalition government, for the so-called money that we spent. Well, let, let me assure you that before the COVID crisis had broken out, we had balanced the budget. In 2018-19, the budget was balanced for the first time in a number of decades since actually the prior uh, coalition government. But what happened was what we had were the state premiers. Okay, just wrecking 
the economy. Now, you know, I disagreed with the, Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister on this, but he tried to set up a national cabinet in the best interests of the country. And the country was sabotaged by Labor premiers who continually locked down, who continually ran a free fear program, who continually wanted to throw more money, even when we pulled Job Seeker. Labor, the Labor opposition at the time, now Labor government, wanted to keep spending money. Wanted to keep spending money, keep it going. And this is the sad thing, and they're still going to pursue spending more money. They're going to drop $20 billion on building transmission lines for all these unreliables that aren't going to go you know, 24 hours a day. When the, you know, they're not going to work when the sun isn't shining or anything like that. If you want to get this country back on track, we need to invest in baseload energy. And that's why I'm so pleased that the opposition leader, uh, uh, the member for Dixon, um, has now looked at, uh, you know, has now said the coalition will also look into nuclear as well, and that's a fantastic idea. We can have uh, coal as well as nuclear as well as gas, because with cheap, reliable um, energy, that is how we will power this country. But going forward, I'm still yet to hear anything about uh, what the RBA does as well. And this was another big stuff up uh, by the former Prime Minister Paul Keating when he actually gave RBA the independence. Anyone that has followed monetary policy as closely as I have for the last 30 years would know that the, all the RBA governors basically graduated from university and started work at the RBA. They are hoodwinked by RBA groupthink. They are more focused on inflation, and it is the tail that wags the dog. Because let me tell you this. When you, if you got washed up on a desert island, would you either A, go to the bank, or B, look to control the means of production? And I'll tell you what you'd look to do. You'd look to control the means of production. You wouldn't go, oh, well, we can't build any infrastructure because we might have too much inflation. No. No, 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 no. What we would do is we would go out, we would develop, and we would actually start building, which is what we need to do. What, you should be listening to this, Senator Wong. I'm happy to you know, walk you through it because I know, you know it's a bit of baby steps with you at the moment. Um, but I'm more than happy we have to build. You guys have got to build if you want to get this economy back on track. Well, um, would you like me to get him to withdraw? Uh, uh, Senator Gregory. Thank you. Um, I also uh, rise to uh, respond to the answers from Senators Gallagher and Farrell. Um, I find it interesting the constant referral to the fact that the questions aren't being answered when just a brief um, cursory glance at the transcript shows quite clearly that there are plenty of answers coming, just maybe not sufficient listening occurring to understand those answers and then perhaps ask some further questions that may have a bit more um, relevance than what we have maybe seen today. Now, I will say that. Labor has a comprehensive fiscal plan. The Albanese Labor government has come forward with a comprehensive plan in a time of extreme uncertainty. We come in on the back of nine long years of rorts and wrecking, and our plan will start to give the country hope and start to turn that around into a productive economy and into further and better opportunities for the people of Australia. We have been clear with our approach to the October budget. We have been clear about the work that is going to be undertaken to review the waste and the warts that have been occurring over the last nine years and that are evident in the March budget. And we will trawl through that to find those warts, to find that waste and to get rid of them. And we will deliver on savings and we will invest then in the productive side of the economy. We will actually look to build things for the future, to build a pathway for the future in our manufacturing, in other industries that we know are critical to the future of Australia. Rather than what we have seen from the current opposition when they were in government, where they borrowed more, they oversaw a significant decline in productivity, they spent more, they taxed more. And we've seen this over the last almost decade. But our plan to invest in the productive side of the economy will show that hope and will show that future pathway. We will address the skills and training shortages. And that is going to start right now. 
Those conversations are on foot right now. And the Jobs and Skills Summit in September, 1st and 2nd of September, will see that conversation, that open, transparent and clear conversation, consulting with the critical people for whom this impacts and for whom will take it forward. That includes the community, that includes business, that includes the unions, that includes the skills and training providers, the people who will make a difference as we build a productive future for Australia. We have procurement and co-investment strategies that will help business invest in those industries of the future that will build a better future for everyone in Australia. And we have a clear plan for cheaper, better energy. Yes, we will indeed look at the transmission lines. And no, it is not a waste. These are the things that are going to ensure that we have an efficient and effective energy system into the future. We will look at developing further renewable energy because that is the way of the future. And it is cheaper. We just need to stop having these attacks on areas where we know that renewables are cheaper. We know that for a fact, and we know that there is a pathway to get them fully implemented into the system. And if you were to go down the path of nuclear energy, what are you going to do for the next umpteen years while you try to develop that system? We don't need those things. We need to look at what we have on hand right now. And that is renewable energy as the cheapest, best way forward for the country. And we have a plan to pursue that. In addition, we care deeply about the people of this country. We care deeply about the economic future of this country. And the budget that will be delivered in October will chart that pathway. We are in a really, really difficult situation created by the opposition the previous government over nine long, wasteful, rotting years. Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much. And look, it is fascinating to understand uh, in greater detail each day the difference between those on the other side and those on this side and their understanding of what makes an economy work, what makes cost of living pressures work, what makes uh, cost of electricity work. Uh, what are the levers of government that you can pull that make an economy successful? And it doesn't matter how many times are those opposites say, say words, it doesn't make them true. It just makes them tediously repetitive. What I want to talk to you about is what it's really like to run a business and run a nation, and how proud I am of the legacy that we have left of the last nine years one of only nine nations in the world to maintain a AAA credit rating following COVID, the greatest economic impact uh, financial shock on, uh, in the globe since the 1920s. How proud I am of the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. That means that people are at work in purposeful, meaningful work. Uh, that is incredibly important. Uh, we have left an economy that is ready to take, uh, take advantage of the, uh, the resources boom, the demand for Australia's uh, agricultural industry. Uh, we are poised to take advantage of all of that, and we'll just have to see uh, what Labor is going to do with the good fortune that they have been left with. Because the Treasurer has said that the point of his statement was to paint a picture of the economy. That is a gorgeous kind of description, but the economy is not an abstract painting. It requires a plan. It requires tough decisions uh, in tough circumstances. And so what we are facing now, the tough circumstances of today, are higher costs of living that are facing Australians. Uh, and so we know what that looks like. It looks like the pain for small businesses who are working 18 hours a day who are struggling with not being able to find workers to help them to do the jobs. And in regional Australia, that means deliver the services that make everybody else's lives possible. Families counting cents as they fill up the car, whether or not they will be able to have the children still enrolled in sport 
uh, if they're going to have to drive some distance to take them to training. Young Australians trying to build their first homes and students trying to create a better life for themselves. So the economy is not a mystery. The economy is made up of some very practical pieces. And I can tell you that the cost of power prices, the cost of power prices is one of the things that is crippling small business today, uh, right across the country. Uh, and I know that from the days of running my business, uh, there was just not enough margin left in it in order to be able to continue running the business uh, with the prices that we have today. Uh, that is terrifying because my business was providing food to families. Uh, these costs of power prices is something that we have to understand that the conversion to renewable energy takes time. It took 100 years for oil to come in and take over from the horse, horsepower, and yet we want to change our economy within 15 years. Uh, laugh if you will, but it's not a laughing matter for those people who are going to pay the cost of transmission lines, because renewable energy projects that are being built in my part of the world are not hooked up. They're not being hooked up to the power lines because they cannot take the intermittent power voltage that is the result of renewables. And so we don't even have reliable power now in Queensland in renewable places, and yet we're hooking up uh, solar farms and wind farms that are just rusting away because nobody bothered to figure out whether or not the Queensland government would ever plug them in. So that is why it is so important that we bring more gas supply to the market. We keep the electricity um, uh, reliable and dispatchable and a firmed energy system because it is not a laugh laughing matter, it is not a fantasy. Uh, we cannot change our energy supply as fast as those opposite would like to. I, I have no criticism of their aspirations, but we live in the world of the reality of where the absence uh, of reliable transmission lines, the absence of uh, firmed power, means that we will end up with no power at all. Uh, we won't end up with power to take ore out of the ground for the minerals that will reduce emissions. Thank you. Senator Hent, oh, sorry, I have to put the question first. I put the question to the, uh, to the motion moved by Senator Bragg. Those for the question say aye. Against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by uh, Senator Wong uh, to my questions in relation to the Murray Darling Basin plan and the 450 gigalitres that was uh, promised to South Australia is legally required under law to be delivered, and that to date only two gigalitres. Uh, has been uh, returned, uh, because, as we know, Mr. Acting, uh, Mr. Deputy President, that uh, under the last government, the Liberal National Go Government, there was a uh, desire to slow down, to sabotage, to stop that 450 gigalitres being delivered. There was never uh, a genuine commitment from the uh, Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison. Uh, government in relation uh, to uh, making sure South Australia uh, got that water or that the water was uh, made available uh, to save the river and to look after the environment. And I must say, Mr Deputy President, as a South Australian, uh, it is just absolutely galling to find out again uh, that it has been mismanaged so appallingly that money has been wasted, billions of dollars spent on bogus infrastructure projects. So the money has been poured down the drain, the water hasn't been uh, secured, and we are edging towards the deadline by which this plan is meant to be fulfilled. Uh, and we are now staring down the barrel of uh, this uh, plan being in breach of the law and South Australia and the lower reaches of the Murray uh, suffering as a result. And of course, um, this was failure by design, Mr Deputy President, failure by design uh, from those opposite uh, who were never, uh, never intended uh, to make sure that that water for the environment was secured. Uh, they're too interested in looking after the interests of their big corporate irrigator mates uh, than doing what is right 
uh, by everybody else, upstream, downstream, the small farmers and, of course, the environment and those of us who live at the end of the river system who desperately need uh, a living river, a healthy river, uh, for um, our own water supply. Now, it is now a challenge for the current government, the Labor government, who promised also to make sure uh, this water would be delivered in time and, I might add, Mr Deputy President, uh, in time and in full. Well, it is now a challenge to uh, the Labor government to get out there and start buying the water, because it is the only way uh, it is going to be secured. And I'm not a huge fan of the Productivity Commission, Mr Deputy President. I think from time to time they come up with some good ideas, uh, but their analysis on this, Mr Deputy President, is crystal clear. The Productivity Commission themselves have said over and over again that the most economically efficient, environmentally effective way to ensure this water is secured for South Australia and the survival of the river is to buy it. Is to buy it. But despite that advice, we still have, uh, after a decade, of minister after minister sitting on their hands and refusing to go into the market to buy off willing sellers and to return that water to the river. Well, the challenge is now on. After a decade of mismanagement and failure by design, water thieving, scratching the backs of their big corporate mates from the Liberal National Party, and let's not forget when Mr Barnaby Joyce was water minister, it was his great big idea to make sure that this plan would fail. We now have a challenge to the current government that they have a responsibility to fix it, and the, time, and the clock is ticking. So I've heard the response from the minister today, and I welcome it. The voluntary buybacks uh, are, are on the table. Uh, well, don't wait any longer. Get out there now and start buying the water, because we are running out of time. We need the water bought, secured and delivered, because our River Murray is the lifeblood of our nation's food bowl. It is the lifeblood, uh, particularly in South Australia. And if uh, the Labor Party uh, wish to continue uh, to hold that new seat that they have in South Australia, the seat of Boothby, then bet your bottom dollar they're going to have to make sure they secure that water for South Australia and they secure it now. I'm going to put the motion as moved by Senator Hanson Young. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? I'm taking that as a no. Um, I shall now proceed to the uh, placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Oh, I nearly called you, Senator McLaughlin. Um, no, I call the clerk. Postponement notification has been lodged from Senator Hanson Young for general business notice of motion 13 for today to the 5th of September. Thank you. Um, we're now. Uh, I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Um, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. And I'll move to um, business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator Antic. Senator Antic. Thank you, thank you, Madam President. I ask that business of the Senate no notice of motion number one be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Antic. I move the motion. So the question. Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Waters. Thanks, President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Thank Waters. Thank you, President. The Greens support increased transparency. And we believe that people should know who is influencing the decisions made by their representatives. But this pro proposal doesn't seek more transparency about politicians' relationships with all groups, only some groups. It doesn't seek disclosure of senators' relationships with religious groups or industry lobby groups. No, it's just another in a very long line of thinly veiled attacks on charities and the not-for-profit sector. 
The previous government consistently tried to silence the voices of organisations fighting in the public interest, whether they be refugee advocates, environmental groups, welfare organisations. They threatened the tax deductibility of environmental charities. They cut funding to NGOs. They gagged charities from engaging in public debate. They tied charities up in red tape. They tried and thankfully failed to remove charitable status of organisations involved in protests against unconscionable laws. So this motion isn't about transparency. If you were actually serious about that, you'd be calling for donations reform and stopping the revolving Thank door you, that Senator would set Waters, people like you up for a future. Expired. The question is: A motion is moved by Senator Antic be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the uh, uh, the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. Order. So the question is that business of the Senate, notice of motion number one, 
Moved by Senator Antic be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Ciccone as teller for the noes. There being 32 ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I believe our business of the Senate number two is to be debated later. Um, so I'll now move to uh, government business three to five and call Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. President, I ask that Government Business Notice of Motions No. 3 to 5 proposing the reference public works to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works be taken together as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call uh, Senator Gallagher. Thank you, President. I move the motions and I table statements in relation to the works. Order, Senators. If you're not participating in the debate, please uh, leave the chamber. So the question is that the motion is moved by uh, Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Um, we now move to general business notice of motion number six, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I, President, I ask that government business notice of motion number six be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Gallagher. Thank you, President. I move that the following bill be introduced: a bill for an act to amend the law relating to health and for related purposes. 
So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, thank you. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is that the uh, motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Bill for enactment, the law relating to health and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, thank you. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Uh, there being no objection, leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order uh, 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 5 September 2022. We now move to general business. Um, we will start with general business. Notice of motion number 10, standing in the name of Senator Macdonald. Senator Macdonald. I inform the chamber that Senators Green, McGrath, Roberts and Dean Smith uh, will also sponsor the motion. I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 10 relating to the establishment of a joint select committee on Northern Australia before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Macdonald. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that being taken as formal? There being none, um, we'll now move the Senator Macdonald. The motion as amended. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Macdonald and others be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We now move to general business notice of motion number 13, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young. Aye. Postpone. That's postpone. Oh yes, of course, sorry. Um, we now move to general business notice of motion number 14, standing in the name of Senator Rennick. Senator Rennick. I ask that general business notice of motion number 14 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Rennick. Uh, I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Rennick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the noes have it. The noes have it. Um, uh, Senator Rennick, if you want... Uh, Okay, we'll put it again. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 14, standing in the name of Senator Rennick, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Wouldn't... <laughs> we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 15, uh, standing in the name of Senator Hanson, who's not here, will move on. We'll now move to general business notice of motion number 17, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith. Madam Deputy President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 17, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the matter being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Dean Smith. Uh, Madam President, I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and veterans' entitlements and for related purposes. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Dean Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Smith. Bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read at first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Dean Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the I, just a moment. I calling the clerk. Bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and veterans entitlements and for related purposes. Senator Smith. This bill be now read a second time and seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, um, Senator Dean Smith. And in accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 5th of September 2022.
Senator Roberts on um, general business 18. Yes, we'll go back to 15. Thank you. I ask that uh, general business notice of motion number 15 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Roberts. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Roberts on behalf of Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. And we'll now go to general business notice of motion number 18. President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 18 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Roberts. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by, moved by Senator Roberts, standing in the name of Senator Hanson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 19, standing in the name of uh, Senator Barbara Pocock. Senator Barbara Pocock. I ask that general business notice of motion number 19 to establish a, a select committee, a Senate Select Committee on Work and Care, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Barbara Pocock. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Pocock be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to the matter of um, public importance. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 35 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Fawcett. Dear President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The need for the government to adopt immediate action to ease the pressure on cost of living for Australian families and small business. Um, I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly and I call... No, no. Oh yes, speak your pardon. Uh, is it... Yes, it's supported. Thank you. And I'm calling Senator Fawcett for five minutes, I believe. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, I do rise to talk about this matter of public importance because whilst the cost of living pressures uh, can be traced back in many cases to international affairs, and I think it's important to acknowledge that up front, and many countries around the world are struggling with the crises, for example, in Ukraine, that are causing pressures. There are two important things that people should consider when they look at the response of a government. Part of that goes to how governments design their economy, the long-term frameworks and measures they put in place. But the other question that people should ask is what are the governments doing in the short term that will ease pressures in terms of cost of living? So the coalition uh, in its time in government took a number of actions, and people have seen those with cost of living uh, support for pensioners and veterans and others. Uh, easing things like the cost of fuel, uh, a number of measures, particularly around employment and training. Because one of the clear indicators is that people who have a job, who have the skills, uh, find it easier to cope with the pressures of cost of living. And a lot of Australians, uh, it has to be acknowledged, are doing it incredibly tough uh, at the moment, particularly with the rising interest rates, which are impacting on those who uh, are seeking to purchase a home, uh, but also for those people who are in the rental market and struggling to afford rents uh, and struggling to afford bills, whether they be food bills, uh, other cost of living bills. And so the two questions we should ask is, what is the government actually doing? Well, the coalition government recognised that jobs are really important to help people. And that's why, despite the rhetoric we've heard in this place over the last couple of days, which is all about rewriting history and trying to claim there's been a crisis 
for example, in training and apprenticeships and work, uh, it's really important to see that, as of last year, there were more apprentices in training in Australia than since 1963. I made this point yesterday in a brief contribution. Because the investment, the $6.4 billion that's been invested in skills and training is a record amount, and it's had real outcomes in terms of training. Specific measures, for example, where employers were struggling with the concept of retaining apprentices in the face of both rising costs, but also the crisis that COVID brought about, when other nations were actually laying off apprentices, Australian apprenticeships grew. Why did they grow? Because the government took positive measures to put in place support for employers to the value of 10 per cent of an apprentice's wage and then in the second year 5 per cent. And what it's meant is that employers have been able to take on apprentices and keep them on, and we've seen completion rates increase. And so those very tangible real measures that are responsive in real time to the pressures people are facing uh, definitely help. The other thing that I would like to highlight is that we took some very positive measures to support industry, particularly the Modern Manufacturing Initiative, to bring back manufacturing here in Australia. And so we got co-investment from industry, investment from the taxpayer in the areas of space and defence, uh, things like critical minerals, medical products, advanced manufacturing, so that employers had the confidence to invest in productive capacity, invest in new intellectual property, invest in employing people, giving people the jobs which helps them to cope with the rising costs. And so when we compare that approach to responding to a crisis to the approach of this government, the reason it's so important to look at what the government is doing or not doing is that on the job side, they're planning a talk fest. We're not talking about supporting employers. We're not talking about support small businesses need to move ahead and employ people or keep them on the books. The big ticket item is a talk fest. On the manufacturing front, I'm being approached by people in Adelaide from the defence and space sector who are concerned that the Razor Gang, the budget cut gang from the Albanese government, has put modern manufacturing grants that were awarded by the coalition on hold, which puts in doubt these projects which have been the basis for companies to expand and look at giving people those jobs. So as we look at the cost of living, we need this government to act now on things that will enable people to cope with the high cost of living through having a job. Oh, sorry, Senator Sheldon. Acting Deputy President. Well, this is amazing. An MPI, <laughs> we've had now two weeks of really, I mean, it's been said before, but it's actually worth saying again, leading with your chin. I mean, this is a government, previous opposition, now an opposition, a government when they were in power, that turned around and saw the crunch on standard state of living for Australians, hardworking Australians, collapse. We saw for the first time in the history of this country the middle class shrunk under these people. That's what happened. Working people, wages declined under their watch. And as they said quite clearly, that was part of their inherent strategy on how they were going to move forward in making sure the economy is more successful. But for who? For hard-working Australians? No, of course not. Now, quite clearly, in the cost of living crunch, we had nine years of the Liberal government. We had the worst period for wages growth in Australia's history. When the Liberals left office, real wages were actually lower than they were when they entered office in 2013. And they want to stand here and give everyone else a lesson, a lesson about how to do it wrong, because that's the consequence of what that, the opposition did when they were in government. Just today, I heard from Toby Priest, who was a casual academic at Flinders University and a member of the National Tertiary Education Union. Toby made headlines a few months ago when he was the test case for the previous government's failed casual conversion clause. And of course, why do they want people to be casuals? Why don't they want them converted? Because that's how you keep wages suppressed. That's how you stop wages actually increasing. And Toby had worked at Flinders, Uni Flinders University for 16 years as a casual. 
16 years. He wanted a conversion to a permanent part-time position. He said, and I quote, there's constant uncertainty. I'm a father of three teenage kids and I work really hard and have pride in my job. I just want to be permanent. But the university refused to give it to him, so he went to the Fair Work Commission. And here is what the Fair Work Commission ruled in May. I'll read from the media coverage at the time. The industrial umpire upheld the university's stance that higher pay and a professional pathway was too much to ask of his employer. Now that's how weak the former government flaws are. In an area and in an industry where we need to have people encouraged, platforms and programs and arrangements to make sure that they're encouraged to be working in these vital industries. And you can keep people on insecure work for decades at a time because you don't want to pay them fairly under the, the previous government. That's their program. That was their intention. And you wonder why we've had record low wages growth under the former government. Well, Toby called today and said Flinders University have now reclassified his classes with the effect that he'll now only be paid two-thirds of what he earned before for the exact same work. Because that's the environment they encouraged under their watch. That's the opposition's plan for the future. That's the opposition's plan for the last nine years, and it hasn't changed. A third of his pay gone, just months after he was locked into casual work forever by the last government. That sums up the problem we have in this economy. And I've got a message for Flinders University. Under the Liberals, you're allowed to cut wages and keep people forever casual contracts. In fact, the Liberals encouraged it, as we've seen. But this is a new government, and we expect better from our universities. You are funded through federal funding, and we'll be looking very closely at the way federally funded entities behave towards their workers. That's essential. Now let's move to another area of high exploitation, under this government's watch, where they did nothing the gig economy. Now, we know that the Select Committee on Job Security heard that gig workers earn as little as $6.67 an hour. No workers' comp, no sick leave, no annual leave, and providing all their, all their own tools of trade with no compensation. Former Attorney General Christian Porter said it was too complicated to provide those workers with minimum standards. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Another recipe for driving wages down. But the real kicker was the former Attorney General, uh, the former sorry, Senator Stoker, went even further. And she said if people only earn $6.67 an hour, then that's okay. Because what she said, that's what they signed up for. Well, let's just go back to the 1800s. Just, let's, 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 let's just take, it, take this whole thing and just pretend, stop pretending, because that's what the government was doing, and that's what they're trying to do, the previous government, what they tried to do, and hence under the gig economy. But even Uber and DoorDash now have come out and said that we need minimum standards, signing agreements with the Transport Workers Union supporting labour policy. A food delivery worker, Esteban Salazar, told the job security inquiry, I don't have a minimum wage for an hour which meant that at the end of the day I have earned $15 after six hours of standing outside in the cold and rain. Now let's look at some other areas. Feminised industries like the care industry. 90 per cent of aged care workers are on casual or part-time contracts with little or no guaranteed hours. Worse still, gig platform workers like Mabel are infiltrating aged care and the NDIS paying below the minimum award wage. This gov the previous government turned around and funded Mabel to have their exploitive model further enhanced through the NDIS and the aged care system. Now, just today I spoke with two aged care workers with the United Workers Union who shared their stories about the horrid conditions of work they endure. Grace Gabley, a 24-year-old care worker said to me, and I quote, I get paid so little working in aged care that I also have to work in the retail sector. I earn more for working in retail than aged care, but what keeps me in aged care is my heart. 
That's all. It's my demanding, emotion, it's demanding emotionally and pays less. It's also clear, she went on to say, the management just doesn't care and the aged care system is broken. I don't know that this is, a sustainable, this is sustainable for me. I get very emotional even talking about it. And Glenda Jensen, another aged care worker, told me earlier today, and I quote, most people I know are stuck doing low minimum hour contracts, but then they constantly work excessively long days, day after day after day, to make up the shortfall in numbers. Because less and less people want to work in aged care, you end up having to platform, perform a range of roles outside of your main job of being a carer. It all just piles up. It's too much. Now, the experience of these workers in aged care, in higher education, in the gig economy are emblematic examples of the problems faced by workers across the economy. Like Renee McBride, a TAFE nursing teacher I met with earlier today as well, who told me, I worked for eight and a half years as a casual teacher. I won a scholarship. This is the real, this is the real clangor. I won a scholarship from the New South Wales Premier, Gladys Perichiklian, for the quality of my work, and yet I had all of my hours taken away from me when I had finished my arrangements for that scholarship. We are in the sector, she said, where 70 per cent of the workforce is casual. That means people can't get mortgages, can't get home loans. I've recently got permanent work, but now I have to spend hours each day driving to get to my job. I'm a single parent with two kids. It's exhausting. And it's exhausting because the previous government allowed a culture of the bottom was always the best. Wages suppressed, casual jobs, no job security, can't get home loans, can't look after your family, can't look after yourself, and it was all part of the model that they encouraged in this economy. One thing's very clear, that we're going to make a change to that. Now, I just want to say, you know, it's in some areas where you know, this sort of money's rolling, frankly, and it's literally rolling, in the casino in Canberra. Brian Kidman said to me earlier today, I was disciplined for raising concerns about workers' rights at the casino in a newspaper interview. I was speaking as a union delegate during a prospective sale of the casino, and I should not have been targeted the way I was. I went to the Human Rights Commission and the Civil and Ministry of Appeals Tribunal, which found in my favour, but it was a terrible thing to go through. He later told me that the company in the negotiations for an enterprise bargaining agreement Senator said Sheldon, if your time has expired. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, uh, we are indeed <coughs> in a cost of living crisis in Australia. And it's worth pointing out that that crisis is making life much, much harder for an ever-increasing number of Australians. And there are <clears throat> many reasons for uh, this crisis, and inflation is certainly one of those reasons. And the Greens absolutely accept that some of the reasons that we uh, are seeing such a spike in inflation in Australia are international issues. But it is worth pointing out that one of the reasons, one of the international reasons or the global reasons that we are seeing pressure come on to prices is because of climate change. And this government, this Labor government, is one of the most fossil fuel addicted governments in the world. They want to open up 114 new coal or gas developments in Australia. And the Greens will fight them all the way on every single one of those proposals. But domestically, in terms of pressures on inflation, we cannot have this discussion without accepting the role that corporate profiteering is having on driving prices up in this country. And it's worth everyone in this place understanding that when you overlay climate change on top of 40 years plus of turbocharged neoliberalism in this country, you are starting to see our very social fab fabric being torn. 
and the social contract that keeps us in the main as a peaceful and coherent society is starting to crack. And if you can't feel it cracking under your feet now, colleagues, I can only say to you, you are not paying enough attention because that social contract is starting to crack. And unless we actually take action on things like the breakdown of our climate, unless we take action on things like the sixth mass extinction event in the history of our planet, unless we start to reverse the turbocharged neoliberalism in this country, where people who are deliberately left without work, deliberately left without work in an attempt to suppress wages, are forced into poverty and, and starvation in some cases. Unless we address those things, the social fabric will continue to crumble. Because there used to be an understanding in this country that if you, got, uh, if you worked hard, got yourself a good education and a job, a reasonable job, that you could actually prosper and get ahead and make a good life for yourself and your family. Through collective bargaining, through industrial action, workers demanded and won better pay and conditions. Governments built public housing and they provided a roof over the heads of people who could not afford homes of their own. But that understanding, that social contract between the people and the government is being taken apart piece by piece by the neoliberal parties in this place. And for young people in particular, hard work matters far, far less than the wealth of their parents. And we are seeing the new class divisions in this country. And that, those class divisions are whether or not you own property. You own property, you're doing very nicely, thank you very much, and you have been for decades. If you don't own property or your parents don't own enough property to bequeath to you at some stage in your life, you are condemned. That's the new class divide in this country. We've got wages flatlining. We've got the Treasurer up in the House just last week saying to Australians, brace for your real wages to fall. And the cost of renting is skyrocketing. The, the cost of buying a new home is skyrocketing. This is a rigged game and it's rigged in favour of the super wealthy, the billionaires and those who profit from the big corporations. What governments have done is design a system where the only hope of social advancement is through property investment and now that ladder is being pulled away as well by uh, rampant interest rate rises from an RBA governor who told people that rates wouldn't rise until 2024 and know those people who believed him and bought a home are getting smashed because they believed the RBA governor. Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I too rise to make a contribution on the MPI today. The need for the government to adopt immediate action to ease pressure on cost of living for Australian families and small businesses. Um, and Deputy President, it is a little ironic that if you Google the Australian Labor Party's website, the first three words that you'll see as it pops up on the screen are actually a better future. If you then explore it a little further, this is what it says. Anthony Albanese and Labor have a plan for a better future. Australians deserve a leader who is not afraid to roll up their sleeves and do the hard work needed to get things done. It then says this. The Anthony Albanese government is focused on tackling the spiralling cost of living that is making life tough for too many Australians. Then you click into the Power in Australia policy. And despite the fact that one of their first actions as a government was to actually completely backtrack on a commitment they took to the election, which was, and I quote, Labor will cut power bills for families and businesses by $275 a year for homes by 2025 compared to today, that is actually still on the Australian Labor Party's website. It's a little strange because what they state is 
They are focused on tackling the spiralling cost of living that is making life tough for far too many Australians. So what you have is an admission by the Labor government that there is a spiralling cost of living. You have an admission by the Labor government that it is making life tough for Australians, but then you have a failure, a failure to actually back these admissions in with any sort of plan. And what we saw yesterday just adds, adds to the increasing cost of living pressures that Australian families and small businesses are now facing. Without a doubt, it was a tough day yesterday for the around 3.5 million families that have a mortgage. And we saw the minister representing the Treasurer today when asked how much more you know, the average family would be paying on the average mortgage. It was quite dismissive, a couple of hundred bucks. Well, a couple of hundred bucks actually means a lot for families across Australia. A couple of hundred bucks actually means a lot for small businesses out there, in particular when that figure is not just a couple of hundred bucks, it's a couple of hundred bucks month after month after month. In fact, Australians with an average mortgage of $610,000, they will soon pay over $500 more per month on their repayments than they were since May. So when you look at what the Australian Labor Party under Anthony Albanese says, they have a plan for a better future. They acknowledge that there is a spiralling cost of living. They acknowledge that this spiralling cost of living is making life tough for Australians. You would actually think that when asked a question in the Australian Parliament, they would be able to clearly articulate what their plan is to tackle these spiralling costs of living. And yet there isn't one. The government actually has no plan, despite being in opposition for nine years. They come into government and they have no plan to address the cost of living pressures. That should disappoint all Australians, all Australians who, if you've got a mortgage, you're going to be paying more. See the interviews that were conducted with Australians in the streets today. I mean, some of them actually saying, I now have to choose between whether I spend money on food so I can eat or whether or not I pay my mortgage. And what does the Australian Labor Party say? Well, in the first instance, they blame the former government. Well, the bad news is you are now in office. They walk away from their election commitment to actually cut power bills by $275 compared to what they were to, um, when they came into office. People actually listened to that promise. They listened to it and they said, I actually like it and I'm going to vote for it. And Labor have already broken that promise to the Australian people. They also have no plan, as I've said, to address the immediate cost of living pressures. One of the ways that you could address the immediate cost of living pressures has been put forward by the opposition leader in Peter Dutton, and he's been very, very upfront. If Mr Albanese and Labor want to adopt this plan, we would actually welcome them to do that. And that is, of course, our policy so that older Australians can keep more of what they earn. You have a government that says we are focused on tackling the increasing or the spiralling cost of living pressures that is making life tough for Australians. You have a government that does not have a plan. But you have an opposition leader in Peter Dutton who, within but a few weeks of being the opposition leader, releases a policy that will actually help older Australians keep more of what they earn. And he says to the Labor government, we would welcome it, we would welcome it if you adopted this policy. Why? Because it's a sensible policy. It's been welcomed by stakeholders, in particular those stakeholders, small businesses, 
who are facing a battle to get more people to work at the moment with the skill shortage. The change itself, of course, would make it more worthwhile for old Australians to pick up an extra shift or work extra hours. It is a plan that would help small businesses and regional businesses deal with labour shortages, and we know, in particular in certain industries, employers in small businesses, in fact in all businesses, but in particular in small businesses, they cannot find staff. If Mr Albanese and Labor were to adopt the policy put forward by opposition leader Peter Dutton, this would ensure that thousands of jobs across hospitality, agriculture, tourism and the retail market they remained open. And as I've said, Peter Dutton, the opposition leader, has been very, very upfront. He is more than happy for Mr Albanese to adopt this problem because we actually want Labor. We actually want Labor to have a plan. They have a recognition that there is the spiral in cost of living pressures. They have a recognition that you know, Australians are doing it tough. We only saw yesterday the increase the increase in the interest rates, and as I said, average mortgage $610,000. It means the average family, month after month, you are now going to be paying $500 more. And then you have a policy that you could adopt that would actually go directly to ensuring that you do have a plan, or at least part of a plan, that would address the spiralling cost of living and that would address in particular what is making life tough at the moment for so many Australians. This is a well-targeted policy. It is a well-targeted policy that is designed to increase labour supply. It is designed to ease workplace shortages, and we all know there are workplace shortages, but also to put downward pressure on inflation and interest rates. What have we heard from the Labor government so far? Well, absolutely nothing. So, Deputy President, or Acting Deputy President, what we do have, though, before us is a government that, as I said, it tells Australians, tells Australians that by voting for them you'd get a better future. It tells Australians it acknowledges there's a spiralling cost of living issue. It tells Australians we know that you're doing it tough. But then when they're questioned on what are you going to do now? Substance. What are you going to do now? What is the substance of your plan? Today we saw Senator Gallagher, Minister Gallagher, stand up. She held up a few bits of paper and said, well, here is our plan. As I said, that is a great shame for the Australian people who actually are doing it tough. <laughs> Senator Stewart. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the matter of public importance in relation to the cost of living for Australian families and small business, and I am delighted to do so. I am proud to be standing with my Labor colleagues who are on this side of the chamber actually being honest with the Australian people about the economic and cost of living challenges we are facing as a nation. I'm also proud to be standing up as a part of an Albanese Labor government who has a real plan, an ep economic plan that recognises these issues, many of which were totally ignored, sugar-coated, swept under the carpet or neglected after wasted nine years under the previous coalition government. Nine years of mess cannot be cleaned up in nine weeks. It will take time. Australians know this, but it appears that the opposition do not. In very stark contrast, we have committed to building a fairer economy and a better future for all Australians. But as we embark on this important work, unlike the former Liberal government, we must start by being open, honest and transparent with the Australian people about our current economic circumstances. This doesn't happen by hiding reports in cupboards or changing regulations so, so until after the election. It starts by, with transparency and integrity. President, Acting Deputy President, as outlined by the Treasurer Jim Chalmers on the 28th of July through his ministerial statement on the economy, Australians know their government has changed hands 
at a time of instability, uncertainty and volatility around the world and at home. However, Australians also know that the former government's approach has already given our country a wasted decade of missed opportunities and messed up pri priorities, and everyday Australians are picking up the bill. Australians are already paying too much for that in the form of high and rising inflation, falling real wages, a trillion dollars of debt that will take generations to pay off without a generational dividend to accompany it. And as Australia continues to outperform much of the world, we know that this doesn't make it any easier for families to pay the bills at home. But whether it be in relation to inflation or real wages, the Albanese Labor government's economic plan will respond to the growing pressures left by our predecessors on the economy. We acknowledge the impact that high inflation is having on people's living standards. Families see this every day, whether it be at the supermarket, in pay packets, through interest rates or when the electricity bill arrives. In an environment where workers for many years have not been getting the wage rises sufficient to match price rises, the Albanese Labor government is proud to stand with workers to secure better wages. But in contrast, during their wasted nine years, what did the coalition do while in office when it came to prudent spending and financial management to help keep inflation contained? What did they do to actually help? The fact is the previous government have a lot to answer for when it comes to inflation. The coalition left us with a legacy of a trillion dollars in debt with literally nothing to show for it. The coalition wasted over $2 billion of taxpayer, taxpayer funding on French submarines that will now never be built, let alone delivered. And they treat the Australian people with such contempt that I think if they had actually got back into government, they would have told them that they were the super high-tech, invisible kind of submarines that we can expect to have delivered in our shores. The coalition allocated $660 million towards their car park rorts program, with numerous projects revealed to have been announced via press release, not assessed, undercosted, and with many projects subsequently shelved. The coalition spent almost $30 million on a piece of land for the new Western Sydney Airport, which was only estimated to have been valued at $3 million. Tens of millions of dollars on blatant pork barrelling through sports rorts and regional rorts and grant programs, all guided by colour-coded spreadsheets. So when the coalition talk about the cost of living, inflation and financial management, they do so with a record that is tainted in mismanagement and no credibility, and with a record that actually fuelled inflation. The coalition should be ashamed that they were in government. They were a government that spent more, borrowed more and delivered less than any other government in Australia's history. In very stark contrast, Labor's economic plan will provide for a deliberate and direct response to the growing pressures left for us in the economy. When it comes to the cost of living, we must also talk about real wages. And when it comes to real wages, I'm proud to be part of an Albanese Labor government that supports workers to secure fair pay rises. Just today, my office was proud to welcome a delegation from the ACTU consisting of workers who are grateful and thankful for Labor's position on supporting real wage growth. And just last week, I was proud to have met with a delegation from the Transport Workers Union in their efforts to, to, to um, get safe rates across the transport industry. And on this side of the chamber, we don't just talk about it, we take action. Many of you may recall the pre-election commitment made by Anthony Albanese, who committed to our government making a submission to the Fair Work Commission to support a, raise, a rise in the minimum wage. I'm sure it sticks in everyone's mind because everyone can remember that dollar coin that he held up at almost every press conference. An announcement that was met with absolute opposition and outrage by the Liberals, who never have and never will stand on the side of working people. Yet they have the gall to move an MPI in this chamber calling on the Labor government to take immediate action to ease the cost of living, <laughs> while at the same time they oppose and continue to oppose every effort to rise wages for real working people. 
This is particularly the case for the transport sector. Rather than stand with the transport workers to maintain good wages, conditions and road safety measures, the Liberal, Liberal National Coalition government in 2016 chose to dismantle the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal, the very measure designed to keep our roads safe and workers paid fairly. Shame, hypocrisy and disgrace from those opposite. Every time they're in government, they attack workers. Whether it be work choices under John Howard, abandoning our proud Victoria autom automotive manufacturing sector under Tony Abbott, or excluding Donata transport workers from JobKeeper, workers are always under attack by the Liberals. And when it comes to real wages, the former coalition government also did nothing to help workers secure fair pay rises. Under the coalition government, real wages growth over the past decade has averaged just 0.1 per cent. Under the last 12 months of the Morrison government, real wages went substantially backwards. Any grade prep can tell you that when you've got a cost of living, cost of living rising by 3.5 per cent in 2021, and wages rising just by 2.3 per cent, that's a pay cut. Good secure work should pay the bills, but for too many, it's simply not the reality. There are 1.7 million Australians either unemployed or looking for more hours. Real wage growth relies on moderating inflation and getting wages moving again. Based on current forecasts, real wages are expected to start growing again in 2023-2024. And there is a key difference now. Australian workers now have a Labor government with an economic plan to boost wages, not to deliberately undermine them. Another issue Labor is serious about tackling, which the Liberals did nothing about, is the gender pay gap for women. Our country has a gender pay gap that sits at 13.8 per cent. And for First Nations women, when you compare that to non-Aboriginal men, it sits at 32.7 per cent. This government, an Albanese Labor government, will lead a national push to help close the gender pay gap and increase the pay for women, for women workers, particularly in caring jobs, by strengthening the ability and capacity of the Fair Work Commission to order pay increases for workers in low-paid, female-dominated industries, legislating so large companies will have to report their gender, gender pay gap publicly, prohibiting pay secrecy clauses and giving employees the right to disclose their pay if they want to, taking action to address the gender pay gap in the Australian public service. Labor's economic plan is a deliberate and direct response to the growing pressures left for us in the economy, beginning with budget repair so the trillion dollars of debt, waste and mismanagement doesn't grow bigger and bigger for future generations. The PM says we've got two ears and one mouth for a reason. So maybe those opposites should listen a little bit more when I say this. We're going to strengthen Medicare, create secure jobs, we're going to make childcare cheaper, we're going to make more things here in Australia because that's how you start to ease the cost of living pressures for Australian, Australian workers. They've done nothing but kick Australian workers when they are on their knees. We're a government that's going Senator to— Senator Stewart, your time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I speak to this matter of public importance, and it is a crucial and real matter of public importance. Well may a former assistant minister in the previous government debate the cost of living. This cost of living crisis, now facing everyday Australians and families and small businesses, rests on the shoulders of both sides of this chamber. For more than two years, the Liberal National Government and the then Labor Party opposition were on a unity ticket to conjure money through electronic ledger entries and spend for short-term electoral benefit. $500 billion was conjured up and spent on recurring government expenditure. These turned out to be handouts to Liberal, Nat Labor, National Party sponsors, much of which went into corporate profits, not job support. And now we have runaway inflation. And who pays for the government's mistakes, the Labor Party's mistakes? The people, as always. Let me be clear. It's possible to conjure up money through electronic journal entries and not create inflation. It's been done for centuries. In that case, the spending must be on something that will grow the economy, grow our productive capacity and absorb the extra money, like infrastructure. 
It's impossible to get the tired old parties or the new climate mafia to talk about important infrastructure projects like the Bradfield scheme, Copper String 2, Tully Millstream Hydro, Big Buffalo Dam, National Rail Circuit, the Boomerang Steel Project, amongst other One Nation priorities. Meanwhile, the climate mafia are setting out to destroy our standard of living through many ill-conceived policies not based on science, contradicting the evidence. Let me start with high electricity prices. Electricity prices are an input to business costs right through the production cycle, from the farmer running a cold room, to the manufacturer running a factory, to the wholesaler running a warehouse, to supermarkets trying to keep their fridges cold and their lights on. When the cost of electricity rises, the cost of everything rises. Food, clothing, hardware, consumer goods, even services. Energy. Optometrists, for example, in the services sector. Optometrists, hairdressers, solicitors. Pick a service, any service. All have electricity as a business expense. The cost of living is going up because the price of electricity is going up. Australian wholesale electricity prices are up 300 per cent in the last year. And the reason? Unsustainable, unreliable wind and solar, paying subsidies to billionaires and the Chinese Communist Party who are running these things. This is combined. They're the owners. The majority of large wind and solar complexes are owned by foreigners, including China and the Chinese Communist Party. Those who laugh are ignorant and condemned to suffer more. This is combined with manipulation of the energy market from unscrupulous energy companies that should never have been allowed to buy important infrastructure. National electricity market is actually a national electricity racket it's run by bureaucrats. It's not a market at all. The third element of higher electricity prices is the cost of transmission lines, poles and wires, to bring power from where the industrial solar and wind blights complexes are located to where the electricity is needed. Our immigration rate affects prices. The more new Australians that arrive, the more electricity, water, medical care and education they consume. These things are supply and demand. The more demand, the higher the price. Of course, governments can plan ahead and build out extra power generation, extra hospitals, extra dams and schools, but we don't. Long-term planning in Australian politics means the next election, or nowadays, in the last decade or so, it means the next budget. This is no way to run a country. When One Nation talks about reducing immigration to net zero, we mean bringing in around 100,000 new arrivals each year to balance out the 100,000 that left. Net zero is zero total immigration, easing the strain on infrastructure. This takes the pressure off our economy, reducing demand inflation and making the essentials of life cheaper. The climate mafia do not want to allow new dams and new electricity generation to be built, while at the same time wanting to bring in half the world as immigrants. Talk about inflation. You haven't seen anything yet. Agriculture is under threat. A 43 per cent carbon dioxide reduction means culling livestock and shutting down cropping, returning that land to nature in a process called rewilding. What they call rewilding, One Nation calls starving people. The less food that gets grown, the higher the price will be. One Nation will stop the madness and return Australia to good government. We are one community. We are one nation. Senator Roberts, your time has expired. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, this is the most pressing and important issue facing the country today. Uh, when I, when I travelled around during the election and since, uh, the most important issue facing Australians is the cost of living, is the living, cr crushing increases in living costs that have occurred over the past year. We've obviously seen this week uh, interest rates going up further. That is very, doing it very tough for those homeowners seeking to pay back their mortgages, and we have seen electricity prices go through the roof in the last few months, although most of that yet hasn't actually flown through to people's power bills. That will hit their, uh, hit their fridge magnets uh, later this year. It is very, very tough for Australians. We've seen stories of people having to bring in charcoal barbecues into their houses uh, to heat their homes and, and end up in hospital from carbon monoxide. Because of that, I've heard stories of families living in their cars because they can't afford their rent. There has to be action here to bring down the nation's living costs. Now, when the Albanese government was elected, when they were elected, I and all of us in Australia, and we, I'm sure those Australians who voted for them, thought they had a plan uh, to bring down the cost of living. They, they were loudly and proudly saying, we're going to bring down your electricity bills, we're going to help you with your, your, your living costs. Uh, Anthony Albanese said many times, uh, the Prime, our Prime Minister said many times on the election trail that he was going to slash 
people's power bills by $275 a year. He said it. Indeed, it was, there was a bit of scepticism whether he'd be able to deliver that. It was such a very bold and, and very precise promise, $275 a year. He was very confident about it. The media did question him on it and said, how do you know that? And he, he said, he said, I don't think I'm going to deliver it. I know I'm going to deliver it. He said that. He said that. He proudly put that on his Facebook page. You can go back and have a look on, the, on Anthony Albanese's Facebook page. He put up a post saying, I know that I'm going to save all Australians $275 a year off their electricity bills. Well, well, we learnt just weeks after the election that the Labor Party had dumped, dumped that promise, and they don't repeat it ever again. They're not mentioning that figure. There is no mention of $275 in the Governor-General's address last week. Instead of $275, uh, they said the Labor Party said or, or made the Governor-General say that I oh, will save families hundreds of dollars a year. A very vague, non-committal type uh, promise, um, which belies what they actually told the Australian people to get elected. Because, as I said, that was the most important issue for people. It's very, very tough right now uh, for families on fixed incomes. And they thought they were electing a government, a party, the Labor Party, to help them deal with these issues. But all they've got since is blame and distraction. Uh, it would be much better if the newly elected government came up with a plan to help people's living costs, came up with a clear idea about what they want to do. But we have seen through question time in these first two weeks all they have done is sought to tarnish those who came before them, sought to blame, sought to blame everything that's going on in this country and a government that's no longer in power. That is their only plan, their only response, seemingly. There has been, I'll give them fairness, has been the odd mention of childcare. Though we are apparently going to see uh, legislation to help people with childcare expenses later this year. But what they don't say, what the Labor Party don't say, is that those benefits, those childcare benefits, are, are, are massively skewed to high income earners. Massively skewed to high income earners. Indeed, modelling from the Department of Education showed that two families, one on $360,000 a year, then the other on $70,000 a year, that under Labor's proposals that they're apparently bringing forward in the coming months, under their proposals, the family on $70,000 a year would be get 85 per cent fewer benefits, lower benefits, than the family on $360,000 a year. The Australians listening to this would be gobsmacked that they have elected a so-called Labor Party that is providing massively more benefits to a family on $360,000 a year. I mean, good luck to the family on $360,000, but I don't think they need taxpayers' money to help them bring up their children. The family on $70,000, they deserve it, but they're not getting much from the Labor Party. They're not getting hardly anything. And so because the modern Labor Party has become the party of the rich, the elite, the well-educated and the well-connected, not those of the working classes who are suffering in this country right now, they deserve to have a voice in this place. They deserve to live in a country that is blessed with energy resources and have cheap energy. Why can't we give people cheap energy in this country? Well, we've got coal, we've got gas, we've got uranium. The other day, the other day when the Treasurer was pushed on this, he, he, he blamed Vladimir Putin. He said your energy bills are going up because of Vladimir Putin. Well, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. How come in a country where we have the best black coal in the world, we're the largest liquid nat liquefied natural gas exporter in the world, we have the largest uranium reserves in the world, how come Vladimir Putin stops us from getting cheap energy? I don't think it's Vladimir Putin that's stopping coal and gas companies getting ahead. I don't think it's Vladimir Putin that's putting forward radical climate legislation in this place that's going to push up people's power bills. It's about time this government gets back to basics and help people with their budgets, with their cost of living, rather than focusing on these trinkets, which will do nothing to help average Australians. Senator Cox. Thank you. I rise today to make a con contribution to this MPI on the cost of living pressures. In my home state of Western Australia, the rising cost of living is a huge issue. People are struggling every day with the cost of groceries, fuel, bills, rent and housing. Inflation in WA is the highest in the country, regardless of the uh, five billion surplus that we uh, got at our last budget, with Perth topping the capital cities at 7.4%. Uh, fresh, healthy food is more expensive than ever. And the latest ABS living cost indexes show that the cost of fruit and vegetables is increasing the most, and we all know the story about the lettuce. We, it's clear that we are facing cost of living and wages crisis, and WA families have never done it so tough. We know that rising rents and house stress are pushing households to the brink. Rent has increased by 9.1% in WA in just the last 12 months, 9.1 per cent in a 12-month period. So if you're on income support like JobSeeker or DSP, so on disability support pension, the rent is completely unaffordable 
and Anglicare's rental affordability snapshot for 2022 found that less than 1 per cent of available properties are affordable for people on income support payments. These rents continue to skyrocket alongside interest rates, which are squeezing people out of housing, uh, into housing insecurity and homelessness, while we are putting home ownership continually out of reach of young people. We need real solutions and we need them now. If this government wants to address the cost of, uh, of cost of living pressures, there are two things that they can do in the October budget. Because we on this side of the chamber, here in the Greens, we are solution focused. And firstly, the government could make childcare free. The government's promise to reduce childcare costs in July next year is simply too far away. Families need cost of living relief today, not in 2023. Secondly, the government could put dental into Medicare, and that will be delivering a real cost of living relief to everybody. Getting dental into Medicare, making childcare free, could save a family of four up to $7,000 per year. This would deliver real and immediate cost of living relief. These would be long-lasting change that would absolutely deliver the real relief to everyday people who are battling with high inflation, low wages and higher income. Uh, and, and incomes, better than the short-lived fuel excise that we've seen from uh, the oppo now opposition that could be wiped out by the profiteering petrol co corporations. These measures would mean people are better off not just right now, not just next month, but next year and the year after that. It's time for us to look for bold solutions to solve these cost of living crises. And when I was re-elected to this chamber, I assured the people of Western Australia that I would stand up for them here in Canberra. And why can't we axe the stage three tax cuts, which will deliver nothing for working families and those on minimum wages and who are absolutely struggling to make ends meet? Why can't we introduce a super profits tax that will tackle inflation and cost of, and cost of living um, pressures? Because the oil and gas companies of this place are making record profits. 96 per cent of the gas industry is foreign-owned. These corporations don't even pay royalties for the gas that they produce and export. So they're getting their produce for free. And I don't know any business in this country that gets their produce for free and sells it on and makes a profit from it. But these gas companies do, all the while while wrecking the planet. So these are the solutions that are going to relieve the cost of living crisis, and we need a government that are going to be bold enough to put this vision into practice. Thank you. Senator Steele, John. Hello. Oh. Hello. <laughs> thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Times right now, they are bloody tough. Cost of living pressures are unprecedented at the moment. Inflation is soaring at a rate we have not experienced in decades, and wages are stagnant and unlivable. Healthcare, education, housing, fuel, basic groceries all are increasingly out of reach for so many in our community. Now, for people of my generation, we have seen opportunities get scarcer and scarcer, life get harder and our entire worth determined by how much we can contribute to a capitalist system that does not work for us. And we are now in real time watching as things get worse while people get richer than us and sit back in their mortgage-free houses chastising us uh, for eating avo on toast. I've heard during the election campaign and for my entire time uh, here in this place from so many people in WA uh, who feel increasingly despondent, particularly young people, about what lies ahead of us. The decisions that are made in this place are setting young people up to fail. Young people are paying higher rent on average than ever before. 
and that is if we are even able to secure a rental in a ridiculously competitive market with fewer and fewer options for low-income earners every year. Many young people are staying in their family homes for much longer than we would like. Where this is not an option, young people are either relying on cramped, overpriced housing or wondering and whether uh, there will be a place for them in six months' time uh, with a roof over their head, or worrying whether their vindictive landlord will soon kick them out. Young people are experiencing negative mental health uh, impacts at higher rates than ever before at higher rates than any other age demographic. When we seek health support, we are so often confronted with a system that either doesn't have the capacity uh, to see us in a timely manner or simply costs too much. Young people are being forced to boycott or cut their studies short because constant fee hikes are creating huge hex debts that loom over our heads for decades. For most young people living in Australia right now, it is hard not to feel like we are being stretched in every direction. Now, where a solution uh, to this, all of these issues should be from this government, unfortunately, we have at the moment a bit of a howling void. The Greens, however, have a vision and a plan. Young people have shared with us clearly that they support our vision and plan to create university and TAFE free for all. They want to see higher education funded properly so that it is once again a place that is fun and that sets us up for, for our future, that does not saddle us uh, with insurmountable debt. We have a vision and a plan to solve the mental health crisis and the crisis in healthcare services. Uh, under, uh, that exists in our community at the moment by bringing mental health uh, fully into the Medicare system and doing this at the same time as we expand free dental coverage to every Australian everywhere in the country. And at the same time, we are proposing that one million affordable homes are built throughout our community and that rents are capped at affordable rates so that people know that they will be able to afford to keep a roof over their heads for themselves and their family members. These solutions are unashamedly bold and they are at the same time devilishly simple. When I've knocked on doors, when I've talked to people at unis and TAFEs and in high schools about our vision and plans, they have enthusiastically endorsed them, urged us to come to this place to make change and asked the questions why the major parties are not on board. Well, we have seen in these first two weeks the commitment to corporate power from the other side, a power we will continue to challenge in this place. The time for the discussion has expired, being five o'clock, if I could just have the Chamber's courtesy to pause for a few moments before we move to first speeches. Pursuant to order, I now call Senator Barbara Pocock to make her first speech and to ask senators that the usual courtesies be extended to her. I call Senator Barbara Pocock. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I pay my respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambi people, their elders, past and present, on whose land we meet. I pay my respects to all First Nations people in this place, and especially my fellow senators, uh, Dorinda and Lydia. I acknowledge that I and my forebears, 
immigrants, farmers from Scotland and England, arrived in this country 184 years ago and occupied land which First Nations people have lived on for tens of thousands of years. I grew up in the beautiful sandy paddocks, clay flats and scrub of Narkat country, 200 kilometres directly east of Adelaide, on a Mallee sheep and grain farm near Lamaru. I recognise the members of my family who shared childhoods on that farm, uh, some of them here today and some of them watching at home. They're still farming that beautiful country. I owe a great debt to that community and especially to my own parents, Mari and Jim, whose ashes are laid in that sandy soil in Jane and Gary's regenerated scrub. I now live on the beautiful land of the red kangaroo dreaming of the Adelaide Plains, long occupied by the Ghana people. I pay my respects to the traditional custodians of all these lands. They never ceded sovereignty. I was a lucky country kid who grew up in open paddocks. As a child, I, I knew a lot more sheep and dogs than I did people. <laughs> I had a great public primary education at Lamaru Area School. But that education was of its time. It did not include study of the history of my own place. At school and uni, I studied the French, American, Russian, Chinese and Industrial Revolutions. I studied World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, the history of India, unification of Italy, American slavery and, of course, the history of England. When my sister Jane and I went to name the big trees on our farm—and there weren't many, this is the Mallee—we chose names like the Queen Tree and the King Tree. We were raised on British history. But we have a deep connection to country, which continues to this day for all of us, a connection born of only a century of occupation and three generations. I am in awe of the kind of connection to country that exists for First Nations people from their custodianship over thousands of years and hundreds of generations. I did not know until very recently that when we were both 11, my Green Senate running mate, Uncle Major Mugi Sumner, lived just 100 kilometres away, and while I was enjoying all the freedoms of farm life, his family were required to have a pass to travel by bus from Ralkin at the Coorong to Adelaide, where their movements were tightly constrained as they collected clothes and blankets. I acknowledge and thank Uncle Mugi and his Naranjeri and Ghana community, indeed all South Australia's First Nations communities, for their great generosity in telling us of this painful and unequal history. It is never too late to understand the truth of our past. And this legacy is, of course, not behind us as we engage in an important new conversation about truth, treaty and voice. In my state, as I speak, First Nations people are in the federal court contesting a decision by the previous government, now being implemented by Labor, to build a nuclear waste dump on the land of the Bungala people near Kimber without their consent. Indeed, without the consent of most South Australians, they have yet to be consulted. A decision that compounds the awful history and intergenerational trauma of British nuclear testing at Maralinga on country then actually occupied by First Nations people. To a person, the Bangala people oppose this dump, and to a person, their voices have not been heard. We talk about voice, but we must listen to First Nations voices now and do no fresh harm by ignoring their wishes and their connection to country. We are not honestly facing the truth of our past if we fail to act respectfully now. We're a better country for telling the truth of our history and hearing the invitation at the heart of the Uluru Statement, which I'm proud to say my party was early to support and which so many South Australians tell me so often that they passionately support, telling the truth, creating treaties, ensuring a First Nations voice to our parliaments rooted in that truth. On that Mallee farm of my childhood at Lamaru, my parents' politics were a long way from mine. Murray and Jim probably wouldn't have voted for me. <laughs> but in our house, it was your responsibility to pay attention, to weigh the science as you planted a crop or bred a merino. My parents often said that people get the government they deserve, so pay attention. When I was small, less than 10, I asked mum why everyone in South Australia didn't put all their money in the middle and share it out so that everyone had enough. <laughs> That conversation sticks in my mind, I suspect, because my family were not natural socialists. 
I wanted to know what made some people rich and others poor. What, what it was, while it was said that hard work was the road to independence, I knew some poor people who were not bad and not lazy. They sat next to me at school and on the school bus. And later, after leaving school and working for a couple of years on farms and in shearing sheds and going to secretarial school to learn typing and shorthand, I went to uni, still pursuing that question, what explains inequality? I enrolled in economics. I love the clarity and elegance of economic analysis. However, my economics training conveniently ignored questions of inequality, focusing instead on the more superficial question of distribution, where the market is the favoured tool of choice. This form of economics ignores the problems of market failure, things like the concentration of corporate power, the capture of political institutions, the reality of imperfect information and competition, the fact that many aspects of a good life are not measured in the dollar value of GDP, and the existence of all kinds of discrimination, not to mention the economy's impact on the environment and climate, seen as mere externalities to the main game, the economy. We're now paying a big price for treating our environment and our climate as mere fuel for the economy. Such economics focuses on the world of production, beneath which lies a great iceberg of social reproduction, that is, the world of care. One of the great lies at the heart of economics is the pretense that economic production is not wholly dependent upon social reproduction. If there are no kids and no carers, there's no economy. It's that simple. Too many of our mostly male leaders, including in this place, are, in Keynes's words, the slaves of some defunct economist, and have shaped economic policy upon that great lie that our economy is not built on care, most of it done by women. How else can we explain the great inequities like the 22 per cent pay gap, the failure to meet the rise in women's workforce participation with free childcare, the price of job insecurity that working carers pay to get the flexibility they need? So much public decision-making has occurred without the vital contribution of women and carers and without careful consideration of the ecological impact. We are overdue for a thorough renovation of the limitations of dominant, defunct economic theory and the worship of markets. <laughs> markets make good servants but bad masters. They deny care. The logic of the market, cost minimisation and profit maximisation creates childcare deserts. It makes gender and racial discrimination profitable. It drives the greedy exploitation of new reserves of coal and gas, even as the science tells us that it will make our world unsafe. My road through economics led me to a focus on fairness at work. What is fair pay? Why well, is a shearer paid so much less than my economics professor, Jeff Harcourt, who, as he pointed out, loved his job, didn't sweat, had a good back, had predictable pay and was safe at work? Why is a car park attendant paid more than a childcare worker? These questions loomed when I left the farm and all, its and all its security behind and arrived with my suitcase to work at the Reserve Bank in the early 1980s, and a shout out to my old friends in the bank who made contact with me this week. I met workers on much lower pay than me, doing much harder jobs. Sadly, the exploitation of women was everywhere. When I worked in the bank, I had a rubber stamp made that said, this exploits women. <laughs> I used it on pictures of bikini-clad women draped over photocopying machine advertisements in the Australian Financial Review, which circulated around the International Department in the early morning. This exploitation now, in different forms, is far from over, even in this building. It is a fact that is deeply shocking to people like me who wrote our first sexual harassment policies, in my case, 40 years ago. When will it stop? It must. I've spent much of my life studying how work affects men, women and children, and I've lived the reality myself as a working mother with two kids. Work can unwind inequality and give in independence, or it can reinforce and widen it. I have interviewed and surveyed thousands of Australians, and I carry some of those interviews in my heart. A father in the building industry interviewed on his phone in his shed about his long hours of work that had already cost him his marriage and now threatened his health. 
the kids of taxi drivers, mortgage brokers and fishermen, dare I say also politicians, who love their dads but have given up on being close to them because they are away such a lot and they planned, they said, to raise their kids differently. The childcare workers puzzled and angry about what was asked of them even as they love their jobs. Those in every occupation who have fought off or experienced assault, put-downs, unequal pay, sackings or discrimination because, well, they are women. Those casuals and gig workers, too many of them now, who without a parent, a partner or a pension as backup, cannot make ends meet. A third of workers now insecure whose casual loading just gets them to a livable income if they're lucky, but does not stretch to a holiday or sick leave. The women who have learned to work every machine on their farm, from spray cedar to computer, but whose husbands struggle to find, let alone use, the vacuum cleaner or toilet brush. <laughs> the thousands of Australians who put together jobs with all kinds of caring work ingeniously contorting themselves around outdated norms in a country that once prided itself on being a working man's paradise. The first country to win an eight-hour day for building workers through the collective efforts of unions, but one that didn't give workers a good lie down when they had a baby until 2011, when our very meagre, and it remains meagre in international comparison, paid parental scheme, leave scheme was born. In the past 30 years, so many women have joined men in paid work. They have gained the independence of a pay packet. However, without the redistribution of housework and unpaid care, getting a job has too often meant the right to exhaustion, an epidemic of guilt and relentless work-life collision. So we need to fix the work and care regimes that we labour under in Australia. Those in ongoing work deserve secure work. They deserve to receive the legal wages and conditions our labour law promises them without wage or time theft. They should be able to join and be active in a union without risking the sack. In smaller workplaces, where enterprise bargaining is now impossible, they should be able to bargain on an industry basis so their wages and conditions stay up to date. And just as all workers, including casuals, need access to paid domestic violence leave, all workers need access to paid sick leave. Working carers need free, accessible, quality childcare. It is as essential to working life as the road that gets us to work. We need to repair our work and care system so it's fit for, uh, for purpose in the 21st century. And that's why today we have established a Senate Select Committee for a national inquiry into our work and care system, yeah. which I will chair to create an economy that is care inclusive, a system that narrows inequality rather than widens it. So I've spent my life fighting for fairness at work and against inequality, and my hunger for that still burns very bright, but that is not the main reason that I'm here. I'm here because I made the mistake of reading the 2018 IPCC report and listening to the scientists studying climate change just as I was asked to think about running for parliament. Bad combo. This is the greatest challenge of our time. My generation have had the great privilege of living on a safe planet. We now see every day that that is changing and quicker than predicted. Alongside a safe planet, I had free university education, affordable housing and a decent, secure job, as you were just talking about, Jordan. A lot of my generation didn't, lots of women didn't, but I was one of the many lucky ones who had those four things. Very few of the young people in my life can now count on those four things. My generation had every advantage. 30 years of continuous economic growth means our kids deserve the same. So I'm here so that I can look future generations in the eye and say I did everything I could. We know the solutions on climate change and we have the tools we need to implement them. Our Pacific neighbours are clear. The UN is clear. The science is clear. We must stop opening new coal and gas fields. We must act on climate change. We must put the future of our kids before the interests of a small group of fossil fuel profiteers, mostly foreign owned, paying too little tax, who deter are determined to wring their last fortunes out of its extraction while putting our future at risk. And we must restore confidence in our democracy by excluding fossil fuel money from politics and rooting out corruption. South Australians are clear in their instructions on this. Get it done. 
We are a wealthy country. We can do many things. And politics is about choice. Choice between tax cuts for the rich and a visit to the dentist or free childcare. The stage three tax cuts will cost $240 billion in their first 10 years and give $9,000 a year to those earning over $200,000 and nothing to those on minimum wage. They flow mostly to men and to older people. These cuts were wrong when they were crafted a few years ago, and I think Labor knew it. They are completely wrong now. It is wrong to implement them and at the same time tell people living on $46 a day that we can't help them to put food in their fridge. We've seen a massive shift to profits in this country over the past decade while real wages have fallen. The election result and growth in the Greens vote is proof that you can go to an election and talk about taxing billionaires and the profits of big corporations to fund a fairer world, and people will vote for it in their millions. It is wrong to talk the economics of inevitable austerity while suppressing wages, implementing tax cuts and refusing to tax the super profits of industries like gas. We need a different conversation about economic justice and inequality. These are choices we can make, and I've been sent here by the voters of South Australia to stand for them. I'm deeply honoured to be here representing the people of our state and as a Green. I love our state. It's a place of great beauty and of lively, robust, innovative democracy. I was sworn at only twice over the six months of our recent three elections. <laughs> it shocks me. Pe people in deep disagreement with me on the hustings were frank and funny, but rarely mean. Many people out there know that the behaviours they see in this place, all that theatrical shouting and disrespect, are not acceptable in their jobs, in their homes, in their schools. I am shocked by the bullying, there is no other word for it, in question time in this place. To those of you at home, it is much worse in the flesh than on the telly. It has to stop. We need parliaments that are as good as our people. I will say, however, that I will stand up for my state. Being respectful does not mean being a pushover. I'm glad to say I've had very good training in the shearing sheds and central banks of this country. <laughs> South Australians are practical people. They were clear in their instructions to me in giving me and the Greens their vote. Go there and make a difference. Carbon is putting our world at risk. Act on that. Do the things that science tells us are essential. The price of inequality is clear. It breeds bad politics and vulnerability. Fight for a fairer world. And finally, I have some people to thank. So many Greens voters, volunteers, members, office holders, candidates and staff. I salute you for your time and your sweat and for the great fun that we had. My Greens political running mate, Uncle Mugi Sumner, for your powerful politics and your hard work. Emma Pringle and the fabulous campaign team who smashed two elections. Emily, Lucy, Isaac, Nicola, Bonnie, Alicia, Bailey. My fellow candidates, Melanie, Jeremy, Katie, Emma, David, John, Patrick, Rosa, Beck, Tim, Greg and Rob Sims. Thousands of volunteers. And I just mentioned Andrew, Di, Kay, Natalie, Mary, so many others, all our young Greens. I can't name you all, but I thank you so much for it. This is your victory. My South Australian political sister, Sarah Hanson Young, and my wonderful, supportive, expanded party team. Thank you. My partner, Ian Campbell, who's with me for this interesting part of our lives <laughs> while living your own. Thanks, Ian. My kids, no longer kids, Jake and Indy, for all your advice and laughs. Don't worry, Geordie, it's not much further to go. <laughs> so many unexpected turnings in our lives for all of us, but riding them together. And their families, India and Zan and Geordie. Thanks for arriving in your spectacular way mid-campaign, Geordie and for making us smile no matter what. John Wishart, past partner and now co-parent and grandparent, a hard-working Greens leader and a long-term campaigner for justice. Thank you, John. My LGBTQI friends and family, I love you. I thank you for your courageous example of being fully the people you really are. 
strong love, especially to our trans mob, especially in the face of the recent campaign by elements of the Morrison government that attempted to whip up hatred and fear in the election for political gain. I'm so happy that that, anti, that transphobic attack fell flat because Australians are better than that. Absolutely. And we have so much further to go. The powerful women in my life, my blood sisters, Jane and Kay, Sue Outram, my bad mother's group, still bad, <laughs> um, the Sowers, my Gigi pals and so many other dear friends and supporters. My brother Michael and Lisa and my extended family, fabulous nieces, nephews and grandies, all in all our political diversity. It's not easy to be related to a public figure you don't always agree with, but thanks for being in my family where blood and love are so much thicker than politics. My beloved and ever-reliable friends of Barbara Group who keep me on track and would never miss a speech or a party. <laughs> Thank you. Union friends over many decades. My sisters in the women's movement. All the extraordinary academics who give places like this the research and graduates we need. People like John Buchanan and Elizabeth Hill. Experts in places like the Australia Institute who build the social science we need for a better world. Thank you all, and especially Anna Chang, Ebony Bennett, John McKinnon, and my very dear friends Richard Dennis and Ben Oakhurst. As Ian and I say quite often, life is short, let's have fun, and let's change the world along the way. This is what I am here to help do. South Australians voted in historic numbers for a politics of hope. People who grow up in the Mallee are extreme optimists. Those watching this will know that is true. They have to be, to be ready for drought, hard work, extreme heat and the many assaults that can arrive in that country that is beautiful but demanding. I am a proud child of the Mallee in these ways, and I want to offer hope to all the people who put me here to fight for our planet and for economic justice. We can do the things we need to do. and. Like a sturdy Mallee bush, I'm here to thrive and fight to reward the hope that's been placed in me. Thank you. I've got to blow them up. I know they don't always work. But yeah, thank you.
Senators, I will shortly call Senator Babette for his first speech. Please either leave the chamber or resume your seats. Order, Senators. <laughs> Pursuant to order, I now call Senator Babette to make his first speech and ask Senators that the usual courtesies be extended to him. I call Senator Babette. Thank you, President. I am proud to say this is my first speech, and it feels damn good. President, I stand here in this great place honoured and humbled to have been given an opportunity by the people of Victoria to represent them and to be their voice here in our nation's capital. I'm most grateful, very grateful, and I will serve with further passion and an unwavering commitment to them and our great nation. I'm proud of our country. I'm proud of our flag. I'm proud of our traditions. And most importantly, President, I am proud to be Australian. Yeah. Victoria, thank you. Now, I stand here as someone who has not been groomed in the political machine. I was not a staffer. I was not a long-term member of a major political party. What I am, President, what I am is a regular Australian who decided it was time to put my hand up and have a go. A regular Australian who felt like I needed to do something to have my voice heard. I'm a staunch patriot. I love our country. I love our freedoms. I love that in Australia you can be anything that you want to be. There is nothing and no one stopping you from achieving your hopes, your aspirations and your dreams. If you only put in the work, if you only roll up your sleeves, if you only come in early and you leave late, we live in a country where effort leads to opportunity, it leads to reward and it leads to success. President, I want to give thanks to the brave young Australians who have sacrificed so much, many of whom have made the ultimate sacrifice in the conflicts around the world, both recent and past, so that we can all stand here today in a safe, prosperous, sovereign, independent and plentiful country where we want for nothing. Now, when our diggers went overseas to defend our country, to defend our way of life, to defend the values that we hold dear, that we hold dear. They did so as Australians, not as the left, not as the right, just Aussies. To our diggers, I salute you, now and forever. You are better men and women than what we could ever hope to be here in this place. My family and I arrived in Australia in 1990. I was only seven years of age. I was born on a small island of Rodrigues, which is part of the Mascarene Islands, it is to the east of Mauritius, which is itself to the east of Madagascar. It's a beautiful island. It's approximately 108 square kilometres in size. Now, to put that into perspective, Greater Melbourne, well, that's about 10,000 square kilometres in size, and Greater Sydney, about 12,400 square kilometres in size. So why did my parents decide to come here to Australia? Why here? Why not somewhere else? Well, they decided that with two young children, they needed to do something to give their boys the opportunities which they knew that Australia could provide. The opportunity to grow up, have a decent life, and most importantly, to pursue their dreams and their goals, no matter what those might end up to be in the future. When we arrived here in Australia, my parents said nothing, not a thing. Like many, Others who have come before, my parents worked hard for everything they had. Now, this is a story which is not dissimilar to the many other migrants from all over the world who now 
proudly call Australia home. Proudly call Australia home. Now, back in Rodrigues, my father he worked in a hospital, and my mother in a government office in administration on the island. They had great jobs. When they came here, they started from scratch. They rebuilt a life in a new country with two young kids. That is not an easy task in a world before smartphones and the internet. I can assure you, imagine turning your phone off and never turning it back on again. Now, although I was only seven years of age, I remember that time clearly. Clearly. When we arrived, I spoke no English. I only spoke French. As you can imagine, starting primary school was nerve-wracking. Much more nerve-wracking than even his first time speaking in this great house. Much more nerve-wracking. Now, unable to communicate and being the new foreign kid wasn't easy. It was a struggle, to be sure. But luckily for me, another boy in the class spoke both English and French. And when the teacher would give us in uh, in instruction to complete our classwork, he'd take me outside into the hallway and he'd translate from English to French. I'd then complete my work in French. A difficult time for both me and my teacher, who had to grade my work in a language she didn't even speak. <laughs> she didn't even speak the language. Now, luckily, I quickly learned to speak and write in English. But those early formative years taught me that I could do anything. If I applied myself, if I worked hard, they taught me not to be afraid and to believe in myself. And I eventually went on to complete a bachelor's degree and I started a very successful business with my brother. Now, when we arrived here in Australia, my father took on a full-time job, full job working full-time in nursing homes while he put himself through university. Eventually, he graduated with a master's in business in international trade. My mother also took up a full-time job. Hard work, long hours, early starts. I remember early starts. But no matter what was going on, I could always count on my mother to be home, to greet me after school and be there with a snack when I got back. Every time. I remember very, very clearly. Now, we have a very strong and very close family. And through my experiences growing up, I believe, I believe that the family unit is the bedrock of our society. Yeah. The bedrock. Now, my parents showed me through their actions every single day, every single day, that working hard, being disciplined and sticking to my principles would see me do well in life. To my parents, I obviously will be forever grateful. The challenges that they have worked through as a team have given me the tools, the know-how and the work ethic to be standing here today in this place. Now, in 1993, we officially became Australian citizens. I was a little bit too young to understand, but what I could understand, what I could understand was how important and significant that moment and that day was for my parents. We went to the ceremony and at the end we could officially call Australia home. I still remember that ceremony. I remember how happy and how proud my parents were and I'm glad that I could stand here today with my mother and father watching on in the gallery. Australia has given us so much. To say that I'm a patriot, to say that I'm a patriot is an understatement. To say that I love our Southern Cross and the red, white and blue is not even close. We are lucky, all of us, we are lucky to live in the greatest and the best country in the world. Yeah. President, to be standing here in this most important and dignified of places fills me with pride. I'm truly honoured. Now, I wish to extend my congratulations to all the other senators who were elected to the 47th parliament. And I wish to say that even though the time may come where we will disagree, that when we do make these important decisions, that we do so for the benefit of Australia and all of her people, that we put aside minor differences for the benefit of nation first. Nation first! That must be at the core of everything that we do here in this place. We should cooperate with all. We should trade with all. But we should avoid entanglements which do not benefit Australia or her people. We live in a world where powers beyond our shores seek ever-increasing levels of control and influence over the direction of our country and our people. We must temper this 
with a staunch patriotic attitude, the strength of self-determination and the love of country. We must not allow unelected, undemocratic and unaccountable international groups and organisations to exert undue influence over the future of Australia. We must be the masters of our own destiny. More than ever, everyday Australians are struggling due to the decisions handed down by unelected global bureaucrats. We are facing cost of living pressures not seen before in many of our lifetimes with the cost of food, energy and the rest increasing at an alarming rate. The average Australian is struggling and will continue to do so until we start, we start to make decisions that put Australia first, first once again. We must cooperate and trade with all. We must extend a hand of friendship to all. But we also must exit international agreements which would disadvantage Australia and her people. We must go back to the values that made us one of the greatest countries on earth in the, face, in the first place and re-embrace the entrepreneurial spirit, the free market economy and respect for the individual. Let us re-embrace capitalism, not crony capitalism, where the business class colludes with the political class to stitch up the average Australian. I speak of unfettered capitalism where companies will compete for the dollar in your pocket and the best amongst them will rise and the worst will fall. Let us discourage monopolies while focusing on supporting business growth and encouraging healthy competition. With healthy competition comes reward for the Australian consumer. For too long, we have allowed our country to march towards collectivism. History has shown us this does not end well. We need not repeat the mistakes of the past. We need to instead look towards our future, where individualism, entrepreneurship, freedom of speech, freedom of association and the free market are once again placed back in their rightful place as beacons of hope in an increasingly darkening world. We must become a nation which makes things again. Our manufacturing sector has been decimated and sent offshore, once again at the behest of unelected global bureaucrats. Let's take the brakes off our businesses and our entrepreneurs. Let them work. Let them produce. Let them create wealth. Not wealth for a few, but wealth for all. We will all be better off for it. We need to ensure that we give Australian businesses strong support and an unencumbered legislative pathway so they can grow, compete and become major players on the world stage. Let's eliminate disadvantages, bureaucratic red tape and green tape and unfair international agreements where the only choice some businesses have to survive is to move offshore. Particular attention needs to be placed on our small and medium businesses. Small businesses are essential to our economy. They are our nation's largest employer and they employ almost half of all Australians in the workforce. We must do everything we can to ensure that they can compete and operate and simplify and restructure the system to make their lives easier, not harder. Now, the Australian government is the main petitioner of bankruptcy and company liquidations. Let's stop driving businesses to the wall. Our small businesses are the backbone of our economy and they are struggling. Let's do all we can to help them survive and prosper. Now, our world, our world and our position within it is becoming increasingly uncertain, make no mistake. And the reality is that foreign authoritarian powers are posturing for supremacy and have adopted ever more expansionist policies. These powers seek to reshape the current world order. We need to recognise this and we need to be ready to act. Mm -hmm. Let us reinforce our strong and long-standing relationships with our friends and international partners and forge closer ties with our neighbours. Let us continue to build robust relationships with other democratic nations with long-term regional and global stability in mind. The reality of our world 
means that we must be ready to defend not only ourselves but our friends who share similar values as we do, should they require our help. We must be ready to defend liberty and defend democracy itself and do whatever is required to ensure we are ready to deal with any challenges the future may bring. Now, we should not seek out said challenge, but instead be ready to meet it, should it present itself. Now, a great man once said, we shall also do our part to build a world of peace where the weak are safe and the strong are just. But those who threaten the security and the prosperity of our world are not just. And the sooner we recognise this fact and the quicker we act, the better off we will be. We live in an Australia where our strategic and national assets are being sold off to the highest overseas bidder. Billions of dollars worth of our assets have been traded away. Too much of our critical infrastructure is effectively under foreign control. This is not the Australia that we should want to leave for the next generation, where people who are not citizens, who have not sworn allegiance to our nation or to the Australian people, go on to own assets of strategic significance, such as power companies, ports and prime agricultural land. This trend must be reversed. Critical infrastructure must never, must never be in foreign hands. It must always be in the people's hands. Many critical infrastructure assets, like power companies, are monopolies. They are not subject to traditional market forces a business would traditionally face. As such, placing these assets into private hands, into foreign hands, all but guarantees manipulation to the disadvantage of the average Australian. Now, a long-standing policy of the United Australia Party is to bring Australian super back home to grow Australia. Currently, a minuscule amount of Australian super is invested here in Australian infrastructure. Australia is the fourth largest holder of pension fund assets in the world. Australian super funds have around $3.5 trillion and are one of the largest sources of capital. But much of it is invested overseas and does not provide economic growth and employment for our citizens right here at home. Now, this super can be deployed to benefit our country and our people. We do not need to sell off our infrastructure assets to the highest bidder, and we do not need to rely on foreign capital for our infrastructure requirements. We are at war. Make no mistake. But this war is a war which does not conscript men, planes, tanks and weapons to its cause. This war is an economic and financial war, and we are losing. The outcome of this war will be the same. We will be subservient to foreign powers, to foreign interests in our own lands. We cannot and must not allow this to continue. We are witnessing the steady decline of our traditional institutions such as family, marriage, religion, the sanctity of life, patriotism, borders and education, to name a few. This is not an accident, but rather by design. Radical Marxist ideology has been marching through our institutions for some time. Terms like white privilege and gender fluidity have now become commonplace. Marxists see the world as being inherently unequal. They seek to address this apparent inequality by tearing down the very fabric of our civilization so that, it, so that it may be rebuilt in their Fawkes utopian vision, a vision which would seek to destroy the very systems that have made us one of the greatest countries in the world and turn us into a shadow of our former selves, a nation which bows to the whim of big government where the individual is snuffed out in favour of collectivist ideology, where freedom of speech, thought and religion is a thing of the past. This is classic divide-and-conquer strategy, and it is nothing new. History is full of examples of this. For too long, we have allowed those who would seek to control and subvert the democratic process to divide us. Let us instead draw focus 
to what unites us rather than to what makes us different. Let us rediscover a love of individualism, a love of freedom, and remember always that the best welfare is a job, that the best security is a home, that the best life is a family, and the best country is Australia. If we had more political parties, we would have a greater diversity of ideas, and that can only be a good thing for our country. Politics, after all, is about ideas. It is about the great contest between differing points of view. It is not and should never be an exercise in public relations where the only thing some politicians seem to be concerned with is the next election and getting back into this place. Politics, of course, has no tangible reward. The only reward is history and doing what is right and sticking by your convictions no matter what the cost. It's about standing strong in the face of adversity. I and many tens of thousands of others joined the United Australia Party because the United Australia Party it stands for something. We stand for family values. We stand for small business. We stand for limited government. We stand for a fair go for all. We stand for you to have the freedom to live your life how you choose without interference. We stand for democracy. We stand for personal responsibility and self-determination. Now, the United Australia Party took to the election many policies which will benefit Australia and her people, such as policies to deal with our high levels of national debt, which has now resulted in ever-alarming increases in interest rate and inflation. We call on the government to approach us to discuss these policies in order to help the average Australian. Let us work together for the benefit of Australia. Let us cast aside minor differences. Now, members of the United Australia Party, we come from all walks of life. Young, old, rich, poor, white, black, brown. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, we're all Australians, we're Aussies, and, for, and from whatever land we come, we must speak with one voice to save our country. We must be united in one belief, and that belief is freedom and a fair go for all. Now, to the members and supporters of the United Australia Party and to the people who voted for us, I want to say thank you. I stand here to represent you, and I'll never stop fighting for you and for our great nation. To my fellow candidates, Thank you for the tireless work you put in throughout the campaign. To the volunteers who stood out in the cold holding out, ha handing out how to vote cards, I am most grateful. To my family in the gallery, thank you for believing in me and thank you for, believe for being by my side for the many months of campaigning. To my brother and best friend Matt, thank you for absolutely everything and for always being there by my side. To Clive Palmer. Thank you for believing in me and for your commitment to Australia and its people. Thank you for, for, for leading by example and for having the courage to step up and do something about the direction of our country and challenging the status quo. You have given a voice to tens of thousands of disconnected Australians who did not have one before. To Craig Kelly, your advice both now and into the future will be invaluable. And I thank you for your dedication and the passion that you have shown towards advancing Australia, both during your time as a member of parliament and now in your new position as a national director of the United Australia Party. To everyone at UAP head office, thank you for your tireless work. But most importantly, to the people of Victoria. The issues that we are experiencing were created by men and women, and they can be solved by men and women. We must, work to vet, we must work together for the benefit of our country and our people. The challenges that we face are many, but we can do something about it. You are, in fact, doing something about it right now by taking a greater interest in the political process and by ensuring that I was elected to parliament to represent you. You are doing something about it every time you volunteer your time to keep Australia free. To the people of Victoria, together we will make a difference. Together 
we will stand up. Together, we will create change. Together, we will make a better tomorrow. And yes, together, we will save Australia. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Aussie. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Uh, Senator Thank Babbitt, you. that's disorderly. Order, Senators. So we'll return to the work of the Senate now. So um, I'm going to proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, just, I, I, I just want to deal with a non-conforming petition, which I need to table here. So I need to seek leave to table. Um, I've discussed it with the whips, and it's been approved to table. Right. So, uh, before we move to consideration of documents, then uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. Um, I table the document. Thank you. Thanks. And now we proceed to documents as listed on page four of the order of business. Um, Senator Dayton. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I would like to uh, take note of the Murray Darling Basin Authority. Basin Plan Report 2020-21, um, as listed in the um, Senate Order of Business. Um, despite what we've been hearing for the last um, number of weeks about the failure of the coalition government um, on delivery of the Basin Plan, this report categorically proves, Order, Senators. proves that wrong. This report shows that um, under the coalition government, 
We have continued water recovery despite the focus of the last few weeks on one clause in one section of the basin plan. We now have a long-term average yield of uh, 2,100 gigalitres of held entitlements. Um, we have ensured that when sustainable diversion limit, limits came into play in 2019, the first year of monitoring of those sustainable diversion limits, this is before even all water recovery targets and additional targets have been met, this report shows that we are 97 per cent compliant with the sustainable diversion limits. 97 per cent compliant. There were three zones or three valleys which were found to be non-compliant, but two of which had valid reasonable excuses, and all three have uh, implemented make good actions to bring that back into line. Now, I do pose the question, if we are already compliant with sustainable diversion limits, why do we need to race forth and pursue continued water recovery at the expense of the social and economic stability of our communities? That's not to say that we shouldn't continue to consider sound, strategic and um, ecologically sustainable projects that will deliver environmental outcomes. Uh, we are 30 of the 37 supply measures or SDL adjustment mechanism projects are on track. Our government was investing in new knowledge to understand the risks of the basin, including risks associated with climate change. Uh, we invested in this new knowledge. Uh, we, working with, we were working with the CSIRO. I note and I uh, applaud the new government's commitment to continue to look at new science under the Basin Plan. Ninety-eight per cent of the surface water recovery targets under the Basin Plan have been recovered if we meet all of our obligations. Ninety-eight per cent. That is a lot different to the view that has been pursued over the last couple of weeks that the coalition government turned its back on the Basin Plan. Far from it. What we did do, however, was turn our faces to the communities in the Murray-Darling Basin, and we listened to those communities, and we adjusted our programs in response to what the communities were telling us. They were telling us that buyback hurts. Open tender buyback hurts communities. So we moved away from that. We focused on at first on-farm efficiency measures and then off-farm efficiency measures. And we delivered an awful lot of water entitlements to the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder as a result of that. And in the last year's reporting from the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder, I mean we, we saw in the same period that this report covers ten years of continuous connection between the Murray Lower Lakes and the Coorong. Ten years, despite going back into a very significant drought that saw New South Wales general security irrigators on zero water allocations, that's zero, no access to water, for two years running. Yet the Coorong and the Lower Lakes remain connected. So far beyond what has been asserted, that the Basin Plan is failing because our government failed on the Basin Plan. I assert that the Basin Plan and this report shows that the Basin Plan is achieving good outcomes. The Commonwealth Environmental Water Holders reports also show that, and that our pathway, listening to communities, was the right pathway to be on. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davey. Senator Roberts. Adam Acting Deputy President, I, I join. Um, the Senator in moving that the Senate take note of document number two, Murray-Darling Basin Authority, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Waters. Can I, on behalf of Senator uh, Hanson Young, can I seek leave to uh, continue the remarks on this document, please? Indeed. Thank you, Senator Waters. 
No other senators were wishing to take note of document two. We will move on. Um, any other senators wishing to take note of any of the other documents on page four? No. In that case, we will move to committee reports and government responses. My understanding is that we don't have any, but I will ask anyway. No? Very good. Are there any ministerial statements? Senator Watt. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning the Australian Building and Construction Commission. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cash, were you seeking oh. call to take note of um, I was. the statement? Yes, thank you. And I move that the Senate take note of the documents tabled relating to uh, my notice to produce. And, um, Acting Deputy President, it's very interesting when you look at the documents that have been provided uh, by the minister on behalf of the Minister for Workplace Relations. Because what is very clear from these documents, or should I say from the lack of documents, but in particular in relation to the redactions and the uh, public interest immunity claims that have been made, uh, plus everything else that has been said on behalf of the Minister uh, for Employment and Workplace Relations in the chamber this week, is there is no question whatsoever that the Albanese government did not in any way consult with key stakeholders in the construction industry and, in fact, did not consult with the Australian Building and Construction Commissions itself before making the snap announcement on 24 July 2022 in the media that the Australian Building and Construction Commission, via the Building Code being stripped back to its bare legal minimum, would be neutered. Now, that doesn't surprise anybody. Deputy President, that doesn't surprise anybody. But what it does show is this. When Mr Albanese went to the election, he went on a platform of integrity and transparency. And in fact, when you look at the code of conduct that is in place for Mr Albanese's ministers, it says that the Albanese government is committed to integrity, to honesty, to accountability, and ministers in my government, including assistant ministers, will observe high standards of probity, governance and behaviour worthy of the Australian people. When you then turn to key principles, at 1.3 part 2 it states this. Ministers must observe fairness in making official decisions, that is to act honestly and reasonably. And here is the part that becomes interesting. With consultation as appropriate to the matter at issue, taking proper accounts of the merits of the matter and giving due consideration to the rights and interests of the persons involved and the interests of Australia. You then go to public interest and fairness at part two of the document. Ministers are expected to conduct all official business on the basis that they may be expected to demonstrate publicly that their actions and their decisions in conducting public business were taken with the sole objective of advancing the public interest. And you see, Acting Deputy President, this is where the minister fails. This is where the Albanese government fails. Because despite the code of conduct, despite the fact that they had a platform of transparency and integrity, they have failed at the very first hurdle. And the documents that have been tabled in response to my order for production of documents, they show that. Because despite Mr Albanese saying, my ministers, I expect them to consult, the only consultation that took place, and this was confirmed by Minister Watt, who represents the Minister for Workplace Relations in this place, this was confirmed by Minister Watt in response to a question during Senate question time that I asked. Minister Watt confirmed on behalf of the minister that no consultation had occurred with the actual regulator, the Australian Building and Construction Commission. That quite frankly shows a complete lack of respect, regardless of whether or not you ideologically are opposed to the building regulator. The fact that you do not consult with them and the 150 employees that are employed by the regulator, and they instead have to find out 
that they are effectively being neutered and are being pulled back to their bare legal minimum, gutted, I like that word, said it, gutted, on a media show, on insiders? That is an absolute disgrace and, quite frankly, is completely in contradiction to these high standards that the Prime Minister of Australia a took to the Australian people, but b demand of his ministers that are set out quite clearly in the Code of Conduct. So when the Code of Conduct says behaviour worthy of the Australian people, making decisions in the interests of Australia and making decisions taken with the sole objective of advancing the public interest, let's look at the consultation that did occur. Because Minister Watt, on behalf of the minister, confirmed as follows. He confirmed that the only consultation that did occur, the only public interest that was advanced by Mr Albanese and the Labor government, was in relation to the interests of the relevant unions. Minister Watt actually confirmed the consultation that was had in relation to the neutering or the gutting of the building code was with, and I quote, the CFMMEU. Now, that is interesting because, as we know, they are one of the Albanese Labor governments, or should I say the Australian Labor Party's greatest financial donors. Oh. Almost $1 million a year has flowed from the CFMMEU into the coffers of the Australian Labor Party. So what you are seeing is this. Money goes in and policy favours come out. Mm. This clearly shows there is Buy only the one money. accord now in Australia. Buy the the accord that the Albanese government has with the CFMEU, based on the $1 million almost a year that flow into the Australian Labor Party and then the policies that flow out at the behest of the relevant union. So the consultation did occur with the CFMEU. The consultation, though, didn't stop there, as Minister Watt confirmed. There was also consultation with the AWU and with the ACTU. Again, consultation with unions. Again, I go back to the Code of Conduct for Ministers, because it clearly does state public interest and fairness that decisions are to be taken with the sole objective of advancing the public interest. Well, the public interest, I hate to tell Mr Albanese now as Prime Minister of Australia, is not just the public interest for the CFMMEU, it is not just the public interest for the AWU, and it is certainly not just the public interest for the ACTU. I think that any objective observer would say, how about the construction industry? How about the in excess of, I don't know, 1.1 million employees that the construction industry employs? How about the relevant stakeholders in the construction industry that are not unions? And what about, just even as a matter of courtesy, nothing more and nothing less? Because that's what the Code of Conduct talks about. As a matter of courtesy, do you think maybe even a call before you went on Insiders and made the announcement so that 150 employees, and those on the other side, they always talk about the rights of employees. Well, what about the common decency in relation to the around 150 employees employed by the Australian Building and Construction Commission who are effectively told by this Labor government, you don't have a job, and they found out when they watched a media program on Sunday. But, Deputy President, Acting Deputy President, Another irony in relation to the consultation is this. One of the meetings that Minister Watt put on the record on behalf of the minister from the other place happened on the same day, get this, the same day the most militant union in Australia, and that's not me saying that, that's court after court, and Minister Watt did say in response to a question to me that he does, and the Labor Party does respect the independence of the judiciary. So that is the judiciary in Australia saying the most militant union in Australia. But get this, the consultation that the Albanese government and the minister had with the CFMMEU occurred on the same day as the most militant union in Australia received a record fine. This is a fine by the courts of $840,000 for threatening unlawful strikes on Brisbane construction sites. Oh, 
So what we see is they talk big on integrity, they talk big on transparency, they wave around their conduct, their code of conduct for ministers, and guess what? When they are asked about consultation with relevant stakeholders, when they have to produce documents, and I do want to just say to the chamber, over the break I will be going through these documents very carefully. Because you see, it's often not what the documents say, it's what the documents don't say that is actually a reflection on the government. The amount of redaction in these documents is actually astounding for a government that went to the Australian people on the basis of a platform of integrity and transparency. Well, guess what? When it comes to the Australian Building and Construction Commission, when it comes to the construction industry, there is none. Thank you, Senator Cash. Senator Scar. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Deputy. I saw Senator Scar first, so I'll give the call to him. Thank you, Madam Acting okay. uh, Deputy President. Consultation. Consultation. Do you know who I think should have been consulted? I think the safety inspectors who were scared off work sites by CFMEU violence. I think maybe they should have been consulted. Because what an irony. What an, in, what an absolute irony. The situation got so bad is so bad on Queensland construction yes. sites because the activities of the CFMEU in my home state of Queensland, in, in Senator Watt's home state of Queensland, the situation got so bad that the Together Union, the Together Union had to take protected industrial action so that their members, yes. workplace health and safety inspectors, yes. did not have to attend 17 construction sites in Queensland because of the violence, the violence, the intimidation, the bullying, the thuggish behaviour of the CFMEU construction division. That's how bad it got. That's how bad it got in Queensland. The union representing the workplace health and safety inspectors had to take action to protect the workplace health and safety inspectors. That is how bad it got. Maybe they should have been, Senator Watt, maybe they should have been consulted. Maybe what they've gone through. Should, they should have been allowed to put on record in public what they've gone through in terms of dealing with this thuggish, brutish, bullying behaviour of the CFMEU. But of course, when the minister put out, when the minister put out his media release on 24 July 2022, he didn't even mention the CFMEU. It's not even mentioned. In three pages, he couldn't even bring himself to mention the CFMEU because they're an embarrassment. They're an embarrassment for the Australian Labor Party because the ALP is institutionally incapable of dealing with their thuggish behaviour. Unlike, unlike former Prime Minister Bob Hawke, who dealt with the BLF, the current day Labor Party is institutionally incapable of dealing with the construction division of the CFMEU. I asked the minister representing the relevant minister this week some questions arising out of what's referred to as the Bogger Road Cross River Rail case. Now, for senators who don't come from my home state of Queensland, one of the most significant infrastructure projects occurring in Queensland at the moment, a multi-billion dollar construction project, is the Cross River Rail case. And just this, and on 28 July 2022, the federal court brought down a judgment brought down a judgment last week in relation to the CFMEU. And this is what the judge said. This is what the judge said. These aren't my words. These aren't a politician's words. This is an a member of the independent yes. judiciary. I've taken into account both the circumstances of the contravention itself and of each of the contravenors. There is clearly a persistent adherence to a strategy of non-compliance by all three respondents a persistent adherence to a strategy of non-compliance. He then quotes, his honour then quotes, the High Court in the Patterson case, which I've referred to in this place uh, last week, and I quote, the greater financial incentive will be necessary, will be necessary to persuade a well-resourced contravener, i.e. the CFMEU, to abide by the law rather than to adhere to its preferred policy and will be necessary to persuade a poorly resourced CFMEU that his unlawful policy preference is not sustainable. The more determined a contravener is to have its way in the workplace and the more deliberate its contravention is, the greater will be the financial incentive necessary to make the contravener 
except that the price they're having its way is not sustainable. That's what our High Court said. Maybe those officers yes. should have consult consulted the High Court, or at the very least, or at the very least, consulted the decisions of the High Court and the decisions of the Federal Court. When I look at the history of these decisions, I've got pages and pages of this stuff in relation to contraventions of the CFMEU. Pages and pages. It's actually had an impact in relation to, and I'm going to read some, just some of the Queensland infrastructure projects which have been impacted by unlawful behaviour of the CFMEU. And if those, in, if those opposite had engaged in that reasonable consulta consultation of the court decisions, they could read it, and they still can. They, they still can. The Inogra Army Barracks, QUT, QUT Kelvin Grove Campus, Lady Salento's Children's Hospital, Queensland's Institute of Medical Research, the Bruce Highway Caloundra to Sunshine Coast Upgrade, Legacy Way, Port Connect, Cairns, Port, Cairns Performing Arts Centre, the Queensland Performing Arts Centre, Ronald McDonald House, Disgrace. even Ronald they McDonald House, for goodness do. sake. Can it get exactly, exactly, Senator Cash? It can't. How do you defend this sort of stuff? I know that those opposite, and I've said this before, I know those opposite. Have, have, amongst their number are people who have held senior positions in the trade union movement. I don't think any of those opposite, including, including Senator Sheldon, would have engaged in any sort of contact, which, conduct which comes within a bull's roar of that which was documented in the federal court case brought down last week. I can't imagine my colleague Senator Sheldon would have engaged in that, that contact. I can't imagine Senator Stirl would engage Definitely in that not. conduct. Definitely not. All Senator, Senator Walsh, all Senator Ciccone, all well-respected members of the Australian trade union movement. But you just seem, through you, Madam Acting Deputy President, the Labor Party seems incapable of dealing with this issue from an institutional perspective. It is just going to get worse. Do you know, Madam Acting Deputy President, the conduct in that Bogger Road Cross River Rail case is so bad, is so bad, what was said was so bad that His Honour added an annexure to the judgment. The, 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 his Honour, Judge Vasta, added, added an annexure to the added an annexure to the judgment. He added an annexure to Order, sorry, Senator sorry, Senator, Senator what? Are you I making an interjection? It was Judge Vasta. It was. It was. It was. Order. Do you have anything to say about Judge Vasta? Order, Senator, Senator Scar, Senator Scar, please take your seat. Order, Senators, Senators, this shouting across the chamber at each other is disorderly. I will instruct Senators to direct their questions through the chair. Senator Scar, please resume your contribution. Yes, Senator Brockman. Minister Watt is very close to making a reflection on the judiciary. Senator Scar, Senator Scar made it very clear which justice he was talking about. Senator Scar made it very clear which justice he was about talking about. He kept repeating his name three or four times, Senator Brockman, and you kept Sen asking. S Senator Brockman, you kept asking. Senator Brockman. Um, Senator Watt, is this on the point of order that Senator Brockman has just raised or on a new point of order? It's on Senator, Senator Would like Brockman's— Would you respond to the point of order? Yes. Thank you. I was wanting to clarify the name of the judge. I missed it. I, didn't, I missed it when Senator, when Senator Scar apparently said it the first time, and I just wanted to confirm that it was Justice Vasta, as I understand. Senators, I'm just trying to get some clarity about which judge we're talking about. Senators, There's a lot of judges who've said a lot of things about the ABC. Senators, and I'll refer you no, to them Senator as well. Watt, so. Please take your seat. That was making a, a debating point. There are other points in time for us to have this conversation, and right now we are debating the ministerial statement that Senator Watt has provided. So I would ask that we not shout across the chamber at each other. I'm listening very carefully, and I would appreciate that if senators were going to um, say things that might be perceived as particularly inflammatory. They try and do it when they are making a contribution rather than across the chamber to other senators. Senator Scar, please continue your the remarks. The conduct was so bad in that case, Madam Acting Deputy President, that the judge actually added an annexure because he was so disgusted with the language that was used, the homophobic slurs that were used against Queenslanders in their workplace, he had to include it in an annexure. 
That's how bad it was. But let's. But feel free. I've got dozens of cases cases here. How about Justice Logan? How about Justice Logan in the case of the Australian Building and Construction Commissioner versus the CFMEU, the Titan Cranes case? How about that case? And this is what Justice Logan said, Senator Watt. The time has come when enough is enough in relation to compliance with the law of the land by this union. Its immediate predecessor, and for that matter others in history and its officials, has well and truly passed. The time has come when enough was enough has well and truly passed. That's what Justice Logan said in Queensland in the case dealing with the Titan Cranes case, another case involving unlawful conduct undertaken by the CFMEU. There are pages of this. And if, if Senator Watt want, wants uh, judges' names, how about Chief Justice Kiefel, Just, Justice Gagala, Justice Keane, Justice Gordon, Justice Edelman, Justice Stewart, Justice Gleeson, the members of our highest court, the High Court, the High Court. And what have they, they said? Our highest court, the highest court in the land. Maybe they should have been consulted, or at the very least, the judgments they've written should have been consulted. And this is what they've said. The full court's approach in this case is apt to undermine the primacy of deterrence as the object objective of the civil penalty regime in the Act is amply demonstrated once regard is had to the failure of previous penalties to have any deterrent effect on the CFMEU's repeated contraventions of section 3491 of the Act. The circumstance that the CFMEU has continued to breach section 3491, steadfastly resistant to previous attempts to enforce compliance by civil penalties fixed at less than the permitted maximum, is a compelling indication that the penalties previously imposed have not been taken seriously because they were insufficient to outweigh the benefits flowing unlawfully, unlawfully to the CFMEU from adherence to the no ticket, no start policy. To the contrary, the CFMEU's continuing defiance of section 3491 indicates that it regards the penalties previously imposed as an acceptable cost of doing business. Maybe those opposites should have consulted the judgments of the highest court of this land. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Sheldon or Senator Walsh? If you, if Senator you Sheldon. Uh, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak in the, on this ministerial statement regarding the Australian Building and Construction Commission. There has been a lot of hot air from the opposition from recent changes to the building code. So let's set aside all the rhetoric and look at what the minister's instrument actually does. It amends the building code to remove some of the most inappropriate and absurd uh, provisions. Now let's start with 13.2J. Uh, J. One of the most ideological and ridiculous sections of regulation in Australian history. That section has been used by the ABCC to run hugely expensive high court cases about flags and stickers. Let's start with the Eureka flag case, where the ABCC spent half a million dollars on a case to stop the Eureka flag being displayed on a crane at a building site. And where do I even start? Where do I start on this one? Because how about the fact that the ABCC was prosecuting this case on behalf of no one? No one. There was no one complaining to the ABCC about the Eureka flag being displayed. The developer of the site, Lend Lease, was actually on the same side as the CFMMEU in this dispute. Lend Lease either didn't care about the flag or, more likely, actually recognised that the workers on the site have a little thing called freedom of speech. So the ABCC spent half a billion dollars to obtain an ideological outcome that no one, not the union, not the employers, not the workers, actually called for or supported. I think that it's the very definition of a waste of money. And it doesn't stop there. The ABCC applies the same ridiculous section to other materials. For example, COVID-19 safety posters in break rooms on work sites. Now, you might think that during the pandemic, when construction sites were kept open to support our economy, that the construction regulators should be focused on keeping workers safe. But no, 
Rather than support employers and unions to keep worksites COVID safe, the ABCC was investigating the COVID-19 safety posters in break rooms, not because there was any issue with the content of the poster, but because employer associations and union logos were both displayed in the bottom corner of the poster. Now, it is just absurd that anyone can come to this building and say that. Just when we are fighting against COVID-19 safety posters, just incredible. Half a million dollars on this nonsense, then there's the woman's bathrooms case. It's not enough to spend a half a million dollars fighting about flags and stickers. Even the standards by the former government, that are colossal waste, that's a colossal waste of money. So the ABCC is fiercely opposed to COVID-19 safety posters and to women's safety, because they opposed and spent half a million dollars to trying to stop a woman's being toilet being installed at a work site in Melbourne. Half a million dollars. Now, what else in this building code was struck out by this instrument? Let's look at the provision in the code that prevented employers and workers making agreements on a whole range of issues. For example, an agreement could contain clauses on matters dealing with safety. That's out. On clauses dealing with same job, same pay for labour hire workers. That's out. Or clauses dealing with requirements for apprentices to be used on site. That's out. Wow. What a surprise we've got a problem with a lack of trained people within this country in the construction industry. Because that's out. You can't train them. You can't come into agreement. Or clauses dealing with female participation in the workforce. That is out. Or clauses dealing with sham contracting. Of course, that's out. And the fav favourite thing is that they talk about labour productivity. In the construction sector, declined every year since the ABCC was established and before the pandemic. In 2017 to 18, the first full year of the ABCC, productivity was down 2.4 per cent. In 18 19, productivity was down 2.6 per cent. And in 2019 20, productivity was down 2.6 per cent. And here's the kicker, the real kicker. In the period between when the ABCC was abolished, by the former Labor government, and when it was re-established, productivity was actually better. Surprise, surprise, surprise. That's what happens when you interfere with the processes there. And of course, when you see such things as sham contracting, no money, no, no prosecution was done on sham contracting. This is clearly an abuse of power and time by this, by this previous government. It's laughable. Their incapacity to turn around and deal with wage theft and inappropriate payments that haven't been paid to workers absolutely deplorable. So thank you very much, uh, Deputy thank you, President. Senator Sheldon. President. Senator Watt. Thanks, uh, Acting Deputy President, and thank you, Senator Sheldon. I know that there's much more that you would have uh, liked to have said about the ABCC, but I did want to just get a couple of things on the record, specifically about the motion that we're dealing with here and regarding the order to produce documents. Uh, we will obviously be speaking further tonight about the disallowance motion on the same matters that Senator Cash has lodged, and I'll, I'll have a bit more to say there. But specifically on the order to produce documents, I just want to make the point that the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations has identified documents that were in scope for the Senate's order to produce documents uh, that was moved by Senator Cash uh, last week. Uh, and he presented those documents to, to me for tabling. Senator Cash asked for correspondence between the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations with the ABCC and the Fair Work Ombudsman. Those documents have been provided by the minister, except where they reflect deliberations of cabinet, refer to legal advice that is subject to legal professional privilege, or refer to current proceedings before a court. Senator Cash also asked for briefings from the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations in relation to the changes to the building code and the potential abolition of the ABCC. In scope briefings on, on the approach to amending the building code and abolishing the ABCC were provided by the minister uh, and have been tabled, except where they reflect deliberations of cabinet, uh, refer to legal advice that is subject to legal professional privilege or refer to current proceedings before a court. Information that is unrelated to the specifics of the Senate order was either redacted or not provided if it was a full page and personal information and contact details that are not public have also been redacted. Uh, as I, I don't know whether there were any other speakers, particularly on the OPD, um, but 
in the 40, 50 seconds I have left, I might just respond very briefly to a couple of things that have been said in this debate by members of the government. I mean, as I said the other day, um, the irony of Senator Cash, of all people, lecturing anyone about the need to consult or show courtesy. I'd like Senator Cash to advise us whether she or her office ever consulted the AWU before her office leaked a police raid on the AWU. Did they show courtesy to the AFP before uh, their office leaked information about the police raid on the AWU? Uh, and we have consulted the Australian population, the entire Australian population, about our plans to abolish the ABCC. It's called an election. Uh, we took this policy to an election. We won the election, and we now have every intention of delivering on that, pro on that pro uh, promise that we took to the election. Thank you, Senator Watt. The time for the debate has expired. Therefore, I'll put the question. The question is that the Senate take note of the statement as provided by Senator Watt. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. We have no updates to committee memberships, uh, but we do have messages from the House of Representatives. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Australian Human Rights Commission Legislation Amendment Selection and Appointment Bill 2022 for concurrence. I call the Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bill may proceed without formalities and be read a first time. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to the appointment of members of the Australian Human Rights Commission and for related purposes. I call the minister. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion to exempt this bill from the bill's cut-off order. Is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Minister. I table a statement of reasons justifying the need for this bill to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statement incorporated in your hand side. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to this bill. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Leave granted, leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Social Security Administration Amendment Repeal of Cashless Debit Card and Other Measures Bill 2022 for concurrence. I call the Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the motion moved by the Minister be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to Social Security and for related purposes. I call the Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, in accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 5 September 2022. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Restoring Territory Rights Bill 2022 for concurrence. Senator Shikoni. Uh, thank you, Chair. On behalf of Senator Gallagher, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a uh, first time. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Shikoni on behalf of Senator Gallagher be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against all those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to the legislative powers of territories and for related purposes. Senator Coney. Thank you, Acting President. Uh, I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. In accordance with, this, with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 5 September 2022. I call the clerk to call on business.
Business of the Senate, notice of motion number two, disallowance of the code for the tendering and performance of building work amendment instrument 2022. Senator Cash. Thank you. And I move this motion and also now will speak on the disallowance of the code for tendering and performance of building work amendment instrument 2022. Acting Deputy President, one may want to ask, with rising inflation, with rising interest rates, with Australians under pressure from the cost of living increases, you have to ask yourself, why would the Albanese Labor government move to abolish the Australian Building and Construction Commission? We all know the answer to that question. It's because they're beholden to the CFMEU. As we've said, donations come in to the Australian Labor Party and the CFMEU's policy wants are then delivered to them. But given the current economic situation, Given the importance of the construction industry to the Australian economy, given the fact that in May of this year what we saw with economy-wide modelling undertaken by EY, what that actually showed was this. There could be an overall economic cost over the next decade should the ABCC be abolished. Why would any government given their current economic circumstances, given the continuing global headwinds, given the interest rate rises that we saw yesterday, given rising inflation, wouldn't you pause for just one moment and say, is handing over Australia's construction industry to the most militant union in Australia, as said by the independent judiciary time and time again, is that actually the right move to make? Is that actually in the interests or the best interests of the Australian people? No. Acting Deputy President, I just want to share with you, because this is very important, this economic modelling was undertaken by EY and handed down in May of this year. So let's just have a look at it. Key economic costs, this is to the Australian people, ultimately it's to mum and dad, it's the Australian taxpayer. This is what EY have said. Output in the construction industry could fall by around $35.4 billion by 2030, as higher cost inflation makes fewer projects possible and capital is reallocated to other economic activities. Overall economic activity could, uh, could de decline by $47.5 billion by 2030, as higher costs and lower productivity act as a handbrake on other sectors. And then this is the reality for Australians who currently have a job in the construction industry. Lower economic growth could see, acting Deputy President, the loss of around 4,000 full-time jobs across the economy. So you need to ask yourself again, despite, yes, the ideological hatred mm. of the tough cop on the beat, and we all accept that, because the Labor Party's position in relation to the Australian Building and Construction Commission is clear. But why would you disregard modelling done by EY that tells you that the whole of economy cost between now and 2030 could be $47.5 billion, but not only that, the lower economic growth that Australia will go through because of the impact on the construction industry, will mean 4,000 Australians won't have full-time jobs. Every time those on the other side say that they stand up for the worker, say that they need to be doing more to get Australians into jobs, well, you're about to take out, according to the modelling undertaken by EY, 4,000 Australians that won't have a job. And why? because you are beholden to the most militant and thuggish union in Australia. And of course, then there is the employment and the labour cost impact. And again, this is modelling undertaken by the respected firm EY. The construction industry, as we know, is without a doubt one of the largest employers in Australia. It employs around 1.15 million people. But what we also know is that the construction industry directly supports jobs in other Australian industries. For example, the timber industry, the cement industry, you know, the steel industry. 
manufacturing. So when you actually hand over the construction industry to the most militant union in Australia, when you actually take into account the whole of economy economic impacts that EY has said, those 4,000 jobs are just the start. So again, for a government that stands up and says, we put the interests of Australians first, we put the interests of Australian jobs first, they are actually condoning the loss of up to 4,000 jobs in the construction sector. And again, you have to ask yourself, why would a government facing rising inflation, why would a government facing rising interest rates, why would a government that openly admits it is facing rising costs of living then move to destroy the fifth largest industry in Australia, which we know will then have flow-on impacts, downstream impacts, to other industries in Australia. So what are you saying to those who work in the timber industry? What are you saying to those who work in the steel industry? What are you saying to those who work in the cement manufacturing industry? Well, this is what you're saying. You actually don't matter. Because you see, unless you're part of the CFMEU, unless you are donating around a million dollars a year to the Australian Labor Party, you actually do not count. But, Madam Acting Deputy President, one of the biggest concerns that has been raised with me with the neutering of the building code and the abolition of the ABCC is who is actually going to protect workers in the construction industry from thuggish behaviour. But what is more, who is going to stop the harassment of women by officials within the CFMMEU? And worse, that is one of the biggest concerns that has been raised by stakeholders. What the Labor Party is doing by abolishing the Australian Building and Construction Commission is effectively condoning the CFMEU's vile record of appalling treatment of women. And I'm going to build on what Senator Scar has already put on record, because as he said, there is page after page after page of vile behaviour, vile behaviour that CFMEU officials have been found guilty of when it comes to the harassment of women on building sites in this country. What does the ABCC do? Well, it's dismissed by those on the other side. It actually takes action. Right. It takes court action to protect the rights of women in the construction industry. And what does the Australian Labor Party say? We don't care what the Australian courts say. All we sector. care is about the CFMEU. And that is the same John Setka that has been found guilty of domestic violence on multiple occasions, including incidents where he bashed his partner's head against a table repeatedly, and another where he pushed her down a staircase. But let's also go to some of the behaviour that the courts have found repulsive, but those on the other side are effectively condoning by abolishing the ABCC. These are just a few examples. A CFMMU official jailed for assault, jailed for assault, once told a female inspector she was an effing slut, asking her if she had brought knee pads, as I quote, you are going to be sucking off these effing dogs all day. The Australian oh, nice. Labor Party effectively condones that behaviour. Outrageous. The Courier Mail revealed a CFMMU official this. allegedly barked like a dog at a female health and safety consultant on a Gold Coast construction site and said this, go on, off you go, you effing dog, see, go get your place. He then allegedly said, called her an effing dog, see, twice more that day. Some of the sexist incidents recorded in the files of the Australian Building and Construction Commission include a CFMEU official, a threat, uh, official threatening to gang rape a woman after she inspected their site. So one of the union officials also spat at a female workplace inspector during one visit this. A female workplace inspector, someone who was just doing site. their job. They said this. They were called an effing slut 
and a dog by the union officials. And do you know what they were doing, Acting Deputy President? They were just doing their job. Gets worse. CFMMU delegates were accused of harassing the daughter, the daughter of a builder when they picketed a work site. Why would you harass the daughter of a builder? Why? The picketers were accused of harassing the daughter of the builder when she entered the site in her car by commenting on her breasts and her bottom. Seriously? Young girls have enough issues today, let alone with a thug from the CFMMEU commenting on her breasts and her bottom. It gets worse, though. A CFMMEU official made three phone calls late at night to a female inspector's mobile phone. The last call logged at 11.23 p.m. An anonymous flyer was then circulated referring to the woman as a dog who wanted to become a pole dancer. The flyer gave the name of the woman's husband, her home address and home phone number. A number of threatening calls were made. One caller said, you're an effing rat. Another caller said, me and my seven mates are going to come and F you. A former Fair Work Building Commissioner employee was subject to intimidation by John Setka and another CFMEU official. Mr Setka and, lo and behold, Mr Reardon made a number of sexually derogatory remarks. She found three missed phone calls from Mr Reardon and one missed phone call from Mr Setka, who left a sexually derogatory message on her telephone. So that's just a snippet of the behaviour that is condoned by those on the other side. But let me just follow up on what Senator Scar was referring to in the recent case where the CFMMEU and two of its officials were given the maximum penalty, $151,200, following right of entry beaches, but get this, which included disgusting slurs on an individual on the $5.4 billion Queensland Cross River Rail project. The judge in that case said this, and it was Judge Vasta, said this. He had absolutely no doubt that CFMMEU official Luke Gibson called the safety adviser a pumpkin eater, which was meant as a homophobic slur. And guess what? Senator Scar was right. They had to add an annexure to the judgment to explain what that term meant, and any person who reads it should be utterly disgusted at the words that were uttered by a CFMMEU official, Luke Gibson, saying that to a safety adviser. What an absolute disgrace. Where is Anthony Albanese standing up and fronting the Australian people and actually saying the words, I condemn CFMEU official Luke Gibson for saying those disgusting homophobic slurs. The judge actually also says this. The belligerent response and subsequent behaviour of Mr Blakely and Mr Gibson speaks of a sense of entitlement and a recalcitrance to behaving as ordinary, decent human beings. He goes on to say this. The behaviour of uttering quite disgusting homophobic slurs has been consigned to the chapters of the dark history of Australia, where the hurling of vitriolic insults which targeted a person's sexuality, race or religion were unfortunately tolerated as if such belittling and bullying was something that a victim just had to cop. He then goes on to say this, thankfully those days are gone and only troglodytes would attempt to resurrect them. Well, For Mr there. Blakely and Mr Gibson, who get this, get this, they are actually allegedly fit and proper persons to hold an entry permit pursuant to section 512 of the Fair Work Act to utter such slurs to bully and belittle a person simply must be deterred by all means available to the court. I would also argue by all means available to any Australian government, and that includes by ensuring there is a tough cop on the beat. Where is the Prime Minister standing up and saying any person, and in particular a CFMEU official who utters disgusting homophobic slurs, you have no right 
to be found a fit and proper person and given a right of entry pass, which quite frankly is a privilege to go onto building sites in this country. But what does Mr Albanese do? Nothing. Crickets. I dare him to stand up and condemn and say the name of this official in the same sentence. Thank you, Senator Cash. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The sanctity of work. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to make a plea to support workers. I've worked in canneries, manufacturing, restaurants uh, in, in the kitchen. I've worked in the vineyards. I've worked under the sun. I've worked underground. I've worked in open-cut coal mines. But my greatest joy was working underground as a coal-faced miner. That's where I got my proud, proudest time at work. People spend around eight to nine hours on average per day working. It's an extremely important part of our lives. And the sanctity of work is extremely important. And that is being destroyed by negligent managers across sectors, but also, sadly, by rogue union bosses in some large unions. I've been a member of the coal mine union, the predecessor to the CFMEU. I've dealt with them as a manager. Not only was I a member as a coal-faced worker underground for three years, I also dealt with them later and enjoyed dealing with them because they treated miners with respect back in the 70s and 80s. And I've dealt with the CFMEU later as a general manager when they took over the coal mining union. But sadly today, many union bosses do not look after workers. Miners, I found, were great people, are great people, and I love that work underground. But I have become disgusted with some union bosses in some very large companies. I'm very proud to support unions in this country. They're necessary. I'm very proud to support workers in this country. They are fabulous people, salt of the earth. But I am disgusted with some union bosses in some large unions. Not all, some. I have concerns particularly with the CFMEU. The CFMEU was one of the founding donors of the Get Up organisation. Imagine that. The CFMEU at the time donated $1.3 million to the, to the foundation of Get Up. And what's Get Up's number one project, number one campaign? To shut down the coal industry. So the CFMEU, supposedly representing miners, was paying the get up to shut down the coal industry. Disgusted. They want to kill coal. And then I became aware of the Hunter Valley CFMEU, what it was doing to miners, not for miners, working against miners. I've spoken about that in the last almost three years now. Well, it is three years now. I've put up and reintroduced, I introduced into the Senate in the previous parliament and reintroduced just last week my bill for equal pay for equal work. Because union bosses have done deals, grubby deals, with multinationals, labour hire companies, including an offshoot from the largest labour hire company, a foreign owned multinational from Japan, that have gutted workers' pay in the Hunter Valley. Miners in ca on casual, casual employment are being paid 40% less than miners on permanent work at the same mine, right beside each other, doing the same job with the same responsibilities. Forty per cent less, thanks to a, a, a union bosses and agreeing to enterprise agreements that do not favour the miners. Miners have lost their basic leave entitlements, their basic protections. We know of miners who have been, who've been almost killed and who have been to totally and permanently incapacitated, disabled. No workers' compensation. None. And the CFMEU in the Hunter Valley knew about it. Now, I know that the CFMEU um, in, in the mining industry and the CFMEU in the construction side merged. And I think they split apart again very quickly because they couldn't see eye to eye with each other. Safety neglected, pay neglected, leave neglected, basic entitlements neglected. Not only neglected, exploited and stolen from these workers. And the Labor Party neglected them 
for many, many years. It wasn't until I came along that we pushed that case, and we've, we've had some wins for those miners. But I was staggered that the CFMEU, which used to protect miners in the 80s, is now exploiting miners. And then we saw construction workers in Melbourne attack John Setka and the other union bosses in the CFMEU construction division in Melbourne last year, late last year, because they didn't stand up for workers who were being mandated with, a, with an unproven injection. And then we saw the Royal Commission, the Hayden Royal Commission, 2015 to 2016, maybe around 2014, come up with all those comments about the thugs operating at the senior levels of the CFMEU construction division. Unions were formed back in the late 19th century to protect workers, pay rates, security, seniority, safety, retirement, benefits, entitlements, protections, and they were absolutely necessary. One of the things that destroyed some unions is that they have become monopolies. And when you have a monopoly, you have people not willing to face up to competition. They no longer have to provide a service that's competitive. I'll take you back to my experience as a general manager in central Queensland, dealing with um, a CFMEU vice president, Jim Lambley. He told me one day, as we were negotiating and eventually agreed on, a landmark business ent enterprise award, the first of its kind in the coal industry, first radically different, and we protected workers with that because we lined up what workers wanted and what shareholders wanted, and we, we had a, a fabulous agreement. We had the lowest turnover of any mine in central Queensland at the time. We weren't paying excessive. We weren't paying less. We were paying about typical of the, indus of the industry in central Queensland. But we had the lowest turnover, 1 per cent, despite vigorous recruiting of our miners from other competitors. And why? Because we had that in agreement in the interests of the workers and the, and the shareholders. Because both are needed to, to provide security and performance for a business and for ongoing employment. We also had the best safety performance of any large underground coal mine in the country, way ahead of any other mine in the country, because we worked with miners and as, as managers. It's no longer, as, as Jim Lambley told me back then, this was back in the 90s, that the CFMEU had lost sight of the workers and the CFMEU needed to get back to providing a service. But it doesn't have to provide a service when it's a monopoly. And that's what's hurting workers in this country. Workers are being shafted because union bosses in some large organisations, including the CF at CFMEU, are looking after their own interests. They're, own, they're feathering their own nest, their political ambitions, their control of money, the control of a whole industry sector. We know that's what's going on with the construction division of the CFMEU, and it is disgusting. And I've been told by miners in the CFMEU, I've been told by construction workers in the CFMEU, that they are tired of giving their money to the union to give to the Labor Party, because the Labor Party doesn't stand for workers anymore. The CFMEU doesn't stand for workers anymore. The CFMEU stands for control. The Labor Party has lost sight of workers. The Labor Party is against workers. I had to beg and plead with the Labor Party in the Hunter Valley, and all they did was misrepresent what I was doing. But we persisted and persisted and persisted. They weren't interested in supporting the workers. I look across at, at Senator Stirl, and I'm in admiration of his genuine concern for workers, his genuine service to workers, his genuine uh, support for workers. I really am. Senator Sheldon, the late Alec Gallagher, impressive people doing their job. But some other unions are not doing theirs. What the problem is, is that we have found unions were formed to protect workers, but they lost sight of that because they're monopolies, no, no competition, no accountability, and so we have exploitation of the people that they're supposed to protect their workers, their, their members. I'm very strongly in support of unions and union members, very strongly in support of workers, whether or not they are union members. But I'm against thugs that run intimidation rackets and control rackets, and that's why we need the ABCC to remain. I also point again to the Labor Party's lack of consultation in this, in this topic. 
They just abolished it with minimal consultation. Well, I've listened to small companies in the construction field. I've listened to, to workers in the construction field. They don't want to go back to the lawless jungle. They do not want that. They want some protections and some security. I serve the people of Queensland and Australia and thousands of workers all over this country. That's who I serve and that's why I want to retain the ABCC. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Watt? Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, there's a lot I could say, but out of consideration for the other speakers that I know want to speak on this, I'll keep my remarks quite brief. Um, I won't go on at length as I could about the utter shamelessness of Senator Cash, of all people, coming in and lecturing anyone uh, about consultation, about lawlessness, about courtesy, or for that matter anyone from the former government wanting to lecture anyone about sexist behaviour and homophobia. I mean, I think everyone understands Order. the utter shamelessness uh, of Order. anyone from the government, the former Order. government, lecturing Order, anyone left. about those matters. There are any number of judicial comments I could, I could refer to, and I referred to some in question time yesterday, which point out um, the trivial nature of so much of the activity of the ABCC run up at cost at, at taxpayers' expense. Order. Yeah, I do think it's trivial. Order. I do think it's trivial Order. to pursue building companies over the, the fact that they allow their workers to put on stickers on their helmets. I think that is pretty trivial. I think it's a waste of taxpayers' money to spend half a million dollars pursuing construction companies over matters like that or about or about flags um, that they display. Order. Now as I, said, as I said in, yes, in question Order time yesterday, left. and I repeat now, Senator there is no place Senator for Sullivan. thuggish or sexist or homophobic behaviour in a workplace, whether it be a parliament, something that certain people might need to reflect on, or it be on a construction site. There is no place for that kind of behaviour on any workplace. But that is not what this motion is about, uh, as much as the opposition might try to make it about that. Let's be very clear what this motion is about. With this motion, Senator Cash and her coalition colleagues seek to lock in low productivity in our construction industry, more red tape for employers and workers, and remove freedom of expression, things that I thought were actually uh, hallmarks of the modern Liberal Party. So they want to bring down productivity um, because anyone who looks at the, the statistics about labour productivity since the ABCC was introduced can see that it's actually fallen in the, in the construction sector. It's about tying firms up with more red tape, such as things about whether posters can be displayed, union posters, whether stickers can be put up, whether flags can be put up. It's about banning, banning companies from Order. coming to agreements with their own workers Order. about the employment of On apprentices. And you know, we left. hear this chorus yet again oh, from the order. opposition, who all of a sudden, order, order, despite everything order, that we know happened before the election, left. have this confected Senator outrage Hughes. about the position of Senator women in Hughes. workplaces. Well, what this what this code uh, uh, what this code seeks to do, this code that this the opposition wants to keep in place, what it does is stop employers and employees reaching agreements about things like women's participation in the workplace. So if you want to be serious about how women are treated in workplaces, why would you not get rid of a code that tries to stop employers and employees coming to arrangements with their unions about how women are treated on a workplace? So the utter hypocrisy, the rank hypocrisy of the opposition, all of a sudden, despite everything that we know happened before the election in terms of treatment of women in workplaces in this very building, or, or all of a left. sudden have become converts to the idea that women need to be protected in workplaces by trying to get rid of a code or trying to keep a code that stops companies and employees come into agreements about women's participation. As I say, there is so much more I can say uh, in response uh, to uh, what uh, government uh, opposition senators have say, but out of respect for my colleagues, I'll make sure that there's enough time for them to add to it as well. Senator O'Sullivan, and then I'll come to Senator Faruqi. But Senator O'Sullivan, what was first? Uh, well, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, here we see on display uh, the, the very you know, the, the highest example of a protection racket that's been run uh, for the, the thuggery, for the abuse, for the, all the examples of what is the worst, the worst part of the, the union movement. Because we know, and as my colleagues have, have said, and, and Senator 
Uh, Senator Roberts said as well, there are of course some wonderful examples of unions that are organising appropriately, that represent their workers, that do, you know, frankly, a, a good job. My wife uh, has worked as a nurse for many years, and uh, she was part of the, the nursing union over there in Western Australia, and was represented well by, by that union, I must say. And uh, so, so this, but what we're seeing is no mention at all of the, or even an utterance of the word the CF, of the CFMEU. You can't. But bring yourself at all to say such a, 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 a to recognise that organisation because you're ashamed of it. You're ashamed of it. Any time there's a photo put up, oh, quickly hide it away, hide it away. I don't want to be seen with these people. You don't want to be seen with these sort of people. I mean, the the the, the utter shame, the utter shame of uh, of, of what the, the examples that have been set Order. here in this place is 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 terrible. Order. Absolutely terrible. Absolutely terrible, and and you know what? Uh, actually, the lack of shame, the lack of shame on on this topic is uh, is is something that is actually genuinely unmatched, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I, I I thought that we might actually see the ABCC, the Australian Building Construction Commission, maybe slowly stripped of its powers, maybe maybe over a few years, or maybe even a, a few months, maybe even a few months, Senator Brockman. Uh, through you, Chair. That we, but if, what we're seeing is there's this rapid uh, uh, progress towards absolutely abolishing and, and getting rid of this cop on the beat that would actually serve an important role in ensuring that the examples that, that Senator Cash was speaking about, the, the, the examples that weren't just examples of anecdotes, these are, were found to be true, having come through the courts. Even the highest court in our land has found that these cases of gross uh, thuggery and, and abuse on workplaces and intimidation is, is real. These aren't just anecdotes just brought up by you know, sectional interest. This is actually found to be true by the High Court itself. But when we thought that we might see it's this, the ABCC slowly stripped of its power bit by bit and quietly whittled away to a much smaller body over time. But how wrong was I? Uh, the members and senators involved in the ABCC the ABCC, uh, um, members and senators of, of, of those opposites, uh, want to strip the ABCC and remove its power and remove its role in ensuring that workplaces are safe, indeed our construction industry. They don't have a plan to deal with inflation. They, they don't have a, a plan to deal with the, with the cost of living pressures. Uh, they have no plan, as we heard from Senator Watt last week, and he's tried to explain his way through this this week uh, as uh, Minister Watt uh, for Agriculture Minister. They have no plan to deal with the FMD and to, and to deal with the, with the FMD uh, situation that we're seeing. Uh, it's a real threat on the, uh, to, to farmers across our country. They have no plan, but they do have a plan. They do have a plan to allow lawlessness to continue in this country on building sites. They have a plan to, to have lawlessness continue to occur on building sites where thuggery occurs and, and, and where there's abuse of workers, uh, and that is able to go untethered. It's able to continue on in workplaces because they're wanting to strip away, strip away the powers of the ABCC and, in fact, abolish, abolish the ABCC. Uh, they don't have a plan to, to to deal with the economy, they don't have a plan to deal with inflation, but they've got a plan, a plan to get rid of the ABCC. They have a fully formed plan to hand the CFMEU a free reign on building sites again. An unbelievable yet somehow totally unsurprising set of priorities from the ALP. When it comes to the union movement, it seems that crime really does pay. It really does pay, because you know what we know is that the the, the CFMEU in particular is, is one of the biggest donors to the ALP, feeding their election campaigns. So is this why? Is this why we're seeing that crime in fact does pay? That if that, and, and because you've got an example here of where there's a protection racket that's been run. Now, on the day after the announcement of the ABCC's abolition, a CFMEU official was called out for appalling abuse and intimidation of workers. Yet they're still persisting. I mean, even after you might think they might check themselves. You know, after making an announcement about the change and an announcement about getting rid of the ABCC, you thought they might actually 
check themselves, but no. It becomes clearer and clearer that the ALP don't actually stand up for workers. They stand up for the unions, unions that cover less than one in ten private sector employees. Workers don't want to be physically intimidated and abused at work. They don't want to be physically abused at work or intimidated at work. They want to go about their jobs and go about it safely and, importantly, without intimidation. I mean, imagine that, going to a job and thinking, is today going to be the day where I'm going to get abused again? Is today going to be the day where I'm going to be confronted by someone that's going to intimidate me, that's going to you know, you know, pull me down, that's going to ridicule me, that's going to make me feel uh, unsafe in the workplace? And that's what, sadly, too many of our workers across this country have to put up with, particularly, particularly on construction work sites. The Labor Party is stripping back the very watchdog that is working to prevent this thuggery, that is working to prevent these uh, shameful acts that occur on these work sites. But you know who is standing up for the workers? It's actually the ABCC. Yeah. While the unions run around racking up fines and disrupting workplaces, the ABCC has, since 2016, when it was re-established, recovered over $5 million in unpaid wages and entitlements for construction workers. Funny, you'd think that it was a, that's something that actually the union would be doing. But no, it's actually the ABCC, the ABCC who's done this. And this is only since 2019, over $13.5 million in progress claims for subcontractors have been recovered. Since 2019, over $13.5 million. Now, Prime Minister Albanese and Labor talk a big game. They come in here and talk about wage theft. Well, well on wage theft, they, they voted against our bill that we took when we were in government to criminalise wage theft. And now they want to abolish the ABCC, who have recovered millions of dollars in wages and entitlements for Australian workers. Now, I don't actually have time here today to go through every example, all the egregious examples of the CFMEU's abuse of power and abuse of people. Even if I only focused on the last few weeks, I wouldn't have enough time to actually uncover all that and, and reveal and, and, and Take it. I'd have to come in here with volumes indeed to be able to cover the full extent of what we're seeing. But we know, we know that some of these unions are prepared to do anything. And in fact, they'll justify breaking the law. They will, they will, they will justify anything it takes. In fact, that's what we know. Sally McManus, thank you. <laughs> I, I take that interjection. I take that interjection. That, 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 that you can justify a law if it's unjust. She said, in, um, Sally McManus, the head of the ACTU, said she doesn't see a problem with breaking the law if it's unjust. If the law is unjust, it doesn't matter that it might be the law of the land. But if, in their opinion, they think it's unjust, that's okay. That's okay. You can break the law. But the union movement sees legal fees and fines, as, as, look, just simply as a cost. A cost of doing business. A cost of doing business. The union movement sees legal fees and fines as a cost of doing business. Not to mention the thuggery that happens on site. Now, in recent years, over 16 million dollars in fines have been imposed on the CFMEU. Judges have observed that these penalties are not enough for a union to, that, that treats them like parking tickets. Uh, of the 16. 161 contraventions on industrial law brought against the CFMEU, 91 per cent were uphold. So clearly this body, th this body is not being frivolous but is actually playing a genuine role. And what we're seeing from those opposite is they're wanting to remove uh, this body that's actually playing a genuine role in ensuring that workplaces are safe, ensuring that people can go to work and just do their jobs and, be, and be, be happy about the work that they do. And we talk about cost of living. We talk about the impact that this would have. Well, we know that there were studies, I believe it was by uh, EY who, and the Master Building Association, who together found that, uh, that, that, that this is going to, if you, the removal and the economic loss from the ABCC's abolition would, is estimated to cost $47.5 billion. 
as the cost overruns from the construction industry spill over into other sectors. $47.5 billion. So at a time when you know, there is pressure on the economy, there's a lot going on globally, we, we accept that. There's a lot that's happening from international pressures. Well, why would you want to impose a greater hit to the Australian economy? The construction industry makes up 10 per cent of the economy. And you're wanting to impose even greater costs and greater impact. Now, that's not just for uh, that's not just for, for, for the, the workers, but importantly, that's for those that are working, uh, that for, for those that are paying to have a construction uh, project delivered for them. Whether that's the taxpayer, whether that's employers, uh, whether that's uh, customers, mums and dads, whoever it is that are seeking the, the service of that industry, they're the ones that actually end up paying for it. And ultimately, it's the Australian taxpayer that pays. Not to mention the misery and the shame. Uh, that is caused and the, 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 the difficulty that is caused for an individual that has to go to work and face the intimidation, that has to go to work and face the thuggery of unions that, and officials. And, and admittedly, it, it might just be sections within it, but you need a cop on the beat to make sure that there is protection there, that someone doesn't need to go to workplace and, and be under any threat to, uh, to their livelihood and their enjoyment at work. So, uh, Madam, uh, Mr. Sorry, uh, <laughs> Acting President, uh, oh, I seek leave so, to so, continue so, my so, remarks. So, Senator O'Sullivan, being 19:20, uh, I propose the Senate now adjourn. You will be in continuation um, when the debate continues. And uh, Senator Polly. Yes, I rise to echo the comments of Treasurer Jim Chalmers about what the Australian economy is facing right now and what Australians are facing, including increased costs of living pressures being felt at the supermarket and at the petrol pump. There's a lot of concern about the state of the global economy, concerns out of the US, we have China, we have the Ukraine situation. The entire world is experiencing high rates of inflation, rising interest rates, and a consequence of that is slow growth trends across sectors. Food and energy security is also placing great pressure on the demand side of the economy. And as we know too well, governments are somewhat hamstrung in their ability to respond to these issues because of the high debt incurred during the pandemic. Debt which equates to a $1 trillion, a legacy of the former Liberal government, 10 long years of drift and poor economic policy. Australia is facing these economic headwinds, but we go into these difficult set of circumstances with his historically low unemployment. This is a huge boost to our position, but we must have the right economic plan for these set of circumstances. It's up to the Reserve Bank to make decisions around the level of interest rates based on the condition of the high and rising inflation we are witnessing across the economy. Pressure on people's cost of living comes from the supply side of the economy. Therefore, it is crucial that we as a government provide appropriate cost of living relief in the October budget, but also put in place a policy framework for lifting the Australian economy. We have delivered in that respect with a historic wage increase for people on the minimum wage. This is where the Albanese Labor government plans for cleaner and cheaper energy, childcare reforms, investing in skills and the digital economy, advancing manufacturing and the care economy are so important. This is the plan our nation needs now to help deal with the complex set of circumstances emerging within the global economy. Now all Australians understand what we have inherited from the previous Liberal government, a trillion dollars worth of debt which is costing more and more to pay off because of the increase in interest rates. We have to prioritise, and we will always prioritise, prioritise sorry, what is important to the Australian people, what benefits Australian families. Now, the paid pandemic leave payment for casuals is something that the government, along with state and territory leaders, are supportive of, which is why the government has extended this until the end of September. We as a government and the Treasurer have made it very clear that we must deal with the legacy of rorts and waste under the previous Liberal government. 
be buckets of taxpayer money handed out at ministerial discretion was occurring for years under the previous Liberal government. Now we must manage the economy based off what we have inherited, what we face today and the context of the Australian economy on a daily basis. Every dollar that the previous government borrowed is now more expensive to service because of the increase in interest rates. The Liberals left a legacy of nine long years of economic mismanagement and missed opportunities. Now we must be under we must not be under any illusion about what we are facing in this country. Inflation is increasing and interest rates with it. But the argument that wages in Australia are putting pressure on inflation is incorrect. It's basically wrong because wages have been going backwards. Of all the circumstances that are contributing to inflation, wages is certainly not one of them, no matter what those on the other side of this chamber like to say. Lifting interest rates is aiming to deal with the demand of the economy. Now, one of the reasons we have high inflation is due to the choked off supply. We must have more resilient supply chains, and Labor has a plan to deal with this. We talk about it during the election campaign. We must, with urgency, improve Australia's sovereign capacity to support local manufacturing. We must let the country thrive. We must give them the opportunities to increase wages and invest in the productivity capacity of the economy to make more resilient is the primary objective of the Albanese Labor government. This Labor government will invest in the capacity of Australian people and we will support them to Thank train you, and Senator scale Paul, up. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. People are doing it really tough. Many are left with the choice of putting food on the table or paying rent or going to the dentist. And all this while, we are still trying to cope with the pandemic. There is no question that people need cost of living relief. This is the time to make some monumental changes to do exactly that by investing in essential services. Early childhood education and care is one of those public services that needs urgent attention. After many years of being considered a third or fourth order political issue, early learning is pretty close to front and centre of the political agenda, as it ought to be. A radical rethinking of early education and care has been long time coming, and in no small part due to the advocacy of so many in the sector and the community who have fought hard for recognition of early learning for what it really is, an essential service that is critical for children in the early years of their development. And it should be well-funded, universal, and fee-free. In his address last week, the Governor-General stated, the ultimate goal is to add affordable childcare to the list of universal services, alongside Medicare, the NDIS, and superannuation that Australians cherish. The Greens welcome the aspiration of delivering childcare as a universal service. We have been saying for many years now that early childhood education and care should be free and universal, an essential service. We took to the election a bold, fully costed plan for free and universal early childhood education and care across Australia. As the Green spokesperson for education, I am so proud to lead this work. I want to highlight, however, the urgency of the task ahead and the need not only for the new government to get on with the job of raising the childcare subsidy, but also to deliver a far more ambitious agenda that tackles affordability, workforce, including pay and conditions, and this terrible reliance on for-profit early education providers. Education should never be for profit. Gap fees are going through the roof, while there are thousands of staff vacancies in our childcare centres across the country. Alarmingly, short-staffed services are increasingly relying on staffing waivers just to keep their doors open. Centre staff and children suffer when this is made more and more common. The United Workers' Union has announced that its workers will go on strike in September. I give my full solidarity and support to those educators who are demanding a better deal. The union has said educators are leaving the sector in record numbers every week due to burnout, workload and low pay. Centres across the country are having 
to limit enrollments, close rooms, and cancel staff leave. Children and families are suffering due to the strain. After nearly a decade of inaction on early learning, educators have had enough. Several critical new reports have been released in just the last few days, which further highlight the need for swift and systemic reform of early learning. The Center for Policy Developments, starting now, the Australia Institute's Child Care Review and Strike Require Systemic Solutions, and Thrive by Five's Early Childhood Education and Care Workforce Action Plan are calls to action for the incoming government, variously on affordability, on a well-treated workforce, on excellence in early learning, on tackling private provision, and the list goes on. The treatment of early childhood educators is a national shame. Early childhood educators continued to be paid well below what would be expected of those with their responsibility and skills. A proper workforce strategy must be delivered and actually implemented with the early learning sector and unions to achieve higher professional pay and better working conditions. The child care can simply cannot be quick kicked down the road by this government. This should be a top priority. The billionaires and the tax-dodging, profiteering fossil fuel corporations that are driving the climate crisis must be made to pay their fair share so we can have the public services everyday people living in Australia need. While I have no doubt that there is much careful work to do, I do not want to see the government deferring much of its work on childcare until after a drawn-out review or only following the release of its vaunted early years strategy. We need free and universal early education and care now, with educators who have the best pay and conditions. We need action now. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Payman. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Before I start, please note this is not my first speech. I've learnt it the hard way. <laughs> I'm honoured to be here in this place as the youngest member of the Senate in the 47th Parliament. In the previous government, young Australians were shunned and locked out from policy decisions that impacted their lives and futures. As a young Australian, I know that our voices were not heard, and as a result, the policies of the previous government raided our retirement savings, made it harder to access education and training, and did nothing for accessible housing. Young Australians are diverse, they're engaged in politics, and they want to be listened to. When an issue is present in society, it is often young people who are affected most. It is young people mostly feeling the pinch in rental markets or when trying to buy a home. It is young people most disadvantaged by the casualisation of the workforce. It is young people most acutely impacted by the previous government's attacks on higher education and TAFE. I am proud to be a young Labor senator, elected to this place because I know that this Albanese Labor government will engage the youth. We are committed to establishing a framework to engage with young Australians establishing an office for youth, and we have an incredible minister for youth in Dr. An Ali. On the campaign trail, I often heard from young people who wanted change. They were sick of the rorts and wanted a national anti-corruption commission with teeth. They were tired of their universities and TAFEs being attacked. They wanted to see a parliament that truly reflected their community, and they wanted a government who would end the climate wars and take action on climate change. Labor listened, and the Albanese Labor government delivered a better future, will deliver a better future for young Australians. And as the youngest member of this parliament, I'm committed to continuing to listen. On the 1st of July, I began my term as a senator for my home state, Western Australia, and it is an honor to stand here representing WA. During the election campaign, the previous government threw everything they could to try and hold on to power. They bought buses and trucks, they were supported by minor fringe parties, and they made hundreds of promises. But Western Australians remember. We remembered 
the promises that were broken time and time again. We remembered that they used taxpayers' money to support Clive Palmer against our state. We remembered the political games played during the height of the pandemic. We remembered when the former Prime Minister Scott Morrison called us cave people. And so, Western Australians made a choice for a better future. And we voted out a government which had taken us for granted for far too long. And I'm so lucky to be representing my home state. And I'm committed to making sure that the voice of Western Australia is heard here in Canberra. There is a feeling in WA that we are not heard or respected enough in this place. We saw it time and time again during the last government. We are essentially, if I may, the nation's breadwinner, and yet often national discussions seem to treat the eastern states as the centre of the universe or the gold standard. As a senator for WA, I will not let this be the case. In every committee I am on, in the meetings I have, the interviews I give, and the speeches I make in this place, I will always be fighting for WA. I will always stand up for my home state, my beloved home state of WA, and I'll never take it for granted. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Payman. Uh, Senator Patterson. Uh, I rise to recognise the 70th anniversary of the establishment of Australia's secret intelligence service, ACES. In May of 1952, the horrors of World War II were fresh in the minds of many Australians. The Korean War was underway, and the Cold War presented an ever-present risk of going hot. Australia has always benefited from the trusted relationships of our most important allies. Our like-minded partners were as important in 1952 as they are today. However, the then Prime Minister, Robert Menzies, knew that Australia could not simply rely upon friends to share important information. He knew Australia needed to, to develop its own ability to collect foreign intelligence and to co conduct covert operations in our national interest. Working closely with the Cabinet Minister, Richard Casey, it was Menzies who drove the creation of the Australian Secret Intelligence Service through a then secret order of the Governor-General's Executive Council. The new agency was to be led by Alfred Deakin Brooks, a former Army intelligence officer. The new agency took much inspiration from Great Britain's MI6 and was charged with two key priorities, the collection of foreign intelligence offshore and the execution of special operations. These operations were envisaged to be very much like the type undertaken in the Second World War, where brave men and women risked their lives to uncover secrets, cultivate critical knowledge and engage in clandestine activities to disrupt or deter an enemy. These two priorities remain the core mission of the modern Australian Secret Intelligence Service, and they remain as relevant today as we confront our own dangerous geopolitical reality. By its very nature, Australians will never know the names or much of the work undertaken by ACES officers in defence of our national interest. Other than the Director General, Paul Simon, and his deputies, Fabio Maloney and Catherine Byrne, they cannot even legally be named. But there are many station chiefs, officers, analysts and data scientists here in Australia and around the world whose work makes us safer every day. We do not have to look far to find significant threats to peace, stability and prosperity in the world today. Our European friends face significant hostility from an aggressive and expansionist Russia. Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine has implications for the whole world and presents a real threat to the free and democratic institutions we seek to defend and uphold. Closer to home, the Chinese Communist Party continues to embark on a military build-up of historic proportions. While the PLA Air Force routinely harasses the people of Taiwan and engages in increasingly aggressive, aggressive tactics in an attempt to prevent free transit in the Indo-Pacific. We have been warned by our own security agencies, including ASIO, of industrial-scale espionage, foreign interference and cyber attacks against our universities, research institutions, government departments and commercial entities. Meeting these challenges requires all elements of statecraft, including soft power tools like diplomacy and hard power tools like a potent and capable Australian Defence Force. We must not, ha not, however, cede the domain of the shadows to adversaries who would seek to do us harm, as Paul Simon said in his historic address to the Lowy Institute, which I was honoured to attend in May. In that insightful speech, Mr Simon acknowledged that the, our adversaries are spying on us, that they are seeking to weaken our institutions and bend our values. 
As we have become increasingly interconnected and reliant upon technology and personal devices, we have also witnessed the significant uptick in electronic surveillance, which demonstrates the importance of signals intelligence collection. Australia has rightly invested in those capabilities and provided those collection agencies, including the Australian Signals Directorate, with appropriate legislative tools to combat cyber threats. But the current strategic environment underlines the ongoing contemporary relevance of and significant need for a well-resourced human intelligence collection agency. The challenges posed by technological advances, including ubiquitous technical surveillance, means that human intelligence collection is becoming increasingly difficult, as the risk of exposure grows that much higher. But that does not reduce the value of the unique insights that only human intelligence can provide into the plans, intentions and capabilities of our potential adversaries. I have every faith in our intelligence officers and their leadership, but as policymakers, it is our responsibility to listen and consider the best ways that we can equip them with the necessary tools and sufficient resources to carry out their vital work in some of the most dangerous places of the world. So as we thank ACES and its dedicated people for these 70 years of service in the national interest, we must also reflect what they will need from us to meet the contest in the decades ahead. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Senator McGrath. I oh, beg your pardon, sorry, Senator Billick. Thank you, President. I rise tonight on adjournment to discuss the important issue of safe freights for the transport industry. The last couple of years has highlighted in particular just how important the transport industry and our nation's truck drivers are. Being a truck driver is a highly dangerous industry. In fact, road transport is Australia's deadliest industry. There are long hours, dangers of fatigue, weather and other road users acting inconsiderately or dangerously. But we owe it to those in the transport industry to do everything we can to keep them safe at work so that they can return home to their families after they deliver the goods that we require. We owe it to the community to ensure their safety on the road as well. Safety on the roads is every road user's business. Which is why I was horrified when the previous government rolled back the independent body that ensured that safe rates were paid in the industry. The government were warned at the time by drivers, by the Transport Workers Union, by employers and by Labor members and senators how dangerous this move was and how it would negatively impact safety. Since that independent body was abolished, there have been a total of 1,098 truck crash deaths. 27 of those in my home state of Tasmania. That's just shocking. Shocking. And the majority of these deaths are not the truck drivers themselves, this is what people need to understand, but are the road users. In August 2021, the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee, chaired by former truckie Senator Searle, handed down its report. Without Trucks Australia stops the development of a viable, safe, sustainable and efficient road transport industry. Sadly, the former Liberal government didn't even bother to produce a response to that report. There have been another 169 truck crash deaths on Australia's roads since the release of that report. We're facing a very dangerous time in the road transport industry, and the power balance in the industry was completely upset by the removal of an independent rate-setting body. While many people think of the big freight companies when they think about trucking, the industry is largely made up of small players. The committee found that overwhelmingly the industry's roughly 51,000 businesses are numerically dominated by small businesses, and I quote, of which 53 per cent are non-employing owner-drivers and 45 per cent are small businesses with 19 or fewer employees. However, these small firms are being placed under ever-increasing pressure. I met with employers, drivers and the Transport Workers' Union when they were in Parliament last week, and I took great pleasure in signing yet again the Safe Rates Pledge. On the weekend, there was a truck convoy um, with drivers and their trucks outside this place, standing up for safe freights and safety on our roads. And while I was meeting with the, uh, the drivers and the employers and the T 
TWU, I heard how the gig economy companies are undercutting the industry, paying drivers well below minimum rates and making road transport unsustainable and unsafe. Continuing shrinking margins for transport companies and their employee drivers, owner drivers and small fleet operators increases the pressure for drivers to take risks to make up the difference. Drivers working in freight, construction and oil and gas face constant pressure to cut corners on safety and to drive to exhaustion. And what's the result? The result is an industry-wide race to the bottom that is crushing the sustainability of road transport. In these circumstances, drivers are more likely to drive fatigue, cut back on safety and maintenance, overload or speed. I thank the drivers and their union representatives and the industry representatives for meeting with me during the week of action at Parliament House. It's clear we urgently need to lift standards in road safety and the industry-wide problems need an industry-wide solution. The Senate inquiry, which brought together road transport's fractured players, shows what is possible when the parliaments work constructively with industry to achieve solutions. The Without Trucks Australian Stop's final report's ten recommendations are part of the solution. And central to the report's recommendations is the establishment of an independent industry-led body to create enforceable and fair standards for all road transport workers. Regulations of this kind would stop the rampant undercutting in road transport in its tracks, creating an effective safety net across the industry to protect transport operators and workers. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you. Thank you, President. Uh, fellow taxpayers of Australia, I, I bring you some breaking news from, from Canberra, where it was confirmed today in the Senate by the Minister for Finance of this new Labor government that one of their priorities is spending $20,000 on a frog bog. Now, it's not about toilets for tadpoles or cans for cane toads or, 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 or anything like that. This new Labor government, one of their key spending priorities is $20,000 on a bog for frogs. So what's happening in Canberra at the moment is the Expenditure Review Committee are sitting in a darkened room and are going through all of the spending commitments of of the coalition and they're basically putting a red line through all of them. So if, if you're in regional Australia, there is a giant uh, solar-powered, wind-powered, coal-powered vacuum cleaner above regional Australia sucking all the money out of it and going to go to Labor's preferred projects. Now, so if you are in regional Australia, well, you're not even going to get good luck from, from the Labor Party. You're just going to get a, a ta-ta while money goes to some very bizarre projects. And the one that was confirmed in the Senate today was $20,000 for a bog for frogs. Now, I don't think that is a good use of taxpayers' money. And, and I speak as someone who has a patch of dirt outside of Warwick, and I, and I like it when we're not in drought and we get a bit of rain there, and I have the, 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 the singing crescendo of, of, of frogs. And I don't need $20,000 for a bog for frogs. And indeed, I, I went on the, um, uh, the Gardening Australia website, and I reckon you could get a bog for frogs for about probably a couple of hundred dollars. So this must be what we're seeing under the modern Labor Party is a gold-plated bog for frogs. And if you're a taxpayer, you're paying for it. If you are in regional Australia, well, you're a second-class citizen uh, because the Labor Party is prioritising frogs over you. In fact, you're a third-class citizen and you've got sort of frogs and then uh, people who vote green because the Labor need, need their preferences. So good luck, Australia, with this new Labor government in their spending priorities, when they should be focusing on cutting taxes, when they should be focusing on what is going to grow Australia, and instead it's all about bogs for frogs. And so you should be—this is, by the way— and I, I just want people to know this. This is just the first of many projects that we're going to find out about from because this was this was something that my good colleagues uh, Senator Henderson told us about in the Senate today. This is the first of many projects. Twenty thousand dollars, ladies and gentlemen. Twenty thousand dollars for a bog for frogs. So I'm worried, you should be worried, we all should be worried about what the spending priorities of this new Labor government are. Now, President, on a very serious note, 
I, I, and I will de declare a conflict of interest here in terms of a, of a, a, a friendship uh, with, with Ranul Rickman Singer, uh, the, the new president of, of Sri Lanka. Uh, I, I, am, I think we should all be grateful that someone of, of Ranul's intellect and, and someone with his ethics and his approach to the importance of a liberal democracy has become president of, of Sri Lanka. Ranul is someone who has been a, a member of parliament in Sri Lanka since the 1970s. Uh, last time I, I saw him over in Sri Lanka, it was at Temple Trees when he was Prime Minister, I think for the third or fourth or fifth time. And what I found fascinating about that particular meeting with Ranul that, that on the coffee table in his office he had a, a book titled Ethics in Government Decision Making. And, and that to me summed up the measure of, of the man in terms of wanting to make sure that the decisions he made he made as Prime Minister and that now he will make as, as, as President of Sri Lanka are in the best interest of, of the Sri Lankan people. And it particularly hurt me, and it should particularly hurt all of those who, who, who love a good book and who lo love to read, that, that when his private residence was burnt to the ground, his library of over 4,000 books was, was, burnt, uh, was burnt with that. And I should advise the Senate that, that, that I will be sending uh, some books across to, to, Mr, to President Rickman Singer sorry, to help him re rebuild his library. And there will be some classic Australian books. And for those who are listening, you may wish to email senator.mcgraw at aph.gov.au in terms of any suggestions you may wish to make, or you may wish to send some books to me, and I'll send them on to President Rickman Singer, but also to the school system in Sri Lanka. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator McGrath. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. I thought that too, Jane.